makes me so mad. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back, everyone, to episode 11 of Chatting with Nuts. And uh, we've already, me and Alan have already been talking off air, as you can tell, uh, getting fired up about some Malazan and Red Rising and other things. But uh, I do want to thank you all for tuning in on a Friday night. And it is beautiful outside. So thanks for staying inside and hanging out with us. Alan, how are you? I mean, I'm all right. That's a complicated question. But I mean, I'm, I'm at this particular moment, I'm pretty good. Let's work it out. I mean, what, what's going on? Man, like we can't get heady like this early in the stream. It's like sure. three hours in that we get heady, you know. <laughs> uh, just job stuff like school starts. We, I'm back at the um, back at the office, and yeah. so we've had been having in service and you know setting up our rooms because the kids are back Tuesday, and like like you know no one like literally like I could disappear from existence and no one at that school would know because I don't teach a class that has an end of course exam, so I'm not I'm literally worth no dollars to the uh to the school or to the state like nothing i do in class affects school grade anything but my one like claim to fame like no one ever like no one calls on me in like faculty meetings because no one wants my opinion i'm gonna just be like hey um this is dumb is there a reason that we that this is happening and why is no one doing anything about it so people don't call on me but we had trivia like i have asperger's and my sole skill is the accumulation of, of facts of facts in my brain <laughs> <laughs> and so we played trivia like uh, like three times in a row. Like uh, the first day, it was like when we got there, when we left, it was just 10 random general knowledge trivia questions. You got to press the button as fast as you can. I schooled my colleagues, man. I won twice. I won a $20 gift certificate to a Mexican restaurant here and then a $100 gift certificate to a different restaurant here. And then the next day we had again and they like made it. Like they made it hard. They're like, we're gonna have the hardest questions ever. And okay. someone, one of the teachers, was like, um, can Walker not participate? And I'm like, seriously, y'all, this is all I have. But <laughs> at the end, they stopped showing the leaderboards because they were tired of seeing Walker's name up at the top. So they stopped showing the leaderboards. And at the end, they're like, well, the highest in this round was only five out of ten. And yeah, Walker was one of them. But there are three people that had five out of ten. And then they're like. But someone was just a little faster and they called another person's name. And I was like, can we just see the leaderboard? Like, I don't mind losing, but uh, I see how much I lost by. They wouldn't show me the leaderboard. Those people denied me my victory. I guarantee you. I guarantee you I won. I'm the fastest draw in the West, Jimmy. Like, I guarantee you I this won. This side of the Mississippi, no That's one's fine. drawing faster. I wouldn't have Allen. taken the third gift card. Like, I wouldn't have. But I, I, I you know, that's what... I'm good at trivia. Like that's my thing. That's, that's your my, thing. That's my thing. So anyway, that was a long story that literally had no point, but <laughs> school is starting. Um, there's been some like, uh, uh, like one, two punches in the nerds to morale since going, uh, we have kids back on Tuesday. I had some, some students in my room today helping me set up uh, my room and stuff, but it's just depressing. Wait, you had students before school starts. Yeah. I messaged them uh, through the remind program that they were, they, my students join this, this is app called Remind where you can send them messages without them having your phone number or you having their phone numbers. Nice. And so I messaged them yesterday and was like, hey, I need some kids to come help me set up my room. And the, my good kids, like the ones that I really, that I like teaching because they like what I teach. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, uh, they came up and, you know, we talked about, I'm like, y'all looking forward to it? They're like, no, we all have three, like we all have three classes that have no teacher currently, teacher TBD. School starts on Tuesday. Really? Yeah, you can you can imagine people aren't lining up to teach to teach public school. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that <laughs> that's fair. Everything that you've told me and all my other uh, I know Noelle's in the chat and she's a teacher as well and I yeah, she knows. She she's pretty wiped out um from the beginning of the school year. Um do you feel like every time school picks up it it hampers on your booktube and reading time? Yeah, like it's okay. So, man, we really are talking like deep. So, get it. You know, I've been struggling with mental health stuff just recently because last year was awful. Last, last yeah. year was awful because we were teaching both in person and online, both. Because mm. um, Florida is one of the one of the the states that was back in person like August. Yeah. So, um, so it's double my job as it is. And every year, um, the policy changes to where they make us do more. It's just like. Everything gets, it, I just end up, I can never close the book on anything because my students are allowed to like literally turn, there's no due dates on anything. Like you can't really enforce due dates and kids can retake crap and I can never close the book. So any test, 
still open. Like there's like, I can never just be like, okay, I'm done with this test move on. Someone's always coming in. Can I make this up? It's like, oh my gosh, why don't y'all just freaking come to school and make it up? So between booktube and last year's my, you know, my first year doing booktube. So between booktube and my end school and reading and video games and all the other things I like, um, I did not do a great job work-life balancing. And I have a wonderful wife who would like to spend time with me. You do. And I would love to spend time with my wife also. Yes. Uh, so it's just really hard trying to find the balance. Part of it is that my job, I love teaching. Like I love standing up and instructing students. I love talking about history to students. I can see it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. But my job is exhausting. And every day, and I'm, and I'm not trying to, like, I'm not trying to whine. Like other people have hard jobs too. Yeah. Like I get it. But I have to every single day get up, talk for seven and a half hours. Then people are like, oh, well, teachers are done at three. No, we're not. Because at three yeah. o'clock, I have to do work so that I can do my work tomorrow, all the while accumulating a pile of work, aka tests, that I have to grade at some point. So it's just, it's nonstop work. And most of the people who work nonstop are paid a crap load. And so there's like, there's more of a like, well, I'm making a lot of money, but you know, work-life balance is kind of off. In this, it's like, I'm not really making a lot of money and work-life balance is off. So it's just, it's just exhausting. It's exhausting and it's not very life-giving. And yeah. so I get very frustrated because it stops me from doing the things that make me not feel bad about myself, like, yeah. like booktube and, you know, and this community, this booktube community, like all of that, you know, is good for my self-esteem because people for once aren't well, like, we love you. Yeah. And they're not, they're not bored when I talk and no, you know, never. I don't have y'all's parents don't email me mad that I did something. I mean, know? my mom could, <laughs> she's in the chat. That's true. And so it's just, and so it, it, I just get really frustrated and I am also a very like, I do not like corruption. My, my, my big thing is that school and education in America sucks and it's not political. It's a completely apolitical issue. It should be. Everyone should understand and agree that education in America sucks and we've made it that way. And the reason it's that way is because the people in charge who can fix it, refuse to fix it. And that's what bothers me. People say life's not fair. A hurricane coming and knocking a tree in your house, that's not fair. No one can control that. But a bunch of people making douchebag decisions, that's not the that's not the definition of unfair. That's people choosing to be corrupt, venial, self, you know, like self-congratulatory douchebags. That's yeah. not the same thing. So if all the people who are in charge would stop being huge douchebags and actually fix something, the GDP of Florida is greater than many countries that's how much money we have in florida and we can't fix education in florida give me a break it makes me so freaking mad like throw off the, your chains and your yoke to the mouse seriously like shatter the yokes of disney free yourselves rise up <laughs> and invest in education like disney's long dead he no longer owns you it's just ridiculous. I there's some people saying that he might be brewing. He might be coming back. What? Dis oh, yeah, he's, 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 he's frozen. He's in a freeze. He's the Lord Ruler. Oh man. <laughs> From some of the things we've learned about him, I'm not sure that's uh yeah. I'm not sure we want him unfrozen. Maybe we maybe he should just stay dead. <laughs> yeah. So all and the thing is, most people are like, yeah, you know what? That's not fair. There's nothing you can do about it. And they're right, there isn't. But the problem is, is I cannot stop thinking about this all day, every day. This yeah. occupies my this occupies my working my working computing power all the time. And this is why I read fantasy because in fantasy, you just I would just grab you, Jimmy, and uh, the brothers Gwyn, and we're going Philip Chase, and we would literally we would go bring it to their door, rough them up, and convince them of their evil ways, or throw them off a bridge. You know what I mean? And then it's fixed. We fixed it. Well, another the thing, fantasy heroes. in fantasy, teaching is highly regarded. I know. I, I, the old wizard, the old wise mentor. It, that's why it's fantasy, because teachers are highly regarded. <laughs> that's, what, that's what defines a fantasy novel. <laughs> that's funny and sad. That's very funny and sad. It's just, it's just, so all of that just weighs on me, and it makes me feel bad. Like, it makes me feel bad about what I do. And, you know, like, our society doesn't value what I do like it like and you know as far as like 
There's, there, well, there's not a huge clamor for knowledge of ancient history and Latin that you might think there is. I know you think that that's a like really in demand skill um, and that like I had actually recruiters at my door that I had to turn away. No, believe it or not, not one person has hunted my head. Not one. Well, you know, I, you you are saying, um, you know, society does not value that position and things like that. But one thing and, and this does not make up for, uh, you know, and I, I hate to hear all this. I really yeah. do. Um, but you are appreciated in this realm, my friend, and the fact that you are exhausted and that you do all this work and you bring such energy to booktube in the bookish community is, uh, well, one appreciate and two, it's honestly pretty damn impressive, uh, that, that you're able to keep the pace that you do, my friend. Uh, but that. another thing is like, I do, I, I think I can see your passion for education in your videos yeah. and, and even in our conversation, I've learned a lot from talking with you. Um, in, in the limited time that we've had, and then obviously all your videos and stuff. And uh, so, you know, don't undervalue that. Like there, there's a lot in education past school, right? Yeah. And I know that that's not your nine to five. So that's hard. That, that it's, it's a, a consolation prize at best. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, I think you do provide a, pre a pretty important service here. And, and I think that everyone here, what, we have over 50 people here. I think we all appreciate what you're doing. And I'm very excited. Um, and maybe you could talk about this a little bit more, but I know you're going to be starting a history section on your booktube channel, which I'll be honest with you. I'm one of those people. I liked history in school, but um, I was still a kid right uh, now as an adult. I have I watch I watch as much history videos as I do booktube or reading like I am a history guy. That's uh, awesome. I, I'm not I'm not an expert. I, I'm still yeah. learning. Uh, in fact, I'd love to hear some recommendations for books to read about Rome. Oh, uh, yes. But why don't you talk about like what's coming to your channel? Because so, I, know I want to start. I want to start doing history videos, and you know, like those don't get a ton, a ton of views. Because here's the thing: I don't actually know a lot of stuff about editing. So all of my favorite history uh, YouTube channels that I watch are like have really like fancy editing with yeah. like you know graph graphs and maps and. And it's great. And that's fantastic. That is not what mine is going to be just because I, that is not in my skill set as of yet. Yeah. But the one thing that I do know that I can do, and this is because my high school kids love ancient history because I make it interesting. I, and, and, and I, you know, I'm trying not to be like, Oh, I make it interesting. Like, that's not what I'm trying to do. <laughs> but, but like why kids don't like history is because it's boring. That's what they'll say. It's boring and who cares? That's the two things. It's boring and who cares? History is so not boring. It no. is about characters and there's a narrative. And so I don't talk about events. I tell the narrative. And I use I use actual history is history books like from you know like like actual like texts on history that I turn into lectures. And you make characters. And the decision that I will always make, and I'm going to say this as kind of a caveat in my um, history videos, because someone's going to be like, well, that didn't actually happen. I'll be like, okay, hold on. If there is a choice between uh, having making a character more interesting for the narrative and being exactly true, because the thing is, when you're talking about characters in history, you have to make them larger than life. That is what the kids love. Like when you make them these big personalities and sometimes some of the nuance, especially in the side characters, like when I do my lecture on Caesar, for example, Caesar is more nuanced because it's about uh, Julius Caesar, but all of the great, the, the, like great big personality men around him, they get a little bit embellished because that's what makes them interesting. Right. And so there's less nuance. And, and I know that that's not, but, I, but the thing is, I am not an act. I am not a historian. I am not their college professor at Yale getting them a doctorate in, you know, Roman studies. My job is to get kids hist interested in history. Yes. And so mo most of it is completely true. Every now and then I will fudge something, especially if I don't know. And if it's not important, if they like said, oh, did Caesar, you know, did Caesar like racquetball? I'm like, yes, Caesar was a champion. <laughs> like. Who cares that I said Caesar plays racquetball? Like, I know he didn't, but who cares? It's funny. The kids like it. Like, I say Poseidon was, was in one lecture, I forget, Poseidon was in Vermont looking at the fall foliage, and that's why he wasn't there. Obviously, he wasn't. But my kids, every time on that test, will write Poseidon was absent because he was in Vermont looking at the fall foliage. All I need them to know is that Poseidon wasn't there. That's it. But that helps them remember. Yeah. And, so it's about it's about storytelling. And that is what I think a lot of history teachers 
Not all, not all. I've had some really good history teachers, but some history teachers just don't. They think dates are important, but only certain dates. Not every date is important, even though yes. I really wish everyone remember every date. But, you know, and so that's what I'm going to do is um, start with it was overwhelmingly about two to um, uh, two to one with um, about two thirds voted to start with ancient Greece with uh i voted that it's gonna be it's it's super exciting that's that's one of my classes is it's called classical studies i teach from uh essentially the founding of like the iliad through the founding of athenian democracy all about sparta and persia and then through the greco-persian wars and then when that's over the you know the athenian empire aka the delian league aka no we're helping you really now pay the money <laughs> uh, to like the Peloponnesian War and the Sicilian Expedition, which is stage two of the Peloponnesian War, is one of the most fascinating. I cannot believe there's not a miniseries of it. I just can't. You cannot write this. You can, If someone had written this down, this completely disastrous expedition by the Athenians. Oh, spoilers. So if someone wrote it down, they'd call them a hack. They'd be like, like, like oh my gosh, really? Plot mm. conveniences? There's no way any, any general is that stupid. Yes. Yes, <laughs> they are that. And, it, and it's like, it becomes like a horror movie where they're like trapped on an island and have to like, all their ships have been burned and they're having to go overland. And you can just picture like the raptors in the grass picking them off like in Jurassic Park 2 when they're trying to get out of there. <laughs> like, and it's just, I'm just like, how has this not been made into a miniseries? And my kids love that part um, because I also like, you know, I also like turn on like when they're having naval battles, I turn on like uh, Pirates of the Caribbean music. Yeah. So it's a dun, 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 It's playing in the background. I got these big box fans that I like put in front of them and I spray water into it. So it's like the spray of the sea. It's just like this big. Dude, that sounds amazing. Dude, it's so much fun. And the kids like, those kids are experts on Mediterranean geography. They know exactly where those freaking Greek city states are. And one of them will then adapt it 20 years from now. Man, I hope so. It's going to happen. I'm telling and, you. Yeah. And so I want to do, I want to, I want to do history. And, and again, history videos aren't, um, it's different because it's not, it's not like some of those, some of the other YouTube channels that are excellent. And I watch them because they're fantastic. Like Spartacus and, and those guys. Yeah. yeah. But um, it's something different and it's in bite-sized chunks. It's just going to be one long narrative in like 10 to 15 minute videos. That way, you know, you can watch, you can watch one at a clip as opposed to really Love long um, videos and stuff. So I'm, I'm excited. I've been wanting to do this since I started and I just yeah. haven't had the wherewithal. I'm excited as well. I, 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 when I saw you announce that, I was very much looking forward to it. Uh, and Darren, thank you so much for the 4.99, my friend. He said he'd be excited about anything. Darren's and awesome. It, it's really interesting seeing people's takes because I, I know everyone's like, "Hey, this is the Fantasy Network," but you know, a lot of fantasy is inspired from history, and it's always interesting to me the crossover as I, I go down through these comments. So many of us love history, uh, and. <laughs> The, the one that uh, I saw, where is it? Here it is. Be money, baby. It says Atlant uh, Atlantis, yay or nay, Alan? Okay, so I always say anything that's mythological, I always say yay. Like the historians try to pretend like Romulus, like like actual King Romulus, like didn't exist. Like there was a guy named Romulus, but like all the, the seven kings of Rome are like more mythological. I'm like, no. Like, so my kids are like, did were they really like, is, is Mars really their dad? I'm like, yes. I'm like, did a, did a she-wolf really raise them? I'm like, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's all fact. 100%. So yeah, why not? Atlantis. Correct. Why not? Atlantis is completely. Real. Atlantis is fascinating. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I enjoy hearing about it, right? Like I, I don't necessarily take it as canon, uh, yeah. but, but I love it. Uh, I'm, I'm all about that. I love alternative history. Um, I, I think that that's a fascinating uh, subject matter for I a agree. lot of different people and a really good uh, catalyst for storytelling. Amanda, what's up? She says, why are people going to Disneyland when they could go to Alan's class? I mean, seriously though, <laughs> Less lines. Yeah, but I make them do work. I make them actually know stuff. <laughs> they hate it. They hate it. They're like, oh my gosh, Mr. Walker's too many names. And they also, and to be fair, they do all sound the same. When you get to the Greeks and the Romans, all their names sound the same. That's why I try to do voices. Like um, the Persian king Xerxes, he is not Dalsam from Street Fighter. If you've seen 300, like that guy's like an eight foot tall Dalsam. Yoga fire. Like, yeah. That's what they're like it's just like 300 right mr walker i'm like no 
No, it's not. Xerxes carried around a freaking, he loved gardens. He wanted to turn Greece into the garden department of freaking Walmart. That's, That's why he invaded, because he liked plants. So Xerxes is, have you ever seen Napoleon Dynamite? Yes. Xerxes is Kip, like Napoleon's brother. From, from you, could, you could say it's getting pretty serious. Exactly. So I have this freaking great king of Persia leading hundreds of thousands of Persians over to Thermopylae. He's like, okay, guys, um, so I need y'all to do a pretty good job over there. So make sure that you – um, oh, my gosh, what are the Spartans doing? Oh, my gosh, why do they keep fighting us back? And the kids are <laughs> – it's so incongruous to what's happening that Napole that Napoleon Dynamite's brother is invading Greece. The kids never forget that crap. They never and, forget it because it's ridiculous. And that's that's what happens when you do a low protein diet. This podcast is sponsored by P3. Pro no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> RJ, thank you for the 449, my friend. Also a patron of mine. Uh, I appreciate you very much. Um, could you imagine if I had like pro, like if I was just the Giga Chad of BookTube and I just had like protein sponsors? My kids, I heard Giga Chad for the first time last year in class. Like the, I, I'm up on pop cultural references only because of my kids, but every now and then I'll be like, hey, have you guys seen this meme? And it's like a seven year old meme. They're like, Mr. Walker, that is the stalest, the <laughs> oldest meme. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm a superhero called the Redankifier. I make me <laughs> dank again. I take stale memes and I make them dank. And they're even like, Mr. Walker, dank is stale. Like dank's not even something we say anymore. So I'm just the old guy who's just like, hey, have y'all seen these one does not simply memes? They're like, Mr. Walker, are you freaking kidding us? I mean, I, I'm always <laughs> I'm always behind, you know. Same. Um, I just found out things can be lit. Um, I think that's pretty interesting. Yeah, I might, I might start sprinkling that into my uh, hyperbole <laughs> when I review books. Wait, Jimmy, you're telling me you're not? No, I am the Giga Chat. Yeah, of books. Jimmy's, are you kidding? Have you seen those guns? Yeah, are you kidding me? I just, I, <laughs> bro, I just can't look at his hind tight. You kidding? Uh, <laughs> the Giga Chat of a fantasy though is definitely Joe Abercrombie. That dude's got pipes on him the reason why they call him joe anaconda is because he's got he's got a fat rat in the in these pythons man <laughs> telling you dude if you have not seen joe abercrombie the dude is s s s swole i haven't but i'm about to look up uh oh you put you put him next to brandon sanderson and it's it's like what the hell lord swole dark well, yeah after. <laughs> Darren, another fort man. You are so generous. Thank you, Darren. Uh, Alan, I know you didn't like the first book of Powder Mage, but the following trilogy, I think you would love. Uh, Alan, I have not read these, but I have heard that the uh, further, few or more recent works of him are much better. I've heard that as well, and um, yeah. I did not like the uh, opening book of Powder Mage, Promise of Blood. I call it, and that is very disappointing because I wanted so badly to like it because it is literally yeah. everything. It, it fits everything that I like. Every it checks every freaking box except for the fact that it wasn't very good. Um, and it's <laughs> the, the first chapter. Here's what I feel like happened with Promise of Blood because we know that um, uh, McClellan was a, a scion or a student of, of Sanderson, like he studied under Sanderson, yeah. yeah. Um, and he uh, oh, I have you have a fidget spinner on, on my nightstand in my, oh, in, my in my room. Um, he uh so the first chapter feels like it was workshopped a lot because the first chapter is excellent. The first chapter of Promise of Blood is fantastic. It may be, it's one of my favorite first chapters ever. It's so good. And then nothing that follows it lives up to that promise. And uh, I, and so it feels like that first was like workshopped in, you know, like a writing workshop or, you know, kind of thing. And then it just, like, it just goes, like, Jimmy, like... And I say these are the two big things. First of all, the female characters are. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of male gaze in the female characters. They're not very deep, um, but otherwise, like there's just the dialogue is not fantastic. There's a detective character who I love, and he's supposed to like his power is supposed to be like this brilliant detective, like you know Doctor House or Sherlock Holmes, and we don't actually ever really see that, which I don't love when we're told how smart someone is. And we don't see it. Um, I, I, hear, I hear it gets a little better in the later books. Um, but then, like, it's just like McClellan, like, if you're writing war, you're saying things that don't make sense. At one point, there's a fight on the mountain, and they're looking down, and there's like, oh, there's a million troops down there. And I'm like, there's never been a, a battle in the history of the world that has had a million from one side. 
Like that's too many. It feels like some like someone was writing. You know, be really awesome. Yeah, there's a million guys. Alan, like, you simply just don't get it, dude. It, it's, it's clearly clear. indirect characterization that he's a liar <laughs> and that you shouldn't trust him. He's an unreliable narrator. That is not what is happening. I mean, that's obvious. And you then, just, you just don't get it. They have he has a this one guy has a power to shoot really far, like and that's fine. Shoots his muskets really far, and that makes sense. That sure. that's cool. But then it says he sees this guy that's just appeared. He sees him smile from six <laughs> miles away. Do Maybe you had know veneers. how far six miles is? Maybe he had a grill. He, <laughs> he does not have a grill. He might have had some big chompers. So you've got, you're not, you're <laughs> not sure. So he's a chain chomp. Yes. That is weird. And I'm just like, like stuff like that. It's so dumb. But I'm just like, like, just Google something. Like that, like that's that's so. That's so – I know it's fantasy. It's unnecessary. It strains credulity. Like if he had said three miles, I'd have Over. been fine. If he had said 200,000 guys down there, I wouldn't have batted an eye. But a million? There's no, there's no battle in the history of the world that's had a million uh, combatants on one side ever. It's too many. <laughs> it's too many people. The six-mile smile, baby. That that should be Invisalign's new pitch. It should be. It should be. As seen in the Powder Mage, the six-mile smile. <laughs> yeah, um, but otherwise, I mean, the setting is, like, I like the setting. I think the magic system is interesting. Mm. I just didn't love the writing. But I, I, I have heard that the later, the later books are better, so. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, that's one I'll, I'll be. I know it's being adapted and stuff, so like that'd be really cool to, to read it before. I honestly think the TV show is going to be better than the book was. I could see that. I could see that. Um, I, I don't know when I'll get to it. Um, I guess a good question, and Sue's actually asked this year. She said, uh, What is a good flintlock book to start with? I, I don't have any recommendations. I'd love to hear your opinion. So I'm that. currently on a quest to find the best of flintlock because it is a very, it's a, it's not a super popular subgenre. Um, and I really like it. It's like hits all of my, you know, checks again, all my boxes. Uh, Guns of the Dawn is a standalone by Adrian Tchaikovsky. Boom. Guns, Guns of the Dawn is, um, it is a Jane Austen heroine in a Bernard Cor Bernard Cornwell, uh, Richard Sharp novel. Um, oh. So she is, she's like, she's a character from Downton Abbey, literally thrown into the swamp in the Napoleonic Wars. And it is so good. Like it is so good like it, it is not something that you think you could combine those two things but it's just about a, a country that's gone to war uh this republic has it's these two monarchies this one republic um has overthrown the monarchy and is now like attacking the monarchy of the main characters and they've thrown so many troops at it and those they still haven't won the war that they're now forcing they, ha they have to throw women they have to like recruit women into the into the army and so she's this noble this noble woman um who uh goes and fights and it's excellent it is really really good the swamp is characterized to where it's a character in and of itself and it's really it's really brutal and it is like it is it's a tough read in places but it is it is wow. excellent um otherwise the shadow campaigns by Django Wexler is a five book Flintlock yep. fantasy yeah. series i have that yeah. I like it better. I like thousand, thousand Names, which is the first book of that, better than I like um, Promise of Blood. Um, I books three and four of Shadow Campaigns are are superb. They are it's little it's freaking Napoleonic Wars with demons. Like it is superb. Um, and then the fourth the fourth book is like Napoleon's Winter Campaign. Essentially, it's not Napoleon, but it's Napoleon's Winter Campaign. Right. Right. <laughs> Whew, fighting, fighting in Russia in the winter, man. It is a tough read, uh, but it's excellent. I did not like the final book. I did not. I think the landing was not stuck, which is disappointing, but it is an excellent series. So if you want to read a series, I'd start with Shadow Campaigns. If you want to stand alone, uh, read Guns of the Dawn. Um, if you really like, um, like popcorn action flicks, Promise of Blood is good. Um, uh, like, like I don't. Like I know many people like Promise of Blood. I just didn't like it. it it's not going to be harmful to read it, right? And to give yeah. it a shot. And, and it's not very long either. It's, if I it, mean, it's, it's, it's not 800 pages. I think it's like 500. Yeah. It, Any, it, anything under five or six. I'm I agree. Like hard. they're all of a length. Like uh, Guns of the Dawns, I think six. I think Thousand Names is 450 or something. And then um, Promise of Blood's like 500. 
Yeah. Nick brought up the fact that there were several World War II battles with more than a million people on one side, but of course they were not in one formation. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Nick, Nick's a, a history guy as well. Gotcha, I know. Yeah, yeah uh, and I know I know like a million people died at like freaking at like Stalingrad. Stalingrad alone, like a million Russians died or something. Um so yeah, I, I do know, but I meant I meant like um in you know in formation on the battlefield. Uh there were definitely no million there weren't mil- well, yeah. a million groups in any any pre-Napoleonic uh, forces, for sure. Something to look forward to in the future. Uh, oh, man. <laughs> Derek yeah. says, Jimmy got a couch set up, because shooting fire lives, or you can do it. I believe in you. I don't know about all that. Oh, yeah, uh, you any- have your couch. Yeah, I, you know what? I said I got to be more relaxed, because we kind of chill, you know, when we do chatting. When, I mean, we get a little rambunctious every now and then, but uh, I figure I'd lollygag on the couch tonight. Nice. Um, but uh, they asked if I had any plans to start Dresden Files. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think it's actually going to be sooner rather than later. And I will see about when that might be. But it's something that has been requested a lot. And I want to bounce back to uh, Ian or Ian. I'm going to say Ian. Uh, this question. Jimmy, you are reading Red Rising. I have finished Red Rising Trilogy. I need to shoot my review. Um, I guess we're doing this now. I guess uh, we're doing this. We now. were planning on it, but this is the most organic. I'm going to refill my coffee while you begin. <laughs> All right, I'll begin. So I'm going to go over things I liked. Um, so I'm going to put out a no spoiler review. Also, I am not going to say any spoilers right now. So anyone that's freaking out saying, oh, I don't want to have Red Rising spoiled. I'm not going to spoil anything. Uh, I'm going to give a general overview real quick. And again, I'll have a video out of this. that will be a little bit more detailed, but really liked Red Rising. Uh, I actually was warned that book one wasn't going to be, you know, my cup of tea. Everyone says book one is way weaker than book two and three. I actually liked a book one. I didn't really have a lot of issues with book one. Uh, You know, there was pieces of it that felt a little, I'm not going to use the word YA, uh, but young. There was stuff that felt young in it, even though it was a very brutal atmosphere. And it was uh, uh, very grounded with some of the awful things that happened. Like, I think there's a, a very good examination of humanity in that first book that I really liked. And guess what? I like battle Royale stuff. I don't care how cliche it is. I enjoy it. Um, And then I do think books two and three were definitely better written book three. I thought his prose uh, really increased. He figured out the good pace of like fast paced, uh, you know, stuff with letting it settle. He did a phenomenal job of that. And book three should have been the best book of the trilogy. And again, I'm going to say this. I liked Red Rising a lot, actually. Uh, in fact, I think it's one of like the book. I've spent a lot of time thinking about that trilogy since I finished it like a week ago. Uh, more than I would say the average read. However, uh, there is. And again, I'm not going to ruin anything for this book. But there was something in book three that happened towards the end uh, because the story is told in a first person perspective in the present tense which means we are in the main character uh, uh, Darrow's head. But by the way, people really like crap on Darrow and say he's a terrible protagonist. I actually thought he was a fine main character. Like I didn't really have that big of an, is he the best protagonist ever? Absolutely not. But like he was fine. I mean, he had a lot of big decisions. He went through a lot of stuff. I think uh, Pierce Brown laid out his past pretty well for us. So I don't really understand the grief with that, but Pierce Brown did. Agree to a rule set when using the present tense in the first person perspective and decided to throw out the rule book. Oh, my gosh, Jimmy. When we did this, we did this. It was me and Michael Nip and Klaus uh, all talked about I think Adrian, too. We were all talking about it on my channel when we read Morningstar. Mm -hmm. And that is every single person's biggest complaint. Like Pierce Brown. He literally chose. No one forced him to write this first person present tense. No one, no one forced him to do that. He exactly. chose that. And then in book three, he decides that the rules of first person present tense don't apply to him, and he just he he cheats. It, it's not that he's like subverting our expectations. He's literally breaking the rules. There are certain things, if we are in a character's head, you can't pretend we don't know what's going on. You can't. If the if the character that whose head we are in knows what is going on, you can't pretend like he doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's it's bad. Like it's, it's I think it's, it's almost really bad. Because we're not talking about like there's been plenty of stories where like 
people don't agree if they like the ending. I just read Dark Tower, which is super polarizing. A lot of people disagree on a lot of different points. That It's different. It, it's different when you agree to a rule set and then you say, <laughs> gotcha, uh, and and lie in, in the present tense. Yes. I mean, it, it's not an unreliable narrator at that point. No, um, it is an unreliable author, bald-faced lying. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I think everybody, even Red Ri massive Red Rising fans, say – uh, th th it's not great. Like I said, I, I think, yeah, you know, uh, Ian's the one that brought it up, said, I know he tried to support decision. Um, and I think Nick over here said, yeah, it was not good, but didn't bother me in the match. So I, I think what I need to be very clear about, and I'll be clear about this in my review when I talk about all the other things that I loved about this, the reason why it bothered me so much is because I was loving the book. That's, that's one reason. Like, I didn't have any complaints almost, you know, I mean, a little things here and there, but nothing major. The, uh, are you, are you playing dark souls? I was trying to put the, the bonfire <laughs> on the screen. Beautiful. I love it. Good touch. <laughs> uh, the second thing, uh, the reason why it bothered me is because it was not a simple thing to where it's like, Oh, that didn't really matter. It, that moment that he lies to us in is massive. It is literally in the rest of the book. So good. Like if you yeah. just ignore that, like if you, if you men in black me and boom, block yeah. out my memory and you just tell me the end points, dude, the ending was so good. The morning star. However, I think about how we get to that point and it all predicates off of that rule breaking. And that bothers me a lot. However, again, didn't really, it didn't ruin the trilogy. I was, I was pretty mad when I first read it. Like I was actually like, I was like, man, I want to throw this book, uh, but I calm down, you know, uh, we calm down and I talked to Alan. I, I think you messaged me like right after you finished it. Cause you were not happy. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't want to overreact. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I try to take a pretty calm approach to things, but it did bother me uh, a decent amount. Uh, with that said, I really enjoyed the red rising trilogy and I think you did too. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah and I, I continued on. I've, I finished um, up through, through everything that's out currently dark age. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely going to read his follow-up books. I, I I don't know when I'll get to him. I kind of would like to wait till the third book's out so I can spread Yeah, we don't even have a date for it yet, so. Yeah, he's having some trouble with it, right? Yeah, I think he wrote like 300 pages of it and saw, thought it was too dark and so scrapped it and started over. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, that particular moment, they could have had the exact moment. All you do is make sure, make sure the main character doesn't know about it. Yeah, it, yeah. Let, let's be clear, too. Um, I don't even really blame Pierce Brown uh, he should fire everyone from around him. It's uh, their job to catch yeah, that. You're yeah. right. Yeah. See that, 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 that's, that, that's the thing that doesn't make any sense to me. Like he has an editor, he's a public traditionally published author with beta readers that have, you know, been with him for two books at this point. You know, it actually reminds me, and I'm going to go down a rabbit hole real quick. And, and I, uh, so Conor McGregor recently fought Dustin Poirier in the UFC. I'm a huge MMA fan. And uh, Dustin Poirier was winning in the fight. Uh, Conor looked good at the beginning, but then Dustin was handling him very well. And then Conor broke his leg. Okay, so the fight's over. To be honest with you, it did not look good for Conor going into round two, but we'll never know now, right? Whatever. Conor's coach comes out and says, I didn't see anything in round one that concerned me. In, in a round that he didn't lose just 10-9, some people had it ranked a 10-8, which is domination, right? And I'm sitting there like, bro, if, if someone's telling you there was nothing to be concerned about when you got dropped and taken down at will in a fight, uh, you need to fire your coach because he's yeah. lying to you. Yeah. And I feel the exact same way about Pierce Brown and the editor that went with him for this book because it's like yeah. someone's lying to you, whether it's your beta readers are your editors like someone told you that this was a good idea? I have no idea how that slid through the cracks. None. I bet they're like, oh, this is so awesome. And it's just like, I mean, it is if it had been done by the rules. Yes. It's not awesome when you cheat. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, is you're right. It could have been done either way. Like they, they could have figured it out. Also, like, I let's just be honest. I'm not a big fan of first person present. I, I'm just not really into yeah, it. I don't love it either. Yeah. Um, you know, but I, 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 I am willing to accept that a story could be told in that perspective. And I think that he does leverage it quite well in a lot of the very human parts of that story uh, where things are very, very brutal. I think he does a great job of yeah. using the perspective but it's nothing that couldn't be done in first person past tense oh i agree so uh b money b money has it figured out uh where, where is this where, where uh 
I am I'm so far behind on chat. I oh, apologize just, just, everyone. It's near the bottom currently. All look right. at uh, look at B Money. They got a face. They know Pierce the Brown is so handsome. You try and tell him no. That's I mean, funny. he That's is a sharp funny. dressed man. I've actually seen people say he's too good looking uh to, to be writing fantasy, which is insulting, but I get it. I get it. <laughs> that is insulting. It is a bit insulting. Uh <laughs> Jimmy, can I have an autograph? Sure. Just hit me up or something. We'll we'll do that. I got wristbands I, I need to sell from wrestling. Uh, third person limit is the best. I saw someone talk about omniscient, third person omniscient. I was trying to find it, but um, I'm reading Dune for the first time ever, folks. I started it today. Nice. nice. Uh, let me tell you what. It's pretty good. Like 50 pages in and I, I'm loving it. Have you read Dune, Alan? I have not read Dune. Really? Yes. I actually remember distinctly when I was in middle school checking Dune out from the library um, and then, cause it had a sandworm on the front and I was like, this is interesting. And then I was, I was like, I don't know what this is. And then I didn't read it. <laughs> um, but again, <laughs> like in seventh grade, I read, I was reading forgotten realms books and D D fantasy books. Um, and so Dune, it was like, you know, was Dune written in the seventies? No, 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 right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. no sixties. Oh yes. Yeah. So, so it was old. I mean, it's just, it, it felt old. And as a seventh grade, like I didn't, that's when I read Lord of the Rings too, which is also why I have a tainted opinion of those as well. I'm just like, this all feels old. How dare you? I know. Like How dare you? I need to read, I need to read, you know, Dritz Doerd and killing his 800th orc or whatever. <laughs> like, Oh my God. The man, the man created, uh, created a lot of the things that we love though. I mean, I'm sure you at least give that nod, right? Oh yeah, I, I definitely want to read Dune. I just did. I just didn't as a kid. Yeah, um, that's fair. So now I have it. Well, I didn't either. So, I'm, I I want to because everyone is talking about it, and I sure as heck won't watch the movie until I've read the book. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, I think everyone's excited. I think even people who aren't a big fan of the of the book are excited about Dune because this is the first time in a very long time, maybe since the Marvel movies. Uh, I'm sorry, the specifically the Avenger movies, where it's like this is going to be a an event. Like this feels like kind of like I remember when Star Wars, the prequels came out because I I'm, I'm, I wasn't old enough for the originals. But I remember when the prequels came out in episode one and people were freaking out about it. I remember that like it was freaking yesterday. People having a fit. Yeah, people were excited. Right. And I and I don't know if Dune is to that level, but it could be. But it could be. Yeah. I mean, I. I I am a, an incredible proponent of seeing well done, well executed uh, sci fi slash fantasy media. Yes. Because for too long, we had nothing but trash. And it looks like they are <laughs> finally. They're, they're finally starting to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Now, if they could ever take a video game movie seriously, I'd appreciate it. We'll get uh, there. Because let me tell you, let me tell you hopes and dreams dashed when you're a child going to see the Mario brothers movie in theaters. <laughs> it wasn't good. Not, it, it doesn't even, it doesn't even approach good. That movie doesn't even know what good looks like. It's so far away. What a terrible, it's not just a bad movie. Like it's not just a bad video game movie. It's a bad movie. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't get why these people who make these things, insist on stripping out like it's, it's like they don't ask they're like okay let's make a let's make a movie of this really popular thing but let's make sure we don't ask why it's popular let's make sure we strip out all of the things that made it popular yeah like they did that with freaking and the resident evil movies are okay for what they are they're fine they're they fine. Are fine it's the closest we've gotten but I remember when the first Resident Evil came out, I'm like, why is it not in a freaking mansion? Are you kidding? The, a a freaking a game, a, a movie in the Spencer mansion would have been fantastic. Why yeah. is it not just Resident Evil 1, the movie? You're right. You're right. It's so frustrating. Well, you know what it is? It's, it's, it, it's very dependent on the studio. Uh, and you know what's funny? I just saw The Green Knight in theaters. First movie I've seen in theaters in like three, four years. And oh, really? uh, okay. while I do feel like the trailer is a little misleading because uh, the trailer could lead you to believe you're going to see an epic fantasy action movie. I, I mean, it's, it's not like egregiously bad like the trailer. I mean, uh, but the movie is very artsy, uh, a little bit of Oscar bait, but it is really good. Like I thought The Green Knight was phenomenal. Uh, and and I know some people are not going to agree with that, by the way. Like, I, uh, Noelle is one of my patrons, one of my good friends and a booktuber. And she's like, you know, not for me, you know, and I totally understand. That. I think the trailer is slightly misleading. But the important thing is this is a fantasy movie that was advertised as a fantasy movie. Yeah. 
and the studio gave the uh, the director his artistic freedom awesome. and and whether or not you liked it i think a lot of people could at least appreciate what it was trying to do yeah and it really captured. Oh man, it's awesome. Uh, it the the movie is separated into parts, like chapters. That's so cool. like, dude, it felt. I told my wife, and we both agreed. We said it felt like we were watching a book. I know that sounds weird. That's awesome. It it, it captured that very very well. Uh, and uh, Noel says I thought it was pretentious. It is. I like pretentious movies, <laughs> like Requiem for a Dream. Love it. Oh Absolutely. no. <laughs> like, you hate it? Is it is not for me. Like it is just not for me. I didn't I, like I like some pretentious movies, um, but not Requiem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not my favorite. Well, Requiem's definitely uh Mahalan Drive is is one people are pretty div- you know, I would say that's a pretty heady, pretentious movie. Um that I, I personally I don't hate, but I didn't I didn't love it as much as a lot of other people did, and I definitely don't hate it as much as uh other people did. Yeah, A twenty four is the studio, yeah, and they usually do that. So Alan, I think we might have hope for a video game movie. I mean, The Last of Us has been made into a TV show for it HBO. It is, and we will see if it, I think I think Big Last movie. of Us is going to be the um, and I had the word for it the uh, the litmus test. Yes, on whether I think if Last of Us succeeds, like really succeeds, I think we'll see a lot more of these um, because Last of Us. I'm hoping it's fantastic. I don't really. Well, I I do know why because freaking. Uh, Trey, uh, Troy, Troy Baker looks nothing like Joel from Last of Us. I'm like, I was about to say, why don't they just get Troy Baker? Well, because he looks nothing like Joel. Um, but I love, I love Last of Us and Last of Us 2. I, and I'm one of the people who likes Last of Us 2. Did you play them? So I actually am like, I have maybe three hours or two hours left in Last of Us 2. And I just haven't finished it. And I haven't played it in like a year. Jimmy, I loved it. I loved Jimmy, it. How, how, what do you mean you haven't played in a year and you've got two hours left? Jimmy. What do you mean you've got two hours left? I mean, I know I know how long the game is. I've put in the time. I just need to finish it. But I was just like, I was just kind of taking. I don't, uh, Alan, I got a problem, bro. <laughs> I can't believe I, that. It, well, it's because I read. And and people always say, J- James, you read so fast. I said, no, I don't. I don't do anything else. Yeah, that's, that's, the, and that's the thing. And that's what hinders my... Um, like I could read way more if I didn't play video games. The problem is, is I love video games. Like I, I love video games. My friend, uh, my best friend who since high school, who, uh, was just down here in July, which tanked my reading there. Um, we often play games at the same time. And so we're kind of like, we talk every night, like, where'd you make it? Where'd you make us? We're doing dark souls three currently. And so, you know, it's just something that I like doing. And so Loop me in, bro, loop me in, dude, dude, that, like next time, a, like an awesome game comes out. Absolutely. Because I'll, I will, I will let you know when we're playing freaking Elden Ring, the new. Um, oh, I'm in. Um, the new, uh, yeah, the new Dark Souls game, or the new Dark Souls oh, game from Software, written by George R. R. Martin. Uh, and everyone that's going to complain and say he wrote that instead of Game of Thrones, listen, he wrote it like five years ago. Chill. Yeah, he's out sailing. Just chill. Okay. Um, but yeah, but I, I, I have high hopes for The Last of Us. I really do. Now. If they don't freaking alter the story for what they think is going to be better, they're not right. The guys at Naughty Dog are right. They know what they are doing. They wrote an amazing story. Please leave it alone. Please don't change it because you think like don't just don't leave yeah. it alone. Like, can you imagine if the 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 end of Last of Us One if they change it to make it more palatable? Like, no, it can't be. Like it would, it would, it would. We're talking about like Game of Thrones season eight levels of like, of just outrage. Tragedy. Yeah, like, outrage. So I hope that they trust the source material, and that's really all I want people to do. Is I have high hopes. Like I didn't love Lord of the Rings. I haven't read it recently, and I didn't love uh, Eye of the World. I haven't read all of Wheel of Time, but I have high hopes that these TV shows, yeah, will pump lifeblood into the fantasy, you know, in the yeah. fantasy media department, because that way we can actually get some of these fantastic, you know, TV shows or movie and everything doesn't need to be a movie. Everything doesn't need to be a freaking mini series or a TV or a trilogy show. or a trilogy. They should exactly. never make a Hobbit movies trilogy. It was so stupid. Exactly. You can make a freaking like you can make a single movie. For example, Mistborn, the final empire doesn't need to be a TV show. Make it a single movie. Make yeah, it, it one movie. And this will probably get a lot of flack uh, from people in the chat, maybe, but I don't think it's necessary to do two and three. 
I, I think if you, I if you, read three yet, but. if they tell you, you can do one and you can just do the final empire, do it. you put that on, uh, you put that on screen. I'm in. It would be fantastic. Oh, it would be amazing. It'd be so good. Like People, if, if they kept, if they left it alone. Yeah, I, I think that it would be a big hit. I think people would really be surprised by the ending. I think people would be talking about it. I think I think it could be really, really good. Yeah, so help me if they cast freaking Ben Barnes as Kelsier, though. I will lose my mind. Who's your pick for Kelsier? I don't know, but I haven't even thought about it. But Robert I'm, Pattinson. Robert, like Edward? Dude, dude, he's a good actor. He is an excellent actor. He's he was in The actor. King. Did you ever watch The King on Netflix? I have, I have not, but I've seen him in other it's things. Fine. He's He's really good. It's just he was also Edward from Twilight. Yeah, but dude, the king. So it's funny. People think that I think of the king. He plays. I believe he's French in the movie. Someone could correct me if I'm wrong, but he has like he is the antagonist and he is just hateable. That's like, awful. I mean, you're just like, oh, like you don't even think about Twilight because he does such a great job. Uh, that movie is fine. It has some really cool scenes and the acting is phenomenal. Actually, the kid who's starring in Dune is Paul. Uh, is in that movie as well. And I thought he did a tremendous job. Uh, y- this is the best part when people say, this is who should play Kelsey. And I don't know any famous people. It definitely should not be Chris Pratt. It cannot be a quipster. Like, I wait, know- wait, uh, wait, who's the guy? Oh, Henry Cavill. Every- <laughs> Everyone picks Henry Cavill for every role. That's because he's the only one that plays video games. That's like, he's the only actor that plays video games. That's it. It can't be a- like it. I don't know. It can't be a quipster. Like the amount of quips per minute in freaking Avengers Infinity War is it's too much. It like it makes my head explode. Like every hero can't be a quipster. They can't. Like they just can't. You can't have everybody be like, Joe, Joe, <laughs> Joe, 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 <laughs> Joe. Like stop. Like, ugh. like I'm okay with Star Lord and I'm okay with Iron Man. But past that, like when when they turn Thor, and I know that people like Funny Thor better. I know, and I, 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 I agree with you. Dark, dark, dark. Uh, Thor Dark Age sucks because it's boring and mopey. I get it, but <laughs> Thor's not a quipster. He's freaking God of Thunder. Like, like, he's a serious guy. But yeah, not according to not according to the MCU. At least they kept more um, Captain America as pretty straightforward. Yeah, there are people who are really worried that Dune will have those Marvel type moments in it, uh, where people feel like the cast is diverse enough in their personalities in Dune to where it doesn't need it. I people, hope they don't do that. I mean, I don't mind one or two, right? Yeah. Like I saw a little in the trailer, Paul and uh, uh, I'm, I'm using his his cast name because I, I don't know that that kid's real name. And then Jason Momoa have like a little joke, and I thought it was good. And I'm like, I wonder if people will be turned off by that because I thought it was pretty funny. Um, Man, I will tell you though, the first fifty pages of Dune grabbed me, like grabbed me, and I, I'm I'm very interested to see how much I enjoy it uh, going forward because I think it's going to be a five star based on the first fifty pages. But that's nice. pretty, that's pretty, you know, that's pretty adventurous of me to say this early on. Uh, we were talking about like adaptations and stuff, and I, I want to ask your opinion on this. And uh, you know, I'm only I just finished book two of Malazan, so I finished Dead House Gates. Let's talk about that. But real yes. quick, David Tennant is Kelsier. That's who I'm picking. I don't know Jake just is. said Jake. He's the uh, he's Doctor Who. He's the I don't. He's, I don't watch Doctor Who. He's the favorite Doctor. You know what? I'm gonna send you. I'm gonna send you a picture. Listen, doesn't he get in a phone booth? I mean, they all do. Yeah. <laughs> not, not listen, just, not listen, specifically David Tennant. Listen, folks. There was someone getting in a phone booth. You know, <laughs> had a haircut quite similar to this. Okay. And his <laughs> oh. name. Oh yeah. Clark. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. There's only one phone booth guy. I'm going to make sure my wife hasn't texted me. Hold on. Go for it. <laughs> I'm listening about Madison too. Right. Yes. Uh, well, uh, I'll wait till you get back. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. All right. Wonderful. So have you played World of Warcraft? I played, I, I played yeah. wow way too much. So, so we've all done it. We've all, you know, it, it's something to get out there. We got to confess. Uh, dude, Malazan would be a phenomenal MMO world. That would be cool. That would be cool. Like, you know, Animander Rake, you know, being like it, an NPC giving you. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know why, but the more I put or more I play, well, uh, the more I read Malazan, the more I'm like, damn, this would be a really good MMO. That would be really cool. But people would just call it a wow rip off. They'd be like, oh, that guy's a, that, that's a thing. I don't want to spoil it, but. Yeah, you're, I mean, every MMO just. Yeah, these guys that. turn into that. 
I don't know. I just, I don't know why I feel like Malaz would make a really good video game world. I, I, I feel like it has a lot of that history and stuff. It actually kind of reminded me a little bit of uh, kingdoms of Amalur, which is written by R.A. Salvatore <laughs> that Kurt Amalur. Schilling, Kurt Schilling funded that game. The Red Sox closer. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He spent big money on it and it, nice. it busted. Yeah. Kingdom of Amalur was fine. It was fine. Yeah, it definitely was fine. They just redid a remaster. Was there two? And the second one was Reckoning? No, no. There's one, and they remastered it, and then re-released it recently, and it it flopped again. Uh, (laughs) Which is a shame, because Ari Salvatore's story behind it is very interesting. If anyone's looking for a good story RPG uh, that's big and vast and long, Kingdoms of Amalur. You know what else? Uh, You know what other Ari Salvatore story thing tanked? Freaking the most recent Baldur's Gate or Dark Alliance or whatever. Apparently, that game is not good. I was really looking forward to it, and uh, yeah, that did not. I have watched like some video reviews of it, and they literally just show like the massive amounts of bugs and about how it's not fun. Yeah, all. it's like unplayable, which is unfortunate because I thought that the entire idea, like I mean, it's a fantasy game, so I was I was pretty much interested right uh, from the get go, but apparently, it is just terrible yeah and then, wow. then the previous uh dark alliance games for the playstation 2 were really fun um but they just i don't know why they had to mess it up like just just do that again like it was really fun on playstation 2 what'd you why'd you break it what are people hey, doing? Uh, you know entertainment industry is tough man I, I was wrong Schilling was the starter uh palpa bomb I, i'm not a baseball guy i, I Leave that to my friend Scott in my in my Discord. He's, I like the Atlanta Braves, Braves in the 1997-98. John Schmoltz. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And That's Chipper it. Jones and Maddox and uh Vance, yeah. Vance something, right? Wasn't yeah. that yes. I want like I wore an Atlanta Braves hat every day. John Rocker. Remember yeah. John Rocker? I went I I he was a piece of shit. I watched it all the freaking yeah. I watched <laughs> all the freaking games and then eleventh grade I was like, eh. I don't like baseball anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got out of it. I, you know, Lord of the Rings came out in 2000. That was the end of that. Yeah, there you go. Um, you know what? Uh, co- coming back to our previous topic, I'm talking about adaptation. Everyone always says, "What do you want to see adapted?" You know what I want to see adapted? Red Rising. Oh my God. Red Rising. Apparently, apparently, Pierce Brown has had. Uh, he sold the rights. Like they've. I think he's like. The good thing is that Pierce Brown won't let it be adapted if it sucks. And so I think he's just rejected a bunch of like scripts that have come out for it yeah. because I know that he's sold the rights, but he's just, I don't, he, I don't think he's ever happy with, with like the script that comes out. And I think that, and that's, that's what's holding it up because he definitely has sold the rights uh, for red rising. Cause you're right. It would absolutely, I agree with that chase, but it would be super weird. Um, and it would have to be on something that had a lot of money for special effects and stuff. Yeah. It had HBO. Um, but yeah. Um, I think it'd be, I mean, Red Rising is perfect to be adapted. Yeah, that's my number one pick now because I, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't always think in terms of what I want. I think in terms of what would work. Yeah. Um, you know, if I said what I want, I mean, there's a million things I could tell you that I wanted, but Red Rising would work in my opinion. Um, I don't know who would be the best to direct it or anything, but it feels like something that would be a big hit. Um, I don't know if we're removed enough from Hunger Games, but... Yeah. Maybe that's something they rework, you know, I, I, I don't know how they we could make it, you know, work. But I don't know. There's been other Battle Royale movies that have done quite well. Yeah. Uh, maybe not Hunger Games level. As uh, long as they didn't get freaking Michael Bay to direct it. I hate Michael Bay. He is my personal nemesis. I know you insulted him last time. He sent me fan mail. He said, I'm a big fan of chatting with Oh. Him. Oh, we talked about Michael Bay last time. I forgot. No, it was it was your second rant. Your first rant was about uh, heroin needles on your beach, and the, the second rant was about Michael Bay and Transformers and how they focused on the wrong things. Yes, man, I need new material. You're right. I hate Michael Bay. So yeah, we must have gotten on this exact same thing about talking about directors and and I hate Michael Bay. And because and and yeah, guess what, Jimmy? There's three new freaking mega apartment complexes going up on the beach. Where are you going to put these children? What school? There's one high school on the beach. We're already over capacity. And, and you, you have open positions at your school. Yes. Yeah. Where are you going to put these kids? And also, Ooh. where are the cars going to go? Are roads going to magically appear? So you going to put these cars on? Oh, no. Just bring them in. You know what? We'll worry about that later. Oh, sure. 
whatever, guys. You guys have your freaking helicopter. You can get in and you can skip the traffic. The rest of us got to sit for two hours to go five miles. I mean, I, I feel like I need to move and, and have a bunch of kids. Don't and, do it. Don't <laughs> put, put them in Alan's class. They're going to get the full Pirates of the Caribbean experience. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> That's an excellent movie. Red Queen's War is probably uh, Red. Is that Red Queen's War? Is that Mark Lawrence? Yeah, that's his. Um, that's the Prince of No, Prince of Fools. Prince of Fools. That's the Prince yeah, of Fools. I got, I got beef with Mark Lawrence, man. Why? Why you hate Mark Lawrence? I don't. I don't hate Mark Lawrence. I don't. I don't really have beef with him. My, the last chatting with nuts, I, I kind of went off a little bit because I'm talking about. Lawrence? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I mean, so here's the thing. I put out a tweet. I said something about finishing Realm of the Eldings. I did 4.1 million words, and. uh that's he, he 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 will actually lead me. He replied to my tweet and said, "Actually, it's only three point nine million words." And I just it drove. <laughs> see, yeah, look, <laughs> brother Squins got it. Three point nine million. Yeah, but, but and the funny thing is, is he's actually wrong. If you include the novellas, which I haven't read yet, uh, it is four point one million, and that's where the number comes from. So I was technically wrong. Um, I, I'm not actually. I don't actually have any beef with Mark Lawrence. Um, I just thought it was kind of petty and weird that someone. Did I don't that. really understand why. Like it's That's different. Not a good look. Like, like I would do that to you, but we're friends. Like it's it's just a weird thing to. That's strange. That's strange. Yeah, I, 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 to be very clear, folks, I, I actually don't. I don't really have a problem, Mark Lawrence. It's kind of <laughs> funny to imagine. It's funny to make an imaginary beef with an author who doesn't, you know, know who I actually am. That's so uh, weird. It, it, but it was, I mean, it wasn't exactly the, the most cash money move uh, I've seen on the Twitter <laughs> spaces. Darren, again, man, nuts and Mark Lawrence beef. I'm so down. He's cons he's consoling you from your, from Mark Lawrence dunking on you with his yeah. knowledge of realm of the other like, length. Yeah. One day I'm just going to get like a PM from him. He's going to be like, Hey, shut up. <laughs> like, fair enough, Mark. Fair enough. I got all your books on my shelf, man. You could, I just, uh, way too big of a swig of coffee in my mouth and I almost like spit it everywhere when you're like, hey, <laughs> shut up. I don't even think he would do that. He seems like a very nice guy. He just uh, he really likes numbers, apparently. And yeah, super nice. And I also really love that he runs the self-published fantasy uh, book yes. competition thing, which is yeah, he's a great guy. He's yeah, he's done wonderful things for yeah. um, the self-published community for sure. Yeah. And, and I think I think he props up a lot of people who, who you know, uh, need the notoriety and whatnot. Yeah. Like he's given a lot of a lot of uh, credence to people we would have never heard of. For instance, Combat Codes. I mean, that that's a series I read, and that was in his uh, finalists in the seventh edition of it, I believe. Yeah, and you know, I would have never really known about it, and I wouldn't have known Alexander Darwin and and, and what he did there, which I thought that was a really fun. Yeah, show. a lot of a lot of um, Senlin Ascends got a lot of traction from being a semifinalist or finalist in that uh, one year. So. Yeah, uh, that's true that's true i forgot about that yeah and now uh that's published by orbit now right yeah now yeah, and now it's orbit wow and they uh, also like orbit jimmy when i in the 90s when when i was reading fantasy like in the 90s early right. 2000s i didn't even know like i don't i don't i don't own a single book from orbit from from back in those days and in that like 10 year break where i didn't read any fantasy like i return to find that orbit has literally like Germany's doing bought up the country. Like it, it's just it, it like it's dominating the fantasy science fiction market. Like every book is freaking published by Orbit now. Yeah. They, they I don't know what they did, but man. Yeah, they have a they have some decent covers too. You know, they have a big problem though. Uh they they tend to do series of books and then not release the series in the same height. And it drives me mad. Uh, it took me a very long time to find dagger and coin set that matched. It took me a very long time. It frustrates me that I think that, yeah, yeah, I don't think they re release them in like the same size. I think when they do, they do a re release, they do a different size. And so it's impossible to like to find things that match. I have no idea. But they do, they do like Josiah Bancroft. They let him, uh, when they signed him uh, for the books of Babel, they let him keep his original uh, covers that his, like his like childhood friend, like they went to school together, did his covers for him. That's and, um, and Orbit let him, let him keep them, which is awesome. Cause I love the covers of the books of Babel. They're so like distinct and unique kind of things. Um, 
rather than I know that's what drew that's what drew me to the book initially was just the I thought the cover was wild. I'm yeah, like, the covers and and it has a very good use of color. Yes, very good uh, use of color. Yes, I would agree with that. Uh, so you got the arc for the fourth book. Have you started it? I have finished it. Uh, how do you feel? It is excellent. It is excellent. Like he landed. I, it. Do what? Yeah, he landed it. I yeah, I wanted to, and I wanted to add, like I haven't put a video up for it because I, I I messaged the publisher on Twitter, not the publisher, the publicist on Twitter, and we're like. Cause I know sometimes arcs come with rules on like when you're supposed to, and she didn't really care. She's like, it's fine. We'd prefer you to release a review closer to when it comes out. Like September would be perfect, which is two months before it comes out. And so I'm kind of holding my video re review till September. Uh, but he lands it. I do not. I, I, I think, I think it might be a divisive book. I don't think everyone will love it because I think a lot of people are expecting certain things and i do not th all of, i do not think everyone's expectations will be met mm -hmm. i do not think that is a bad thing i think it's excellent especially considering everything that came before there are some really really fantastic character moments um there are some really fantastic action moments and it just like i wept twice in the last 150 pages and when i talk about weeping i'm not always talking about character deaths i know a lot of people people right. don't understand that sometimes when they're like oh man that ending broke me i just i'm like you literally just gave away someone dies at the end like you don't think that you're doing that but you're doing that i can't even say what i want to say because it ruins books so I'll, I'll, exactly. I, I'll agree with you on that yeah. so but there were some just really like really excellent character moments and some really he's just a fantastic writer some really good quotes um he had one on his twitter that was about um armchair generals that was just uh fantastic i'll find it and read it when i find it because it's just it's just indicative of the way he writes but um but yeah it was it was really really good and i was so like i got to like you know i, I was able to like talk to him while i was reading it and being like oh! and he's like oh cool i'm glad you like that like I was, you know, you know yeah. like nervous about that part or whatever. And so it's just, it's just really cool. Like it's my first, like, it's my first arc, like ever. Yeah. And it's of like one of my favorite series, like ever. And so it's just so, uh, it was so cool and it was so good. And I am so like, I'm so happy I, I, I finished it. Oh, here's the quote. So men who brag about how they would have risen to the occasion amid some unattended crisis are pigeon livered liars. There's okay. nothing more flattering to one's ego, nor more insulting to a survivor than armchair courage and the valor of the parlor. Let's go. And I'm like, yes, let's go. Ugh. Like people like, oh, well, I'd have done. No, you wouldn't have. Hutch. No, you wouldn't have. You'd have done nothing. Let me tell you, I, I dealt with that a lot in my uh, wrestling career. I bet you did. I bet you know exactly. Well, I would have done this if I. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that wasn't that wasn't very good. If yeah, yeah, I I have, <laughs> I have uh, very uh, concrete feelings on non doers. Yeah, yeah. Criticizing Ar armchair doers. generals. Yes, armchair generals. I like that. Yeah. Um. Slowly read. Do, do you have the trade paperback of Second Apocalypse? Because I have the first one and I've seen the second one in trade. Uh, it's at a used bookstore, but it's so beat up. I I don't want it. That will be very disappointing if I can't get the uh, Second Apocalypse all matched. That'd be a bummer because that's something I think I'm gonna. I haven't read it all. Uh, what, is, even... what uh what what series is Second Apocalypse? Uh, so that's uh, Prince of Nothing. Prince uh, of Nothing. I, oh, it's yeah. the second. The second. I'm series. reading that this year. I so I haven't read yeah. anything from him, but I'm gonna read his first trilogy this year before the end of the year. I I found out some stuff about the lore that I'm like this could be an all time. Like this could. That's awesome. Yeah, and I've heard his prose is really good, which everybody knows I, I like good prose. Um, I have um I have uh, the darkness that came before. I have that. I just haven't. I haven't read it. Yet. Yeah, I I, I have I've had it on my shelf for a while. I've heard it's you know pretty grim. Yeah, uh, and I always like to have a little bit of a challenge. So I, I should be okay with Prince of Nothing. Okay, well at least that's good because I can do ebook for the other ones. Um, I, I'm I'm so it's the tr second trilogy I have to worry about. Okay, Mark, are you liking the second trilogy as much as the or did you if you finished it? Do you like it as much as the first one? Does Mark <laughs> like? I, I watched Mark's videos on uh, on his uh, on the first the first Prince of Nothing series, mm -hmm. and I was like, man, these sounds so freaking cool. Like, I just don't have any room for them. I'm gonna spend till December catching up on crap I already agreed to read. Yeah, I uh, so I've I've kind of taken a page from your book, right? And my second and third tier patrons are now able to submit a book for the list, and now I'm randomly selecting. Random, it's so month. fun! It's so fun! Like, it it, it it's is so fun. 
do do people pick traps for you? Because I had one of my patrons pick a trap. I okay, so I have my picture of punishments for when I fail my challenges. So I don't like to put punishment books on my wheel, but I do put things that I wouldn't normally read. So somewhere between trap, the trap books go in the go in the fail challenge punishment. Okay. But there's like there's this close to trap books on the wheel. There are a couple <laughs> of them. Yeah, I had a uh, wizard's first rule by Terry Goodkind. Uh, oh! And I'm like, <laughs> you know, I, I do reserve the right to DNF uh, if, I'm, if I'm not digging it, right? I um, hate wizard's first rule. I, why? Because it's boring. Again, oh, I read it? this. I read it. I read it back when I was younger. Like, where were all these good fantasy books in the 90s and like early 2000s? Like, I don't remember them. Um, but again, I was a kid. And so I would pick up wizard's first rule and I'm like, oh, this is like, is this eye of the world again? I just read eye of the world and I don't like it. And I like, so why is everything just slow? What? It's token derivative then. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I know nothing about it. No, so. it is. Wizards first rule is a blatant. It's not token derivative. It's like token fan fiction. It's like, there are some other things in there, but it's like, so it's, it's very like, Hey, so Alan. token's popular here. <laughs> Alan, you forget Wizards Rule isn't fantasy. You're right. Um, Terry Goodkind doesn't write fantasy. He actually he, what he writes are sto are stories that elevate humanity and that are about philosophy and characters. And uh everything that he writes should be turned into uh an objectivist uh religion. And Ayn Rand is one of the goddesses in that world. Um and Atlas Shrugged is Atlas Shrugged is a holy text. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> how silly of you yeah. <laughs> apparently his later books get are are literally nothing but like objectivist mouth mouthpieces where everyone's just like no let's move to the bottom of the ocean and leave all the non-producers on earth like bioshock which have you played bioshock so yes good. they're very good very very good they're making bioshock 4 jimmy are they yeah they're working wow. on it right now that, that'll be a game we can play at the same time yes okay. Uh, Stuart says, does Alan read Clockwork by Philip Pullman, Grimm's Fairy Tale with Clockwork? I have not read that, but I'm about to read one of my good reads right now. Dude, Stuart is, uh, he's one of my patrons, and he's been around since my channel had like two or 300 subs, I think. But uh, he, uh, man, he uh, always has books that I had never heard of, like the Winnowing Flame Trilogy, which Elliot Brooks recently reviewed. Yeah. I heard about that from Stuart like six months ago. That's awesome. And I actually just ordered them because they're on my my must read for 2022. Yeah, I'm going I'm to try to read them next year also. I have the first one, but none of the other ones. Yeah, can't wait until a Chuck Tingle book pops up. In I don't know what Chuck Tingle is. What I don't is either, that? but I literally just added Clockwork by Philip Pullman to my, to my thing. That's awesome. Uh, first really I can recommend to everyone second series is the most brutal and dense so people fall out personally aspect number series changed me yeah I have heard that his second trilogy gets darker uh, which is apparently a big that that's a feat uh, for him to go darker on his second this is talking about oh, wow. Baker wow yeah. that's madness I'm looking that up too not uh, where, not for the squimish but if you want to support true darkness you're in for a treat well I happen to be a uh, person who enjoys that, so I I, I could see myself. Really, there. Mark? It's that like, like how? <laughs> how can it be darker than the stuff I've heard from Prince of Nothing? All right, who is Chuck Tingle? Everyone knows who Chuck I'm Tingle. I'm looking it up right now. Alan, educate me. I got you. <laughs> uh, Doctor Chuck Tingle's Complete Guide to Romance. What by Chuck Tingle? Oh wait. When it comes to dating, romance, and all things sensual. Few figures are quite as revered as Dr. Chuck Tingle, erotica author, cultural icon, and now self-help guru, as the generation's leading voice on the is it I can't think I can't figure out if this is a real book or if it's like is like it a meme? It, it, ha it has to be a meme. Like Alan, is this one of them kid things? Is this one of the memes these kids keep telling me about? Because it's also got Chuck Tingle's guide to the void. Like, how is that the same as does Chuck Tingle get the nut button? <laughs> what? It's what? Chuck Tingle, I'll be honest, it sounds like a Chippendales dancer. I think I don't it's a meme. It's a meme. It's not okay. something I don't okay, think it's something that people actually read. I think it's a meme. 
50 yeah. Brad says, I know you read some sci-fi as I watch the Golden Sun live stream. How often do you dip into sci-fi? I assume this is you because I, I have not done a Golden Sun live stream. Oh, I like sci-fi, but I don't read enough of it. I um haven't read nearly as much this year as I wanted to. Red Rising was, you know, I, you know, I read. I want to read The Expanse. Um, I am reading Dark That Dwells, which is a self-published novel um, this month. Uh, this is a sci-fi book. Um, and also Hyperion next month, which I've read before, but I never finished it out. I read the first two and then fin didn't read Endymion or, or the, the, fall, the Rise of Endymion. Um, I have... I read, you know, I read the the Orson Scott card books back back when I was in high school. So the Ender's trilogy or the Ender's Quartet, yeah. and then, and then the follow, like I read Ender's Shadow and then Shadow of the Hegemon. I always liked Peter in those books, which makes me a sociopath because Peter's a horrible man, like just a <laughs> horrible, horrible man. But I I just liked that he was a genius that took over the world through through his brain and the internet. Um, you respect and, the hustle. Yeah, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a I'm not a STEM. I don't have a STEM brain, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. And so, some of the hard science fiction is a struggle for me. I read a really good book called Fire Upon the Deep by Werner Vinge, which is a not a really well known sci fi novel that is kind of hard sci fi meets quasi medieval fantasy, and it was excellent. Um, but I am trying to read more sci fi. Uh, the next series, sci-fi series, I'll probably read will probably be The Expanse. And that's mostly just because Abraham is one of the authors. Um, and yeah, Marcus, those are the two best ones. You don't have to read Xenocide or Speaker for the Dead. I didn't like those, but I think Ender's Game and Speaker are excellent. Again, I read them in high school. So. I kind of soured on Ender's Game. Like at first I read, I said, oh, this is the best. And then like I sat on it a little longer. I said, it was pretty good. Like I, I kind of came back off of that train a little bit. I love Foundation. I love Foundation. I and I know it's not everyone's cup of tea. And I'm it a red Foundation. It, it, so it's interesting. Foundation is it. <laughs> it's weird in the fact that Isaac Asimov was a short story writer that decided to write a sci-fi epic, but it is even though it's one consists of narrative, the narrative jumps with the chapters or I should say sections jump 500 years, 2000 years. So it's almost like a collection of short stories telling a narrative of an empire. And Oh, by the way, it's all based on the Roman empire. Uh, he was a huge, Oh dude, you should read foundation. Why uh, haven't I said this to you before? Let me add it to my list. I've never, I've never read it. Oh I've dude, it's short. It's really short. The first trilogy is like 900 pages for the whole trilogy. So, you could you could knock that out in a month. Uh, I got the omnibus and I read the whole thing. Yeah. So Isaac Asimov basically put our humanity in space thousands of years like they don't even remember how they got to this point. Like they don't remember Earth. Right. That's how far removed it is in the future. The whole thing is based on the Roman Empire. Phenomenal. That's freaking awesome. I uh, it has an iconic sci fi character named the mule. And that's all I'll say. The mule. Oh, my gosh. Kevin. Kevin Shu gave it five stars and Kevin, like he's a, he, he's in so many discords and he's read literally, he's read every book that's ever been written. Like I've never liked one of them. <laughs> yeah. No, did you know Kevin? Yeah. Yes. Kevin, the undying because he's literally like he's, he, he never dies. He's existed since time began and he exists in our far future. Also he's read every book that's ever come out and ever will come out. And he hates all of them. He gave foundation five stars. Holy crap. <laughs> If Kevin gave something, I've never seen Kevin give anything five stars. I, I, I've Kevin, never either. I've never either. I'm literally, I'm, I'm ordering it from Amazon right now, Jimmy, because freaking Kevin the Undying gave it five stars. Holy hey, crap. I'll tell you what. Uh, look at Barnes and Noble. They right. have an omnibus, and it is awesome. It's purple with green text. Except, I think there's a actually don't buy it. There's a printing issue with the newest ones, and it's missing pages. I retract what I said. It's a beautiful book. But there's issues with it. It's it's part of their Barnes and Noble Classics series. Oh, I'm actually reading cool. the Dune one right now. It's a beautiful right. book. Um, oh, also, Fit <laughs> Red has read Fire Upon the Deep. That book that I'm talking about that no one's read. That's oh. awesome. That is yeah, he, so awesome. I, I thought it was surprising you said that Expanse is decent, but Red Rising is better because I, I I've only read one book of the Expanse. I've watched all the TV show. I, I actually liked book one of the Expanse more than all of the Red Rising trilogy. I think. Oh, really? but, but it's it's whatever. You know what I mean? Uh, God Emperor says, I can't read Foundation. The prose is dot, dot, dot terrible. Is it really? Ah, I didn't. I didn't think it was that bad. I, the only I've read Brandon Sanderson. So no, I'm just kidding. Oh, I'm joking. 
I'm joking. Jake, Jake's still in here. Did you hear that? Did you hear? It, it, it's literally just a meme at this point. Uh. <laughs> the only um, the only Asimov I've read when I was a kid, like, and I like I can I never even been able to find these online, and so I thought I'd made them up until I met one of my friends here in Panama City who also read them as a kid. He wrote this series of children's robot books called Norby. And there's this little fat, this fat little barrel like robot named Norby. And he wrote a bunch of these little, and they're little children's books. And I read them and I read all of them. And that's the only Asimov that I had read, like, that I still read. It's the only Asimov I've read. And I literally thought I made him up because I'd looked for him before. I'm like, did I, did I make up a memory of me reading Isaac? And, and, you know, I hear all these things about Isaac Asimov, like, you know, the progenitor of science fiction and all this stuff. I'm like, yeah. Surely he didn't write children's books about a fat robot named Norby. But then a friend of mine was talking about them like, holy crap, you've read Norby? It's not a hallucination. So if anyone in the chat has heard of Norby, Isaac Asimov, children's robot books. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> so I don't know if you know this, but uh, you probably heard of iRobot and the robot series that he wrote. It's yeah. all tied in the foundation eventually. Oh, and that, that is where Brandon Sanderson got the inspiration for the Cosmere. Really? For all of it to tie in, he said he, he read Asimov as a kid and he said it blew his mind that they connected because he didn't know they connected. Like, it, it isn't like us, how we know the Cosmere's connected. Yeah. Like, he put it together as he was reading it as a kid and he's like, what? That's um, awesome. So, I, I and I know God Emperor's like, you know, I'm not going to defend Asimov's prose as it's like, you know, top tier or anything. But uh, for what it was, I can't believe it was written at the time it was. I, it, it's impressive for that. Uh, and also, I, I like the story, and I think it was uh, fit to be read with saying that the mule is the greatest character in science fiction. And I'm not as well versed as a lot of people, but he is probably my favorite character in science fiction thus far. Though Dune is shaping up to be pretty. That's sweet. freaking cool. Well, then I will. I will put. I will try to prioritize Foundation um, as you know. Once I'm done with these, I saw that Andrew. Oh my gosh! Thank goodness. I um. I'm trying to. Gonna, I'll try to prioritize that once I finish the insane amount of catch up I have to do um, because seriously, everything you're saying about it and an, an awesome villain, which is one of my favorite things and freaking Kevin, the undying giving it five stars. Like I can't, <laughs> you got it. You got to go. <laughs> in. I don't know how to process. I've never seen, I've never seen a five star rating from him. No, <laughs> never. <laughs> he always back in shelf space when we first started book two, we would be talking about like, oh my gosh, this book's amazing. And Kevin pops in and says, one star. It sucks. <laughs> and we're just like, Kevin, why are you so, why do you hate everything? He's just, he's so funny. I love Kevin. He's, and he also has, he has multiple copies <sighs> of every edition yeah. of every book that's, that's ever, that's ever been written. Yeah. I've seen it's, a lot of Stephen King. It's insane. Look at that. Oh, 50 yeah. B Red says, I'm predicting you will love the meal. And I think the fact that it's based on the Roman empire, That's I think awesome. you're, you're just going to have a blast. Um, That's awesome. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm super excited. Let's see. And it looks like this first book, it's 244 pages. Are you kidding? That's a blessing. Yeah, I would say, and someone said, I think fit to be read said this, I would commit to the first trilogy, maybe even all at once. I gotcha. Uh, and again, it's we just experience it. I want to see what you think of it, especially being a Roman history guy. I yeah. think that you're going to have a blast. Awesome. Um, with it. Uh, Marcus Asimov had written like 250. Oh my gosh. gosh. That's too many Asimov. The most prolific author, according to Guinness world records is Frank Richards, though. I doubt many have. I, yeah, I don't know who Frank Richards is. No, not at all. Oh, uh, Alistair, uh, Alistair Reynolds uh, writes amazing sci-fi. I would start with pushing ice, though. And adding it now. Uh, Alex Neveas is reading, I think, Revelation Space right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah he's doing that with Media Death Calder. Right? Is it Death? I always mix, mix up. Moid. Um, from, His from channel's the, Media Death Call. Yeah, Media. I always forget what it's uh, the word order because I'm, you know, limited. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Books of Brittany is doing a foundation read along that started this month that I'm doing. First book this month. Oh, yeah, they're short. That'll be easy. Yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, I really enjoyed Foundation. I was surprised. I was a little worried because of the age. I, I like sci fi. I'm not the biggest sci fi fan in the world. Yeah, same. Um, I have to be in the mood for it. And when I'm in the mood for it, I love it. Uh, yeah. But just throwing it in, that's why I was kind of interested to see how I would do with um, Doom because I just read Red Rising. 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, mm, you know, I'm going back to an older, you know, sci-fi. I wasn't super duper in the mood, but yeah, like I said, the first 50 pages have really, really captured me. Yeah, Media Death Cult has great sci-fi content. I mean, I think he's the best sci-fi content creator that I've seen. And he's also a pretty nice guy. Yeah, I have uh I I'm 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 also I'm like I like sci-fi too, but I'm not the biggest sci-fi fan. Like it was surprising for me that I liked Mass Effect better than the Dragon Age games, like as Same. a whole. Um because that's not usual for me. I should definitely, definitely like the fantasy one more, but man, like that is how you tell a sci-fi story right there, like with the Mass Effect games. So good. Do like, you think that they would make good movies or a TV show? Because I, I s- I'm not sure. I I don't because they would cut out everything that makes them the good. choices. Yeah, like would, the story is amazing. Don't get me wrong, but the choices are what make Mass Effect. Yeah, and they'd have to. I mean, they'd have to have a, a a mix of them, but they would also cut out like the smaller moments. They would make it a generic, a generic space opera, like, yeah. and they would remove. The minor characters, the 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 conversations that you have, about, they would not treat the Normandy the way it's supposed to be treated. The Normandy is right. where most of the story takes place. Like that's where the meat. That's of what it. I remember from my playthrough. I know the Normandy, and yeah. they wouldn't do it. And they romancing wouldn't. anything that moved. <laughs> So they wouldn't do it, right? They would they would take away all those quiet moments, all those character like the character growth and everything. They would first of all they'd trim the character. You think they'd ha- you think there would be 12 freaking companions in the Mass Effect 2 part? No. No, no they'd way. Keep Garrus, they'd keep Tally. Um, all right. Hear me out. Did you ever see the Black Mirror? Uh I, where I you made choices? Made Black Mirrors. <laughs> no, uh, uh, but, but Bandersnatch. Bandersnatch. Did you? I have not what if they did a Mass Effect type thing that was like Bandersnatch, that dude? Would, that would be freaking cool. With like, I'm talking top end CGI. That would be cool. Blazing cast, dude. That would be cool. That would be awesome. I think that would be pretty sweet. Dang, now I'm going to have to reread Foundation with all this talk. It's probably been 35 years since I've read it. I. I'll be honest. I actually think it's a series that does age well. I saw somebody, somebody, maybe it's a personal conversation. So one of the things, Alan, is all, the, and I think it's interesting because this is written in the fifties, right? Mm-hmm. So all the future tech that they're using, thousands of years in the future, is all coal and nuclear. But coal is considered like type B, like a a primitive society on yeah. a new planet, and nuclear is what it's all about, right? And obviously that is not what happened right yeah. as, as we went forward. Yeah. Um, so some people say, Oh, look, that doesn't age well. And I'm like, I actually think it ages quite well. Cause it's a commentary on, on where we've stagnated in a lot of areas and energy. Um, I don't know. I kind of like that. Like, it's like, we've gone that's... backwards, Jimmy, because of NIMBY. NIMBY. <laughs> not in my backyard, not, not in, in my backyard. backyard. Yeah, freaking three mile Island. Guess how many people died from three mile Island? How many? Zero. Ooh. Not one died from three mile island. And you know why Chernobyl happened? Because the Russians were using a hundred and fifty year old technology that was poorly manufactured. Cherno- an American nuclear power plant is not a Chernobyl waiting to happen. But but that combined with freaking Three Mile Island, which gave which made everybody pee their pants, and also NIMBY. NIMBY. N- you know what? If you're gonna make my power bill go down, you can build it right there. I got a huge backyard. <laughs> you can build it right there. And you know what? You store, you you put that crap in barrels and you shove it in the where is it? The Yucatan? Where do they put the it? The Yucatan. Uh, it's not the Yucatan. The it's a desert. It's in a desert. It's not the Yucatan. Through the Sahara. No one's going there anymore. That's old news. I mean, to be fair, there's nothing in the Sahara. I don't think. Just give it to a cactus. Um, we don't know. Might Yucca Mountain. Know. The Yucca Mountains. You shove it in deep, deep in a mountain. And you know what? then Gulf Power won't just send me a thing because because the thing is, like, I don't even know how it gets away with it. There's one power company for, like, this entire region. There's one power company. Do you have a choice of power company where you are? We uh, don't. No. Yeah, no. you have one. And so when they say, hey, guess what? We're raising we're raising rates by 15%. What are you going to say? No. <laughs> I, I prefer to not have power. I'll, I'll bust out the candles. Thank you, sir. I, yeah, seriously. Let me get my gas lanthorn. Oh, you know, where's my, where's my cycle? Thing. I need to pedal... <laughs> ridiculous i'm actually i'm actually all green i'm pedaling right now alan that's i'm i'm powering this stream oh, you're, you're powering it yeah. you're off the grid oh yes my gosh so nimby it's like whatever build it there build it there you just power my house build a little tiny nuclear reactor to power my house that's well, fine. 
it's just fascinating though to see where people's minds were because you know this is a 50s you know yeah. uh, obviously nuclear was uh still on the forefront of everyone's minds then oh uh, yeah i i think it's fascinating to see like what they you know it's like people in the 50s what they think in the 2000s would be like or, or something and you know flying cars and, and roller skates that have flames out the back and we didn't get <laughs> any of that shit <laughs> it bothers me uh Pranav says the discussion of determinism versus free will randomness and foundation is great, especially when Asimov set up a premise and then flipped it. It's on its head with stuff like the mule. Yes, uh, I agree. Uh, God Emperor does not agree with you on free will, but that's uh, well, there's an argument happening in the comments and, 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 and Pranav is, is he's standing up for what is right uh, because Col Colton and God Emperor have, uh, I mean, I respect their opinions, but they are, Oh wait, they do. They're correct. Well, see, Colton, uh, I would love Alan to read First Law. I would not open up <laughs> the discussion of trying to get him to read that or want him to go into the mindset of, hey, you're going to enjoy this more than Pratchett. No, uh, but read the, read, read the next comment, too. Erickson is funnier than both. Come and fight me. Oh, um, I have something I want to I actually want to talk about with Erickson. I'm glad I'm glad someone brought him up. Erickson is sometimes too smart. <laughs> And what I mean by that is I feel like every character is a genius and a philosopher in Malazan. And I kind of need a big and I've only read two books, so whatever. Uh, but I kind of need a big dummy, guys. Like I need I need a big old dummy. And I don't know if Erickson is he's just too smart. He's 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 functioning at a different level, apparently. Um, and I feel I love all the I've actually really enjoyed the characters a lot more uh what people had told me I would. Oh, I haven't asked you this, Jimmy. So finish your finish what you're saying, and then I have a question. I was just gonna say, I I do I I, uh, I hope Erickson brings me some dumb characters eventually because everyone's so damn smart in Malasan. In book eight, there are literal like people like uneducated. Love it. Like, no, you won't because they talk exactly like the people you're talking about right now. Like they should be on it. They should be dumb, but they're not. They they're gonna also wax philosophical. Everyone does. Everyone does. Everyone. Oh, no. From the from the lowliest street sweeper to the like highest, you know, ascendant. They're they're all like, but what is death? Does death exist? Is it? Are we composed merely of death or deathness? Is there anti deathness? What about quasi proto deathness? It's all that. Like, everyone talks like that all the time. And I didn't do a good job of, of saying what Erickson says, but it's all similar. <laughs> they all they all say things like that yeah uh nick nick said he hated that about malaz and everyone speaks philosophy i mean i'm I'm not even really complaining about it like i really enjoyed book two i was just saying i would love to see some big dumb characters uh eventually let me ask uh, you about you because you liked krupp in book one right and i know we are we are we are at odds with here right because you like you know krupp or krupp or whatever people call him yeah, krupp i i think it's yeah. krupp right i i, I like krupp uh, or krupp <laughs> i call him krupp but but it's fine. Do you, you like that guy, right? I, I'll be honest. I, I like I liked Kurt. Do, I, you, I, I like, you, know. do you like Iskarol Pust? Eh, eh, Thank eh, you. Eh, Thank you. So it, it's interesting because I really enjoy nebulous characters who happen to be spouting things that could be prophecy, and and what they're saying is there's some sort of divine thing behind. I like that. The fool is probably my favorite character in fantasy. Uh, I, I am a sucker for that kind of thing. And that's what he is in dead house gates. But I didn't, I didn't love him. I didn't love him. Pussed in every book that he's in has one, one thing. And it's to sit in the corner and be like, Oh yes, they are walking into my trap. Do not know that they walk that I will betray them at the first opportunity. And they're like, dude, we can hear you. And I mean, like, it's kind oh. of funny. Like that is kind of funny. Yes. But he, but after the twentieth time, Jimmy, it's like really oh, we're gonna dig it. We're gonna dip into that well again. Yeah, okay. All he does. This is whole character. Oh, oh no, they heard me. I must now pretend that I am will lie with them. And they're like, dude, we're still standing here, Jimmy. I hate him so much. I, I mean, I, it could him. get tired. It could get I tired. Hate him. I, if I had to choose, I'd take Krupp any day of the week over over Pussed. I hate. So basically, put and his dumb his dumb wife that what was she turning spiders or something like? 
Yeah, I th- I think she's introduced at the uh, at the end of the, the end I don't know. or something. Yeah, whatever. Coltane is where it's at in Deadhouse Gates. Yeah, but <laughs> this is the most stupid. And <laughs> awesome. God Emperor is, has he has unpopular mounts and opinions. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, you know, everyone's arguing about what's funny in the in the comments, which is hilarious. That and that in itself is funny because it's subjective. But whatever. Uh, I actually had a couple moments in Malazan where I literally barked a laugh like. Ha! Like, like, actually, I'm not saying I was dying laughing uh, that it's my favorite humor of all time. But uh, yesterday, when I finished the book, something happened towards the end, and I, I actually laughed aloud. Um, so I guess I find Erickson to be. I've done, I've done that several times as well. Um, especially in book five, there's a pair of characters introduced in book five that um, people really, really like and are very, very funny. And it feels very, it feels their banter feels very Pratchett to me. Uh, Erickson has never read Pratchett, um, but. Like it's, he. it, I know, but it feels super Pratchett, uh, their interactions. Uh, and so there are, there are, there's stuff that's really funny. And then there's stuff that's, that I, it's like I, anything, right? Some, some stuff misses, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, there's comedy movies that I don't find funny. Like their whole purpose is to be funny. And I'm like, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah I think I'm a super, I think I'm a, I'm a, I'm a snob when it comes to like comedy movies, but like also I think really dumb crap is funny. I don't, I really like British comedy more than more so than dry. uh yeah, like I don't really know why. I like that British makes comedy sense. way more than American comedy. That makes sense that you like Pratchett then. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think I think if that's the case, you're gonna like Abercrombie. I think you'll find Abercrombie funny. That's cool. Um, I, I think he's funny, personally. Um, yeah, I think one of the reasons that I like British comedy is because I grew up reading Discworld. Like, I grew up reading Terry Pratchett. And so that's kind of def- – it's weird. Like, that's kind of defined part of what I think is funny. Like, punchlines that come out of nowhere, but like are – like, Pratchett does not – he does not – Telegraph the punchline. It was like where you know, when someone's telling a joke, and you're like, he's like, okay, wait for it. Oh, you ready? You ready? Yeah. He just breezes over it as if he didn't say it, and you're like, wait a minute, did you just? And I laugh so hard because I'm like, you literally just brush past it as if as if it wasn't even a joke, and I laugh so hard. And some of them are stupid, some of them are dumb, but I just think they're funny. I don't know, it's so stupid. Just so yeah, strange. everyone has their their things. I, I I could spew a couple comedy pins that probably get me uh, strung up, but uh, I, I I won't even go into them because <laughs> I don't feel like dealing with it. Uh, what kind, of, what kind of comedies you like? Uh, I I can do a little bit of everything. I tend to like dry humor. I I, I tend to like the the English humor. Yeah, uh, that is probably what I would say I lean towards. But I can I have a range when it comes to that, and also a lot of it depends on the context and the mood, uh, and who I'm with. Also, yeah. Uh, like for instance, I, I I watched Step Brothers by myself and I thought it was fine. I watched it with my f- best friend and I died <laughs> laughing. So like, I think a lot of times it's the yeah. surrounding and the atmosphere that makes comedy for me and my that mind at the time. So, uh, Colton says, "How far are you into Dune, Jimmy? I am fifty pages in and I don't want to go off on it too much, but I am really enjoying it. Really, really, really enjoying it actually." Ace Ventura Pet Detective. Oh my god! As a Ace kid, Ventura. as a kid, I liked it. I, I liked it as a now. kid too. I haven't seen it as an adult. Like, if I think if I saw it as an adult, it would be like, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> I don't like it. Have you read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Alan? I have. I have read all four of them. I really like Hitchhiker's Guide, and Restaurant at the End of the Universe is pretty good. I did not like. I didn't enjoy the last two books as much. Um, whatever they're called. One of them is So Long and Thanks for All the Fish, and. I don't know what the other one's called, uh, but I, I like the first one a lot. And um, I didn't like the movie, but I watched it because I really, really, really like um, Martin Freeman, the, yeah. the main character. Yeah, I uh, I read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy when I was like in seventh grade, and I don't remember it at all. But I remember be- being my favorite book when I was a kid, like at that time period, like seventh grade. I thought it was like the best kept secret in the world, and turns out, uh, it's it's not. <laughs> yeah. I, I should reread it because I don't remember any of it. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I have, the, I have the, like, I think I have a Barnes and Noble omnibus edition of it. Um, oh, nice. And I, I do not. <laughs> the, you're not. You're the. You're not the first person to tell me that I look like Jim Carrey. Um, That's so, a compliment. He's, he's a good-looking cat. I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe <laughs> Jim Carrey is. Uh, Jim Young man, the era of Jim Carrey back in the '90s, like freaking Ace Ventura and The Mask and. 
Uh, I really liked When Nature Calls. I like that one better than the first one. Oh wow! I yeah. forgot about that movie. Yeah, with the bat and the and the you know his. Ah! There's something about ah! there's something about Mary was him too, right? Or oh, that was Ben Stiller. That was Ben. I'm thinking of me, myself, and Irene. Yeah, me, myself, and Irene. And Irene. Yeah, with the hair gel scene. Yeah. I remember my parents being like, don't pay attention to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Jimmy, you are currently playing Dark Souls 1, correct? That is correct. Um, I, I started my From Software Souls game addiction uh, back in December. I, I tried the games back in the past and hated them. Uh, Demon Souls was on the PS5. I, I got lucky and got one. So I was like, OK, I'll, I'll give it a go. Uh, Cause there's no other games for that thing. And I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I think the dark souls lore is fascinating. I think oh. the world, you know, it's really weird when I read Malazan, I want to play dark souls. I don't know why that is. I don't think they're really even that related or anything like that. I mean, they're both hard in the sense that they present a challenge. Um, but oh, I love it. And then I played DS three. I beat that. And now I'm playing DS one. And I think uh, dark souls one is like, maybe, I mean, it's top three video game for me now, I think. Cause the world designs just, insane that's awesome that's where like so uh i had long ago like back when dark souls one came out for the ps3 i uh i think i i bought it because it was on I, I worked at gamestop so i bought a used copy and i returned it the next day because like the second skeleton killed me and i was like <laughs> what is this game and there's no instructions like they don't there's no tutorial they just you just die and i'm like what is this game so i took it back and i never played them again but Last year, my best friend, uh, PS4, uh, PS Network just gave you Bloodborne for free for yeah. one of the months. And so my friend and I had it, and he was like, hey, I think I'm going to play uh, Bloodborne. You want to like, you want to play at the same time? And I was like, dude, do you know how hard that game is? He's like, ah, it'll be fine. We'll follow a guide, and it'll be fine. And so we played it together, and it was so much fun. Yeah, It was hard. And so he was going to platinum it. And I'm like, I finished the game, and I'm like, dude game's too hard. Like I'm not going to platinum. I'm going to step away. And so I stepped away and I played something else. But as I was playing something else, I kept wishing that I was playing Bloodborne. Like that's how much it stuck with me. I'm like, yeah. Blood that was in retrospect, that was so much fun. And so I finished what I was playing and I immediately went back to play Bloodborne again. The problem is, is I didn't make a, a save right before the end. So I had to start over a new game plus. So everything was freaking harder trying to get my platinum trophy. But it was so much fun. And just like you're saying, the lore is is si magnifique. It is yeah, it's very like Lovecraftian, and I love yeah. Lovecraft stuff. And I also watch um, I don't know if you've watched any of the uh Vati Vidya. Uh, lore videos. I have them all queued up. I'm actually uh, watching critiques of all the games from, I think his name is Joseph Anderson or something. Here, um, I'm, I'm adding that right now. Cause I'm working my way through the, uh, uh, the, the, the Vati video video uh, videos on dark souls three, yeah. because it just does such great lore videos. And it's all stuff that I miss. Like I don't catch any of this while I'm playing yeah. it. I'm it's say just, yeah. It's just freaking awesome. And, Oh, I loved it. And so this year, we like we we made a pact. We're like, hey, so after Ma after Mass Effect comes out and we beat it, do you want to play? Because last summer we played Bloodborne. We're like, you want to play Dark Souls three this year? Because it also was released on PlayStation Network for free as one of the months. Yeah. And so we're like, dude, let's do it. And so he was here in July, and he had his TV uh, or my other TV hooked up next to mine, and we literally just started Dark Souls three, and we've just finished it. We're on our new game plus. Uh, trying to do the trophy cleanup, and it's so much fun. I think Bloodborne is harder, but I, I'm with you. Bloodborne is absolutely on my top video games of all time. It's so good, and I haven't played one yet. I've only played Bloodborne in three, but it is so good, and it's hard, but it doesn't ever feel unfair. It's just hard. Yeah, there, there's a few things uh, that I would call gotchas in those games that I yeah. could do without. Mm -hmm. uh, that there's literally no possible way not to die uh, during it uh, that can be annoying. But the atmosphere of those games are incredible. And I wonder if there's someone out there that could write a book that would be similar in the aspects of someone going through like a grueling castle or a grueling, you know, gauntlet of enemies without it feeling formulaic. You know, because yeah. that's the one thing I really like about uh, these games uh, for people who, who don't know what we're talking about. 
you know, there is a level, there is a boss and all this stuff, but I never, I mean, there's a certain formula to it as there's a certain formula to how you tell a story. Uh, but it doesn't, it never to me feels like I can like relax. <laughs> the tension is wonderful. And I would love to see somebody like kind of write a book like that. Uh, I, 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 there's no other really way to describe it. maybe a dark souls book because the lore is fascinating. Oh yeah. It'd be um, it, like, it, like it would be so, it would be so good. Like a, a book that is kind of like in that same style, like, you know, how everything is challenging. Like everything is hard. Everything could kill you. Cause when we're reading a fantasy book. I mean, let's be honest. Like we, we know that thing right there is not going to kill the hero. Are you kidding? Yes. Like Vin has Vin and Kelsey have all the powers. <laughs> this, this chump isn't going to, isn't going to kill them. Also Zane, we're supposed to be afraid of like, you know, a kid with a wallet chain listening to Nickelback. Like <laughs> it, 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 there's a, there's a powering up and, and an empowering of, of, of the player. And I'd like to see a book capture that. Uh, I know there's some out there, uh, but you know, the leveling up instead of a big power spike, it's like a gradual thing yeah. uh, where you see the signposting of progress. Colton uh, hates the green Knight, which is hilarious uh, because I love, I love it. wasn't here at the beginning when you were talking about how much you loved it. No, nah, I, I, again, I understand why people wouldn't like it. And I do think the trailer was a little bit bait and switchy, uh, but no, I was not on drugs and, and I enjoyed it. Um, uh, Worm Emperor. Uh, Flash of Worm Emperor's comment about Sek uh, Sekiro. Oh yeah. Oh, no, I'm a weeb too, and it's it's freaking samurai, and it's set in the Sengoku era. Let me tell you why I haven't played Sekiro yet. Because Sekiro, unlike the other Souls games, you cannot make your own character. Everyone plays the same character, and so oh. the problem with that is that there are not multiple paths to victory. There is one path to victory, and it's called getting good. Now, <laughs> I, I can get okay. But I can't get good, scrub. And so the problem is that it's going to be too hard. I don't want to play it because it's going to be too hard. Because instead, I can't just go freaking grind souls for a couple hours and jack up my, my hit points and my strumpf so that every hit does like a bunch of damage. And I have so much health that I can, I can spare. You know, I can, I can afford getting hit a couple times because I'm not the best at it. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I mean, I beat... Dark Dark Eater Madeir, which I mean, you got to be pretty decent to beat to beat that freaking. Oh my gosh, that thing sucks. But I am afraid that I would play Sekiro and not be able to do it. That's why I, that's why I don't play it. And so I'm mad at them that I can't just use my big hammer. <laughs> I have to use like I have to get good at parrying and stuff. Is in that in that how that is Worm Emperor? That's what I've heard. That's why I haven't played it. Yeah, I'm not a huge samurai person, so I, I haven't been attracted to it yet. What? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not there. Uh, now, I am very interested in, like, because we talk a lot about, like, Rome, and we talk a lot about, like, Mesopotamia and all this stuff, but, like, I never know what was going on in Asia during this time. Like, you know, in... in I wish I knew more about China Asia. dominated. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's essentially what everyone says, and but I'd like to know more about the beginnings of civilization, uh, you know, uh, with, within Asia or China or whatever you want to say. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be pretty interesting. That's like one piece of history that I would really like to delve into in the future. Yeah. I mean, um, China was the, it was the, I mean, it was the global power in the East for, for forever. It's why when I, um, uh, when I t teach about the Greeks and the stuff that the Greeks were the first ones to do, my buddy who, uh, got his MBA over in China and his wife's Chinese and he speaks Chinese. Uh, when he was looking at my, my slides, he's like, no, China did that first. I'm like, bro, this is a Western history course. Like I know China did it first. <laughs> it's, it's understood that, that the Greeks did that first here in the West. I know there's no connect, like there's no going back and forth right here in 600 BC between Greece and China. There's just not, there's no overlap completely separate development there. And that's part of the reason that the Chinese were so slow to adapt when, you know, when the Brits came over, because the Chinese should have been able to completely wipe the floor with the Brits in the opium wars in the 1800s. They should have just, they should have been able to dominate. They were, they were like, they were like 10 times the size their military was, but the Chinese didn't think they needed to modernize because they were that they've been, they were the, they were the, the superpower for 3000 years, like Rome didn't Rome. I mean, Rome is a baby compared to how long China dominated the East. And so when the Brits come over, why on earth would they think that this small ragtag of people with their smoking ships could take their army? But they did. 
And then it's it's called it's literally called the century the, the century of humiliation, um, the 1800s, like the middle 1800s through um, World War Two, because after the Brits did it twice in the two opium wars, the freaking Japanese, after getting rolled by the freaking Americans for the same reason, they studied with the Germans about with the German military and they modernized. And so in the Sino-Japanese war, the first one. The Japanese, a much smaller force, rolls the Chinese. And they are, they're still ticked. Like the British Opium Wars is part of the reason that we struggle with Chinese relations today. Because the, the, the Chinese, they do not, they do not forget. Like they're like, no, like the, the freaking West screwed us over 200 years ago. Suck it. And meanwhile, we're like, oh, yeah, you bombed a lot of our aircraft carriers, Japan, and killed a whole bunch of people in Okinawa. Let's help modernize you, you know, like, and the Japanese are like, yay, you know, you go over there and they want to take a picture with you. Like, they love American tourists, at least the students do. Um, and it's just, like, it's just, like, it's so interesting. I love, my my degree is in international politics, East Asian politics. Um, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Um, so... I love that era. And so the Poppy War, that's one of the reasons that I that I liked the Poppy War more than a lot of people just because of the history there. Mm -hmm. The Chinese, man, they got rolled by the West. Like it was just awful. Like the century humiliation, the unfair treaties, because Britain just kept pressuring and getting more and more and more and more and more out of them till like they just could do whatever they wanted over there and China couldn't do anything. And they flooded, they flooded the country with opium to where two thirds of the country is a freaking zombie, you know, and, and they don't care. They cause a freaking drug crisis in China. They're like, cool, more money for us. They get them all addicted. And then they're like, Oh, guess you're going to like, let us have even more favorable trade. Right. Whoo. It is madness. But they, I mean, they were the superpower for 3000 years and it's hard to change your mind when you're, you know, when you have this, a history that long of being top dog. Sorry for going on that rant. No, no, I, I find it all fascinating. I'm, I'm very ignorant when it comes to um, a lot of this stuff. Uh, the Poppy War, the, one of the things I liked about it is that it got me more interested in, in that stuff. Uh, and I think that's one of the, the key yeah. things that RF Kuang set out to do. And yeah. she succeeded uh, immensely in, in, that, in that goal. Um, oh, absolutely. Bringing attention to like that kind of era of history. She absolutely accomplished that. There's a ton of people who went and, you know, looked up uh, information about that after uh, after the book. Yeah, a lot of people are talking about uh, the three, yeah, three body problem got me interested in Chinese Cultural Revolution. I can't get enough of it. Um, I've always wanted to visit Japan. China wishing for a good deal from Britain was a pipe dream. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> I see what you did there. The key thing about Poppy War was that I found the book. Boring. Well, fair enough. Look at Britain. Um, <laughs> the history was cool, though. Yeah, the history was really cool. It's interesting because the first book for me wasn't necessarily boring. It was too fast. Too fast for this old geezer. It felt breakneck jimmy like i couldn't catch my breath in that yeah, and I, I don't mean that in an endearing way i actually thought book one i thought it was a little too much uh that is one of the more divisive recent series like people feel very strongly about that yeah i thought uh, have you you've read the whole series right yeah and i think last episode chat when nuts there was like a pretty hefty discussion in the chat about how much people hated ren Yes, I was part. Of, I was part. Oh, of yeah, that. you were. Yeah, you were in I there. Think I, was, I think I was. I was like, Ren sucks." Yeah, I think you were instigating. It, it. Yeah, it's definitely me. I forgot about that. Yes, <laughs> you're, you're talking with Sarah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Ren sucks. I hate her. Um, <laughs> and uh, I mean, it. I, I. It's not that I don't think she was an interesting character. I think she was. I think exploring a a character that's that just reprehensible and that angry. But the problem is, it made me tired, Jimmy. Like, well, that's fair. Have you like? Do, and I say this because I used to be this friend. Like I was not always the best person. I was an angry youth. I was Billy really? Joel, Billy Joel's angry young man. Oh yeah. Uh, I was undiagnosed with Asperger's and I didn't like, I had a lot of problems that I didn't, I didn't know what they were. And you know, I felt stuck and all that stuff. And it just translated as being mad. Um, but I know this for a fact because I hang out with people like that now. And I used to be like that hanging out with people who are mad all the freaking time is exhausting. Yeah. I don't put up with it. 
Uh, good for you. And I'm, I am so blessed that I still have a lot of the same friends I had back then because th they shouldn't have as, as like, as, as angry as I was all the freaking time, they shouldn't have, but I have really great friends uh, that I still have, but it's exhaust, isn't it? It's freaking no. tiring. Yeah. It's, it's exhausting. And I think that's why, I mean, I, I mean, in general, I don't really engage people uh, uh, whenever I'm not ever trying to change anyone's opinions or minds, really, uh, most of the time. But when people say they hate Ren, I uh, totally uh, believe. Uh, wait one second. <laughs> Sorry, I pissed you off, Drew, for not liking Green Knight. I still think you're cool. We can. <laughs> oh, dude, no, you didn't piss me off at all. I just thought I, I legitimately just thought it was funny because I at the beginning I was saying how everyone I know hated yeah. it and I kind of liked it. And I know it's very pretentious. Yeah, Jimmy uh, is very good natured. Yeah, I. I will never, uh, you know, uh, Nixon chat. He absolutely hates Roma. Well, I shouldn't say hates Roma. Links. He hates live ships. And I mean, I tell people who hate the things I love all the time. Um, uh, I, I don't mind at all. You're, you're all good. Colton. We're, 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 we're still cool. No problems at all. Uh, but actually this kind of goes into what I was talking about. Um, I, I just don't do people who are that high strung. Uh, and I used to think I had to put up with it, but you hit a, you hit a point, right, where it's just not productive. And I don't mean every single person in your life needs to be moving towards you and your success. I think that's a, a very sad way of looking at things. Yeah. But these and Ren is this character just constantly angry. I mean, it, it's exhausting. It, it is. is. Um, like, it's her, I just found reading being in Ren's head because she's our only, our only POV character. Like, it was just so tiring. Like, I found myself physically tired reading about how mad she is like she has she, nothing but she's mad all the time yeah Woo. yeah and you know what uh i'll just put it out there that's one of the things that i did not mesh with on the wheel of time wheel of time is a group of friends that are in a very tough situation i don't deny that but they are constantly blaming each other and are they really oh well you've only read book one only read book one yeah Dude, yeah, I find I find that to be one of the hardest things uh, to, to get through with the wheel of time is just how mad everyone is at each other. And there's actually like points in the book. A, a naive does this. She <laughs> is that how you say that naive? I'm, like, I'm like, what is that name? I'm not the authority on pronunciations. I can barely speak English. I've had so many concussions <laughs> and I'm and I'm from Southwest PA slash West Virginia. So I, I'm barely literate. Uh, so naive, I guess, um, naive makes up situations in her head to get mad at, at characters. And do you know those people in life that are like making things up to get mad about? She literally does that. And then it never happens. And I understand like that could be an interesting thing to do once or twice, but it happens with that character multiple times over multiple books. And I, I've only read the first five and I'm not saying I hate wheel of time or anything, but I am saying that that grates me. And I find every time I close the last page on a wheel of time book, I'm exhausted from the relationships that they have. And it's probably because I don't have those type of relationships in my life. I, I've, I've, I've done a very good job of, of purging that kind of uh, behavior um, because I, so when I was a young kid, I did have a uh, temper. Uh, I cut it out real quick. I remember in sixth grade, I got in trouble for uh, getting into a bit of an altercation and I hurt a kid and it was pretty bad. Oh, wow. And I just, and you know, I was only 11, 12 years old at the time, but I remember just being like, I don't want to be that person that I, I, I don't want to be that. And I know that's like really young to have that thought, but I ever since then I said, I don't want to be that person. And I don't want to walk on eggshells around other people who have tempers and, and such. So, um, I can see why people find Rin from Poppy War to be exhausting and tiring and not fun to read. Yeah, I um, I was a I was a happy kid. Like I read all the time. Like ran around. I was a happy kid, and I I mean I had a smart mouth. Um, and I, <laughs> I believe that. I believe and, that. <laughs> and I was I was fast. So like any like I was you know a little tiny, and so these big these big kids, I would say something to them, and they would you know, chase me, but I was very fast. I was very, very fast. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and I was happy. And then the problem is again, undiagnosed spec uh, on the spectrum, undiagnosed is very gullible. So, uh, um, like a lot of people like, you know, were not the, the kindest to me. And yeah. so at some point, like right after I graduated high school, it was right at the end of high school, early college, I decided I'd had enough. And so I, I, I was no longer nice. Like that's not what I did anymore. I was now, I was now like, 
like Dr. House, but you know, less brilliant. Um, where I just mean, like I was mean to everybody all the time. Like that's that's just who I was, and everything made me mad. And I and you don't you don't like it? I don't care. Like get out of my face. I don't care. And I was thirty. Like so, this I did this when I was like eighteen, nineteen. That's when I decided I was not going to be nice anymore. And then <laughs> when I was thirty years old is when I decided like I don't want to like what am I doing like. I don't want to be this human anymore. Like I have done nothing. I've squandered my twenties being, being, you know, ticked off at literally anything and everybody. And you know what? At some point, Alan, something's your fault. Like at some point it's like, there are a lot of unfair things in the world and there are a lot of unfair people and there are a lot of unfair systems. It is like saying that everything that everybody does is, is their fault is, is not true. But right, yeah, Everything is not someone else's fault. Alan, the reason that you're 30 and you've done nothing with your life, you bear some response. You bear a large portion of the responsibility for that. And so, and that's when I um, got my teaching job and, um, and I've, I'm no longer like that. And I now have, uh, you know, I'm married to a wonderful woman who is literally the nicest, most gentle person ever. And she the only- very sweet. Yeah, and the only time I get angry, like actually angry, it's the school board. It's it's when it comes to education and the way that people treat education, educators, uh, like that's the only thing that gets me really like actually mad. Yeah, and I think that's fair. Yeah, and other than that, like I mean, I rant and stuff, but I'm I mean, I'm not mad that Zane's in the book. I'm not mad that people like books I don't like. Well, I'm just very excitable. The one thing I noticed about you, Alan. And the reason why I, I'm kind of, uh, you know, I enjoy these talks a lot is because I always say, if there's a person I want to hate something I love, it's you yes. because uh, you're one, you're entertaining clearly, <laughs> but I never feel, I never feel ill will or, uh, you know, and anything nefarious uh, with with your criticisms. I mean, they can be hyperbolic and stuff, but that that's kind of part of uh, that's of, my brand. What we do right. That's who yeah. I am as a person. Yeah, that's your brand, man. My Stick wife literally it. calls me the great exaggerator. That's what I love it. Me. I love it. Um, I I think that you do a very good job of balancing those two things. And sometimes I just see people go at each other's throats about what's better, and and, and those conversations are fun. I personally don't find them stimulating. Uh, but I understand why people really like those versus videos and all that stuff. But sometimes I'm like, man, do we forget that we're all on the same team here? Folks? Yeah, we're all, we are on the same team. And that's that. I mean, that's that's cultivated. I have to I try really hard to do that because I can like especially when I'm when I'm stressed out and like and my emotional resilience and bandwidth is like taxed. Mm -hmm. um, I could very easily fall into, you know, old habits of being super negative about everything and all that. But that's not that's that's not who I am anymore. And it's not yeah. the channel I want to cultivate. Because like I, I rag on people's stuff, but I want it to be good natured ragging to where everyone feels comfortable ragging on my crap. Like I yeah. want, I, I, I've tried to build a community where like, first and foremost, people tell me my opinions are bad. And I'm like, that's totally fine. You know what? I don't care. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, you're right. Like that's probably, you're right. But I like that anyway. And so I want it to be safe for everybody to have whatever opinion they want to have mm -hmm. because we're talking about things that influence my humor, Terry Pratchett and Discworld. But I also, for over a decade, every night, every Monday through Thursday at 11, at 11.30 p.m. Central Time, I watched Late Night with Conan O'Brien. And I was a huge Conan fan. And when he lost The Tonight Show, he said this big thing about he hates cynicism and he doesn't want people to be cynical. And I think you can say negative things without being cynical and mean spirited. And because that's not who I want to be like, I don't and I don't want, you know, a bunch of people flooding the community who just want to like trash what other people like because, yes. you know, it's in vogue. Like, yes, it's like there, you can you can good nature joke with people and not like be mean like where you're being there's a difference between you know playing around and being mean and being mean spirited also knowing your audience is rather important uh, exactly. when, when doing these things exactly like i don't trash if i if a random person that i don't know really well comes into my discord and says they really like this i don't be like hey that book sucks or someone yeah. like zane <laughs> yeah 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 exactly i'm not like i'll be like I'll, i usually type dot 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 Oh no. no. <laughs> but like if Klaus comes in and Klaus is like, Alan, your book sucks. I'm like, you know what, Klaus, you suck. And you know, it's it's a it's back and forth. I'm like, you know what? Everyone hates your favorite books, Dorothy Dunn at Game of Kings. Like everyone hates it, Klaus. 
you know, and and it's it's we have that relationship. Yeah. And so so I appreciate you saying that. Like, I really do try to not because, uh, I mean, again, we are on the same team. Like, it's OK. It, guys, it's OK that you don't like what I like. And it's OK that, that that's not my favorite thing like that. People are allowed to not like like I've seen people get death threats because they didn't like Way of Kings. Like, yikes! Like we're being a little extreme. <laughs> <laughs> well, the internet's an extreme place at times. I uh, know that. Yeah, I yeah. mean, yeah, I, I, it's all about finding finding your mojo and finding your community and stuff. And that's why, like, uh, you know, with this show, uh, I love this man. I love this long form conversation. I love sure. interacting with chat. Uh, I think I, I look forward to coming back on the show. Like it's like. Like all week. It's so much fun. My wife is so excited that I got to come back. She's like, Jimmy asked you back. Alan, oh, if you want to be the permanent co-host every other Friday. It's dude, it's so it's so much fun. Like I really like sitting here and talking, uh, talking with you. I'm sorry for the crowd that I haven't ranted about anything yet. But. Yeah, it's funny actually. Look, we can talk about it. Like me and Alan were talking before and after the I mean, Alan obviously has been the most successful episode as far as views and I think engagement has went. Uh I've had awesome guests on Alan just you know, catapulted to a different level. And we're like, you know, can we do the sequel? <laughs> can we do empire strikes back? Cause I don't know. New, the uh, new hope was pretty damn good. Yeah. Um, and Alan was uh, a little apprehensive because he said, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to just come on and rant. And I yeah. said, I don't. And I think well, we can prove, you know, with this here, you know, it's 70, 80 people watching at a time uh, that people are here for you. Uh, and probably me a little bit, I hope, uh, <laughs> but it's not just the rants. I mean, we all love you for it, but yeah, I, I love ranting. I, I love, but I, again, I try to keep it. Um, I try to keep the rant content on my channel, not as the main focus, because if I do it too much, I'll start drawing in all those people who just want to trash other people's stuff. Like, and that's not what I want. Like, I don't want it to be a community of where we just like, Tell, tell everybody how much their crap sucks. But yeah. if there's something I don't like, I am going to talk about it in the most hyperbolic way possible because that's who I am as a person. And I'm like that in real life. Like that's who I am at, uh, in real life. I, I will rant organically if something ever comes up. But yeah, I mean, it, that is, it's very, uh, uh, I think you're pretty transparent. You're pretty real uh, with, with your outrages, uh, even though obviously they tend to be hyperbolic in nature. It's just like you said, that's who you are, though. It's it not is. forced. And that's why it works. I mean, that's why you've been so successful here on BookTube, I think. It is who I am. Like, I just, I, I say, I do not change the words that I say one bit between when that camera's on. I literally talk like I, I, I always say weird crap like that, like in person. My students don't understand it. And I'm like, you know what? You don't have to understand it. Just have to talk. Deal with it. <laughs> I swear a lot less on camera than I swear in real life. I swear a lot. Oh, really? Less. Yeah, I try I try to tone it down. Uh, that's the only thing I can say that I, I filter. Um, I mean, I got you. Otherwise, YouTube will like, they'll demonetize you. Like, <laughs> I don't even necessarily care about that. It's just, you know, if, if there's people who find, you know, I, I don't want to. I, compl I completely get that. I completely you know what I mean. Yeah. Some people would say, do it, you know, say every curse word you want, but you know, I, I want people to be here and I want people to be able to give their input on fantasy, not so much my vocabulary when it comes to curses. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and I still swear every now and then, but it, it's uh, that, that's the only thing I can say that I edit myself uh, from doing is just, you know, a little less F bombing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I get that. I get that. You're probably decently trained in that. I don't think you swear much anyways, I, but I don't, I don't swear in real life. So it's easy for me. Yeah. Say um, teaching you cannot. Right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, one one hundred percent. I just I I literally have substitutes. Like I literally t I I. Okay, so again, I've read tons of Pratchett and I've watched tons of British TV. I say bloody and bleeding a lot. Um, and you know, it's a an old timey, old timey swear in you know British books and stuff. They say you know bloody hell or the bleed. I don't I don't have the bleeding time to do this, and so that works really well. I say bloody and bleeding. A lot. <laughs> I say I say mate now all the time because nice. yeah, one of my best friends is in Australia, so I nice. Oh man, I just constantly am saying mate and feeling like a complete and utter jackass. No, <laughs> it, I mean, I it is like, awesome. Yeah, I know, but it's coming from my mouth. You know, the Giga Chat. I don't. I don't know if that's the best look for uh, <laughs> for mate. Uh, 
Colton says, when I started a new job during small talk, I was asked what I would like to do for fun. I said, I like three books made fun of fun and suddenly talked down. Uh, how do you feel about people like that? Well, those people are limited is, is how I would describe that. Um, here's the thing. Uh, first off, I think everyone, all 72 of you can probably attest that has someone at some point said, Oh, I read too, but I only read nonfiction. I roll, <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay, whatever. Here's the thing. We all have some interest that if we put a microscope to it, we could say is silly and childish or cringe. You know, I have a coworker who loves uh, figures, you know, and sometimes it's like, yeah, I know it's embarrassing. You know, I, I have like these actions. I'm like, no, nah, dude, it's awesome. Like to be passionate about That's something awesome. on this earth in, in the very small existence that we get around the sun to find something that gives you any type of joy or purpose is worth, uh, you know, it's worth everything. Uh, I don't, I don't even want to crap on these people uh, that you're talking about because they have something that you, you that we as a collective may look at and go, Ugh. you know, like, uh, for instance, my wife loves trash television. She loves trash. Te she's watching right now. She's going to is, is it the bachelorette and stuff? Oh, it's worse. It's like it's like the shows nobody else. Like they're like, Ugh, like this is the budget bachelor. Right. Um, oh and, you know, I could sit there and pick apart like, oh, how low IQ must she be? You know, why would I do that? You know, it's whatever it about it is that she enjoys. She should be able to enjoy it. Jimmy, uh, I'm going to I'm going to run to the restroom and refill my drinks. But yeah. I'm listening also because I'm, I'm 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 about to die. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're good. Oh. Oh, my favorite piss I tripped over my mic. <laughs> Those people suck. <laughs> um, I'm trying to get caught up on chap here. Well, you mentioned along whenever we uh, whenever Alan gets back, we will talk about the long price quartet um, for sure. Um, I only read books about business. Uh, you know, the weird thing about self-help books is like you, you, there should only be one if one works, right? Like, why are there so many self-help books? Uh, if I am lukewarm on Valor, should I keep going to ruin or move on to something else? If if you're like lukewarm, like you're like, eh, I don't know if I want to do this on Valor for John Gwen, you can probably put it down. Uh, I I love that series, obviously, but I think Valor is where you see the real John Gwen experience, where Malice is a bit of a uh, uh, a start where he's getting his footing. I think Valor is a good representation of John Gwen. So if you're not feeling it there, you could probably put it down. But I. Also selfishly want to tell you to continue because I, I love uh, John Gwynn's work. I love unicorns. Just had to get that out there. Love Island watch party with your wife. She would adore that, Amanda. She would. Maybe that should be one of my uh, patron Kingsguard tears. <laughs> HP can people who think fantasy isn't literature. I would actually really wow. enjoy watching that. Uh, AP is someone who I probably will have on the show eventually. Um. Yeah, we all need a place to space out. That says budget bachelor sounds great. <laughs> uh, yeah, Frank, I'm sorry. I saw you mentioned this. So I actually meant to bring it up. I, I, I lost in the chat. It says, Jimmy, you're going to read Kings of Paradise. Yes, by Richard Neal. I've had that on my list for like a year. And I, like since I started book two because of Petrick. Petrick gave it like five stars and told me that I would love it. And Petrick has never led me astray. Also, Patrick Leo is another person um, who I think does a great job of whenever he feels negative about a book, being able to voice why he thinks it's negative without being condescending. I actually think he does a pretty good job. Yeah, Patrick. Patrick does a great job with that. I yeah, you and him are my favorite uh, people for I, I would go to for like a negative, quote unquote, negative review. Um, you should buddy read Six Crow when Alan reads it. Oh, my God. How long is it? It's I mean, it's like 400 pages. It's not long. A court of what is that? The is court that of and roses. you should definitely. Oh, a court of sorry, a court of mist and fury. No, yeah, mist and fury. You should not read it. No, uh, I'm not reading that. Uh, no, <laughs> so, you should never read it. So, uh, this user has been saying, Well, you mentioned Long Price Quartet. They said they're just starting book one. So, Alan, I have not read the Long Price Quartet. I've read Dagger and Coin. We're, we're on the flip sides here. Yes, I know. And Jimmy, <laughs> we're supposed to, me, you, and Patrick are supposed to do a live show when we're done with the series. But the problem Ooh. is, I have had to put the ship the the series on hold because what did you say? I, I, I committed to too much, and so it ticks me off because I want to be reading Dagger and Coin, but I have all these things that I already agreed. You're reading to. Six of Crows? No, I mean it's on my to read. Good I, sir, that's a punishment book. Uh, and the I, thing I, is, I have to. 
I lost a challenge and that's what I, and that's what I drew. And I don't want to be someone who welches out on, uh, you know, <laughs> if, I, if I lose, I need to take my medicine. Uh, so, you know, I can't, the real problem is I can't do another challenge until I've, uh, I love the challenge videos. They're some of my favorite to do, but I can't do another one until I've done my punishment for the last one. So I, I need to, you know, I think I failed that in April so, and I just haven't read it yet. Um, but mostly it's just like channel read along and then shelf space um, read along and then other stuff that I had already agreed to do earlier that I haven't gotten to. So I'm desperately trying to catch up, but I'm determined to finish um, Dagger and Coin before the end of the year, even if my December even if it's December dagger and coin, you know what I mean? Like if I have to read the last four books, cause I own all of them. If I got to read books, books two, three, four, and five in December, I'll do it, but I'll finish it before the end of the year. Um, Long press quartet is fantastic. I just had two of my really good friends uh, finish it. And like, I liked them even more on second read. And by second read, like they were bothering <laughs> me and each other as they were reading the chapters and just reliving it like that was just so awesome and getting to some of those moments like Jimmy, like as a prose, as a prose fiend, some of the, the lines that Abraham writes in these books are just, they are so incredible. Like, especially Amazing. in books. Well, really in all of them, but in, in, in books three and four, especially it's just like, man, I'm so, oh, I love it so much. So I'm, I really want to read dagger and coin because I am not going to spoil the antagonist, but who I know the antagonist is about to be, I am so there for it because he writes those kind of characters so well. Oh, these, dude. these really like put upon uh, underestimated uh, characters. He writes those so well. Um, yes. There's several of them in Long Crest Quartet, and they're just fantastic. I am so eager to see where it goes. Uh, so we will definitely, me, you, and Patrick will definitely have to talk about it when I finish them. Um, and same thing when you and then Philip get around to reading Long Price, um, we will have to talk about it as well. It's just, it's yeah, just like, Abraham. Abraham's so gifted. Like he's really gifted. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. And, and that's uh, that and Heroes Dire, two things I really want to try to fit in before. Did you hear about Heroes Dire from Patrick? Yes. And then my uh, patron and friend Pat. Uh, is reading it based off Patrick's recommendation. Patrick is the only person I have ever met besides me who's read Heroes Die. Oh, when so you've read it? Yeah, I read it in high school. Or it was right, the pitch. Yeah, right after high school. Like after freaking, uh, after when I saw Patrick's video, I'm like, Patrick, you're reading Heroes Die? Holy crap. And I, I said, I warn you, book two is terrible. And he's like, I'm going to see. And then he DNF'd book two because it's not good. No. So the pitch is freaking... Um, this guy named Harry is uh, a celebrity because he plays this character Kane in this like it's like a like a real life MMO where he goes into it and he has this hero persona and like all of like it's they do it for entertainment. He's an actor, but it's real. So he's in <laughs> That's so it's crazy. and it's not a game, but it's like this fantasy world where it follows Kane's exploits in this fantasy world, but everyone is watching on TV what he's doing. So the main character is Kane, but that's the persona of this guy named Harry when he's in this world. And it is it, like, it came out in like 96 or something, 99. It came out late nineties and it was unlike anything I'd ever read. And it's exceptional. It is really, really good. And then the second book is so bad. It was so bad that I never read. I think there's a third and fourth book now. And Patrick, Patrick stopped reading the series um, in book Aww. two. And it's not going to continue on either. Um, he says he is, I think. But like when he doesn't have it, all this other stuff to read. So can you read book one and be satisfied? 100%. 100%. In fact, okay. I, wish, I wish I had never read book two. Less books on my TBR, the better. <laughs> but book, one, book one is really – it has – Patrick's right. It has one of the ugliest covers ever. Objectively, one of the worst covers of all time. I would never have read that book if my buddy, my high school buddy, had read it and told me I should read it. And I loved it. But I would never have picked up. The cover is freaking terrible. But 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 uh, <laughs> Heroes Die. Heroes Die is really, really good. Very like, cool. it's really good. Okay, so, Noelle. I love Noelle. Uh, yeah, she's uh, wonderful. I am going to read Realm of the... I was wanted to start um, Assassin's Apprentice this year. Mm -hmm. And I just ran out of space. 
I am, it is definitely high priority to read next year. I am, I will, I will at least read uh, Farseer next year. I will probably at least go through, I will probably not read all of the Realm of the Elder Dings next year. 14 books is probably going to be too much. It's 16. Six, sorry, 16. Because I don't binge, I don't binge like you do, Jimmy. We talked about this last time. Yeah. Um, and so I probably will not read all of them. But I will probably read through Live Ship, mostly because Live Ship is the book I want to read. Because books that take place on ships, I love ships, Jimmy. I love huge ships. Oh, I love, like, yeah. I am so excited to read Live Ship. Um, so I probably will not be able to resist getting through Live Ship. Uh, but I will definitely at least read Farseer. I've heard so many good things about it. Um, people are actually taking bets on whether or not I'm going to like it because I really like Really, I, I love amazing characters, which we know Rob, uh, Hob is is like the queen of character writing, right? Yeah, she's like, known for that. If yeah. people like her, they generally like her characters. Uh, people think because it's, people think it's it's going to be too slow on the opposite count for me. So we'll see. I am super eager um, to read them and uh, and check it out. Yeah, I'm. I'm curious to see how how it does uh, with you. I I don't really know if I know one way or the other. I mean, if you like ships, I think, and also live ships can stand by itself as a trilogy, which yeah. is really nice. Uh, clearly, there's stuff in it you want to know about from Farsi or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, and I hate ships. I hate nautical everything. So I, I'm, and I loved it. So I think I think you will like it a lot. I hope I hope you enjoy it because I would love to hear some of your takes, especially in some of the stuff that happens in the later series. I think that would be really. Uh, interesting. Some people are asking about how you felt about Fall Babel. I know we already talked about it, but yeah, uh, Pranav, before mind. you got here, um, it's great. It's really good. I think um, I'm going to, I mean, I'm going to like it, it, like I'm going to tell everyone to read it because they absolutely should. I think that some people are going to have expectations that are different than what they are going to get. And that may like rub people the wrong way, but it is excellent. It is, it is the, it is the ending. It is the only ending we could have gotten. Um, and there are some fantastic, like if, if you already like the characters, Pranav, like the character moments in this are just, they're just, they're just fantastic. They're so good. And there's some really good scenes. And then, you know, like there are five lines, five words that the villain, and I can't spoil it, but Pranav knows who it is, that the villain says that literally in those five words encompass his entire worldview. And I'm just like, I, you, it's not there. you're the worst. Like you're just the freaking worst. And it's not even five lines about his worldview, but the like the dialogue's so good that it's just like, of course that's what you'd say. It's just really good. Um, so yes, he sticks the landing. I'm super excited. Um, and I think uh, Mr. Bancroft is going to be. I'm going to get to interview him in September. Oh, um, that's cool. I I actually just finished an interview two days ago with. Sarah and um, my friend Angela and Adrian, because they're the biggest Great Coats fans I know besides me. We just finished an interview with Sebastian de Castell, the Great Coats author, that is going up tomorrow. And it was, man, like, it's so weird talking to an author. Like, I know I talked to John Gwynn before, but Patrick had set all that up, and I was kind of like tangential to that. Mm -hmm. And he's so, like, I was already shocked that John Gwynn was so nice. And I was also shocked that he doesn't actually talk like Kratos from God of War, like <laughs> John Gwynn, John Gwynn just, boy, like he, like he, he doesn't actually talk like Kratos, but I, I, it was so incongruous. I'm like, John, how do you not talk like Kratos? He's so nice. And then meeting uh, Sebastian de Castell, who is friends with John Gwynn, who is also stupid nice. Jimmy, he talked with us for freaking three hours. Like, and he was so kind and so just like, and it was it, it was awesome. And you know, we talked spoilers for like the back the back out back hour and a half, I think. But the first hour and a half, we just talked generally about like writing and the publishing industry and uh, you know, what he was before as an author. And it was just so it was really, really cool. It's one of the coolest things I've gotten to do since starting Booktube. And so that's your first one. That's your first author interview. Yes, and that's why I had I was so nervous. I that's why I had Sarah and Angela and Adrian. One, because I thought it'd be cool, you know, they're huge Great Coat fans too. Like, yeah. let's all talk to them. But two, it's a safety net. So I didn't have to feel super weird just by myself. You know what I mean? Like, if you're I, my safety net, Alan. <laughs> like, if I start drooling, talking to, or just like 
having a conniption while talking to him, like someone can jump in and be like, you know, so it was super nice. That's going up, I think, on my channel tomorrow. Um, but it's just it's just so cool. And getting to, like the fact that Bancroft would, you know, take time out to talk to me also in um, September is going to be super awesome, too. And so I don't know, like it, I, I'm very fortunate and I just am really like grateful that I get this opportunity because it's just I mean, it's just it's just cool. And I, you know, I hit 5000 subs. I, yeah, congratulations, Ben. I appreciate it. I, and and you, you were at my live stream, and that was that was so fun, just sitting there talking to people. And so that's why I kind of feel bad when I talk about like my job and how much like it like saps me. It's like I I do not have a bad life, and I don't want. And I know we can't do the like someone's always got it worse because then there's one dude on the planet who has it worse. He's the only one that can can complain. Like he has, you know, he's he has no <laughs> limbs, he has no head. He has no internal organs. He has a lump of flesh with a mouth in his chest. And he's at the bottom of the ocean under a rock. And he's just and, happy to be here. <laughs> and he's the only one that can complain because he's got it worse than anybody else. Yeah, problems are still problems. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. But it's hard, you know, because it's like I am very fortunate and in a lot of areas. It's just I wish I wasn't tired all the time. And <laughs> I had, you know, had better self-esteem you know what i mean <laughs> so yeah self-esteem would be sick actually yeah it's how, uh how is that for people <laughs> how do they do it <laughs> dude people who are sure of themselves i it is a skill that i envy like having self-confidence is not something that i've ever really well i had it before i as a child a lot of times you don't realize you don't understand shame <laughs> as a child and so that's why children are like they're just so creative because they don't care if what they're doing is stupid. Like, yeah, they, they don't care. And then as you get older, you learn that, Hey, don't do that. Don't do that. Some don't people, that. some people do. Some people don't realize that them losing it in a Walmart is unacceptable. <laughs> I mean, I, I agree. And, and I'm not, and I'm not talking about having fits. I'm talking about like, just like, I, yeah, I know, I, you know, the people who, who, who aren't afraid to like kind of be themselves like in public. Cause people are like, Oh, look at that weirdo. Like I, yeah, that sometimes, you know what I mean? I've never been afraid to make a, I've never been afraid to fail. Um, Oh man. What's that like, Jimmy? I'm well, terrified. for me, uh, it was more like a sunken cost fallacy. Uh, not even a fallacy. Yeah. I guess it is a sunken cost. Sunken cost. I'm like, I suck anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing going on for myself. I'm just going to try professional wrestling because I want to. It's like it can't I, I it can't be any worse than it already is. That was my idea behind it. Right. And the same thing with BookTube. I was like, I'm going to make you know, when I when I when I made this channel, I was not very well read. I'm still not the most well read person. You know, I mean, it is what it is. But I said, you know what? I might be able to pick up people who are on the journey just like I am, which my whole journey was trying to find stuff that I liked as much as a song of ice and fire. Yeah. Uh, and I know a lot of people could probably relate with that. So I said, well, let's let them come on the journey with me and I'll turn on this Canon camera and see how, uh, see how it goes. And it, it, it's worked out um, pretty well. Uh, I also want to highlight this. I think you guys make a great team. This co-host idea is terrific. I'm just saying, Alan. I appreciate that. I, I cannot make any long-term commitments. I know. I, I know. have to talk to my wife who uh, <laughs> uh, like we've, we've decided that, um, we're literally going to do better about just keeping a calendar just because there's so many live shows and so many collabs yeah. and stuff that you end up doing that I end up booking like evenings without even realizing it. And then my yeah. wife's like, well, when are we going to like, what evening is free this week for us to do something? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, because I do, I, I commit to different things at different times. It's not like I plan it all at once. I plan it over the course of several weeks. And then I'm like, Oh crap, this week I literally have something every freaking day. Yeah. So that's one thing we, I, I am personally, I'm trying to do better on just so that I may, I've also said, I've also committed. I'm like, look one, like I am committing to, and it's not like this is the only time we're going to hang out, but I'm like one night a week, I will do nothing. Like I will not, mm -hmm. I will not commit to anything guaranteed one week night. Cause we do stuff on the weekends, but like one week night, you and I will hang out and I will, I, yeah. you know, will, because like, it's not fair that I book up all my evenings and then don't leave anything for my wonderful wife. So I'm going to make sure that I, you know, spend time with her as well because, you know, I love my wife, but it's, I just get so 
I guess so wrapped up, wrapped up. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I, I feel that this month's pretty crazy. So uh, for everyone who's wondering and anybody watch my gardens of the moon um, review, I'm going to be doing a spoiler discussion with Philip chase and rhythm this Wednesday. Nice. Uh, at I trying to remember what time. I don't know. I can't remember what the time I, I, I'm pretty sure it's 7 PM Eastern, but look on my community tab. I'll, I'll make an announcement for it. Uh, but I also have a time of blood with you uh, coming up at the end of the month. And then I also I'm so glad that's at the end of the month. They, they <laughs> usually are like, they don't even ask me. They literally, they always set the freaking times. And then I'm like, I see it too late. And I'm like, guys, can I, I haven't read it yet. Can we move it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I actually, so I, I was invited uh, by Abby to do a talk for the forgetting moon by Brian Lee Durfee. Cause I'm reading it this month <laughs> and they wanted to do it. I said, I'm not going to have it finished till like the third week of August. Yeah. You know? So I have a very, and then the 28th in the morning, we have the discussion. I, I get it. Uh, I, I, I feel like I, I've, I need to start a calendar as well. Just, just to make sure. Oh, and I'm also doing a, uh, a Joe Abercrombie live stream on Leanna's channel. Uh, towards the end of the month as well. Uh, Alan convinced Jimmy to watch Downtown Abbey. Give yeah. me your best. I mean, it's <laughs> you. You do like British stuff, so we're 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 ahead. Uh, Downton Abbey is the best show. It is the best. Uh, wait, it's, show. It, it's Downton. I, Downton. I said I said Downtown. So did I. So did I. But it's it, it, it's not a direction. It it's the name of the estate. The name of the estate is Downton. Okay, um, Downton. It is the best acted and written show where nothing happens um it is but it, it is a it is a fantastic social exploration of the difference between the it, so downton abbey is a it is a one of those noble estates like the head is like an earl it's the earl of um i forget what the last name is um Crawley, Earl Crawley. he runs the estate and you know he's in charge of the well-being of all the people who work like mr Crawley, like no, no, okay. no, 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 not, not like that. But, um, and you know, all the, they all live upstairs and all the servants, you know, live downstairs and everything. And it follows both the nobles, uh, the, you know, the aristocrats and the, um, and the, the, you know, the commoners, the servants. And it's really, it's really, really good. First of all, Maggie Wilson, um, Maggie Smith, sorry, Maggie Smith, um, of, you know, the, I, know, I always know her from Mother Superior, from Sister Act, but everyone else knows her from McGonagall, from Harry Potter. Uh, she's just fantastic. Like she's just, she is, she plays the 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 grandma, and she just is so out of touch with reality because she's just like you know she's old money. Like she, she at one point, she, someone talks about like yeah, and have the weekends off, and she goes, "What is a weekend?" Without any sense of irony, it's like she doesn't know what that is. Like she's never worked a day in her life. She's fantastic, but it, it, it is exceptional. I thought, I'm like, why would I watch this? And then my friend made me sit down with me. And after the first episode, I was like, play another one. I was like, play another one, play another one. I think I watched like four episodes in a sitting <laughs> because I didn't think, I didn't think it was going to, I didn't think it was going to be about anything. And it's not, um, it's about, you know, it's about, it's about, it's about, it's about Britain exiting the age of the aristocrat and kind of entering the modern era. It's like right before world war one is when it starts. And so it's just transitioning from that old school aristocratic thing to a more, you know, uh, I don't know, democratic society kind of thing, but it's excellent. The acting is fantastic. Um, especially if you like British acting, but, um, it is definitely not for everyone, but is, is it any, any, uh, similarity to the crown by chance? It, uh, yes, it is similar. It just depends on if you I think the crown is. Do you like the crown? I think the crown is a, is more boring. Than, I I, um, I like I like everything. It was it was the acting everything, but I did not continue it. Not because I was like, forget this. Yeah. I just I just simply never got back to. I it. think yes. If you like the crown, I think it is better than the crown. Um, okay. in, in my opinion, I watched yeah. the first season of the crown and also did not continue. But if you like the crown, I cannot imagine you not liking Down Abbey. Um. So yeah. All right, I'm sold. I'm in, and I think that's something uh, my my wife might like as well. So that would be yeah. I I watched it just uh, right after my wife and I got married. I watched it again with her, and she loved it too. Uh, I, I I gotta mention this. I, I I'm not gonna say any spoilers per se, but my wife uh, has never read or watched Game of Thrones, and we just watched the Red Wedding. She was very angry. <laughs> I mean, when I read that book. 
I was also very angry. <laughs> Dude, I I mean, it's just it's one of those things like we talk about it all the time as fantasy fans, yada yada yada. But watching someone else experience it for the first time. And like you're you're seeing like the you know, obviously the books are different, right? Yeah. But the, even with the show, I got, I, I think it's a great episode, and like all the foreboding and the music, so, you know, reigns of cast you're like, oh, here we go, you know, and uh, just watching her reaction uh, to it was was pretty amazing. It was it was a whole different take on on something I already loved, right? Yeah, I love. I mean, I loved when I when I lent out my my Song of Ice and Fire books to my friends, and they got to Storm of Swords. And uh, and they got to that. I kept being like, "Where are you? Where are you in the book? Where are you in the book?" Because the thing is, you don't have to ask. Like they'll tell you oh. immediately after it happens. Yeah. But like and and the thing about and this we talked about this last time. What Martin did, at, I had never read anything like that when I read it ever. I'd never read anything like that. Like yeah. I couldn't. I didn't even understand. This is something unlike Pierce Brown, where I was like, "Can you do that?" Like I didn't even think you could do that in a novel where Pierce Brown does things you literally can't. And he did it anyway, but that the last freaking third of that book is some of the best fantasy ever written. In my opinion, the last third of, of Storm. Uh, of that's my favorite book of all time. It's, it's so good. It's yeah. so freaking good. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's hard to overstate it, to be honest with you. Um, uh, Matthew Brown says that uh, he wish you didn't have to work every Friday night. I wish you didn't either. And thank you so much. Yes, for thank you. Yeah, I, we, we definitely appreciate it. The um, says I was kind of happy when stuff happened to the few of those characters. I just want to say that my wife hates Catelyn Stark. And that's all I'm going to say for Pr Pranav. Did you literally just change your profile picture? Yeah. What is you literally I, just changed it? Like Pranav's like, I don't want my face on the screen. In this conversation. Um, Jimmy, you said so you're going on Leanna's channel to read, to talk about Joe Abercrombie. Yeah, I am going on or Leanna's coming on my channel this this weekend because we did a TBR swap in July this is one of the reasons that I'm also behind is because um, I like the TBR swap idea where I read something that another booktuber wants me to read. I will never do four books again. I can't read that much. I can't. Um, I might do two, maybe even just one. Be like, hey, this month I'm going to let a different booktuber pick my pick a book on my TBR. Four books is too much and it's put me in the hole. So I'm not done. But she read all the four that I gave her and she freaking trashed my sh shadow in summer. First book of long price quartet, two stars. Ooh. Chance, first book in the book of Babel, three stars. To be fair, Leanna doesn't. I feel like, like anything. She, she's yeah, she's she's a tough, uh, tough one to please. Guards, guards, the guards, guards, three stars. <laughs> and I'm like, what? I'm like the other, like, I can't even talk about the others now. Like guards, guards, three stars. And then I go and look up Ember in the Ashes, which is a book you gave to me. It's five stars. I'm like, really, Leanna? Ember in the Ashes, five stars? And guards, guards, three stars? Do you know what books are? Like, what? And so I haven't, like, I've resisted asking her why because we do have that uh, live show this weekend um, where she's going to tell me all the problems that she had with it. And I'm just like, <sighs> I'm so mad, Jimmy. I'm like, <laughs> like th th she's wrong. Like I can't like, <laughs> yeah. I, like shadow and summer. First of all, we just talked about this. No, no. <laughs> Leanna is right. objectively wrong. Anybody else <laughs> can have an opinion. Leanna is, she's not right. <gasps> I, I will say that Shadow and Summer is rated very poorly on Goodreads, and it makes me mad. If you actually look up Long Vice Quartet, like the Omnibus edition, it is yeah. much higher. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, I, I understand why a lot of people start after stop after Shadow and Summer, but Shadow and Summer, just like Dragon's Path, I'm assuming, it is elevated so much by yes. what comes after it. Yes. Um, I, I also didn't think Dragon's Path... Like I, I actually hate conceding that point to people yeah. because I don't feel that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I know now. I'll be honest. Petrick, uh, Petrick said I almost he, DNF'd it. Yeah. If 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 it if it wasn't Daniel Abraham, yeah, he would. Have. Yeah. If it wasn't for me pressuring him and Daniel Abraham, he probably would have DNF'd it. Mm -hmm. I think that's drastic. Uh, okay. To be honest, now people's tolerance for DNF, whatever. I'm not saying Petrick's wrong or anything like that, but I'm just saying for me, per like there are people. There we're out here where we like Daniel Abraham book ones. I just do. Yeah, I I liked I really liked Shadow and Summer. 
but when I read like Autumn War and Price of Spring, I was like, oh, I like Shadow and Summer way better now. And so I'm anticipating that with with Dragon's Path. The first half of Dragon's Path was just it was just it was weird for me. It was it was I don't know. Like it was slow, but it's fine. It was just weird. But I I, I really enjoyed it. Like I gave it I gave it three and a half stars, but um I'll probably end up raising that. I did the same thing with Shadow and Summer. I was like three and a half stars. And then I was like, I actually hey, gave I'm most of uh the dagger and the coin four stars. Yeah. And, and by the way, my ratings don't mean anything. Uh <laughs> I'm not that guy. But it's just such a consistently good experience where like you're almost taking it for granted because it's just been so good the whole time. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Where like other series have clear power spikes in, in the uh, in the arc. Yeah. Uh, I feel like Daniel Abraham does an exceptional job of just smoothing you along. And by the end of it, you go, wow, I was just told an epic fantasy story without realizing it was an epic fantasy story. Abraham, especially in Long Price Quartet, and I'm going to uh, give him the benefit of the doubt and assume he does this in Dagger and Coin as well. Abraham, one, there is no question when reading Long Price, when you're finished, that he had the whole thing planned out from page one because... And that, and that is why I think they feel like that, is because he's telling a complete story. And sometimes that means the beginning is not going to be what you want it to be, or it's going to be different than other fantasy books because he's not writing one book. He's writing five books. That's right. Or he's telling one story. And that's what he does in Long Price Quartet. Like when something, when something like comes into play in book, you know, three that references like crap from the prologue of book one, you're like, there's oh. no way that ha there's no way he, he like tied that in on accident. He, knew that that's what was going to happen yeah he's it, not afraid that he's not going to get a book two deal he doesn't he does not care exactly uh, and, and that I, is I what respect i love that. about abraham hit the prologue for the dagger and the coins I, it's so good dude bleeds spiders jimmy it's so good in the prologue that's one of the coolest things in the whole book is in the pro dude <laughs> He bleeds spiders. Bleeds spiders. That is, oh my gosh, that's so freaking awesome. I, I love that that character, by the way, the the apostate. Yes, uh, I, I like, love the I like idea of an apostate. I love, uh, honestly, whenever religion's tied into any fantasy, I'm generally a huge fan. I'm, of I'm also a big fan of um, of religion and fantasy as well. It's, yeah, uh, it's especially fun. when it comes to like questioning powers and how the powers were acquired and all of those things. I think <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's one of the, my favorite. That's why uh, the Forgetting Moon by Brian Lee Durfee, I've heard, is very similar to uh, Faithful in the Fall and the, and the themes that it explores. And I've yeah. heard that he dives in a little bit more to religion. And I, I have high hopes for. I think it's going to be a five star. I've never read a, a, a single word from Durfee. Yeah, me either. Tad, um, Tad Williams likes him. Oh, really? Nice. And Alex loves it. So I feel like I have a pretty good shot at, at really loving it. Yeah, I have a bunch of friends reading Forgetting Moon right now and are like on. Abby's one of them. Like on and on and on and on and on about it. Like right now, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's too long. Like it's, too it's like it. That's literally why it's not. Uh, near my TBR right now is it's too long. Oh, then the I think page one is I think book one is like 800 pages, and I'm like, if book one's that long, I gotta postpone it. Like I've got, but to get through what I'm reading currently, the font is huge. Is it? it? It actually is. I think on Kindle it's only. Uh, someone fact checked me. I'll probably be wrong. I think it's only 650 pages on Kindle, which is a better gauge. Oh, okay. So, well, okay. All right. Then that's not that's not quite as bad. Yeah, so I mean, it's still. I mean, let me add it to my list. Yeah, come on, add it, add it, add it, add it, add it. I'm reading it uh, after Dune, actually. Forgetting Moon. Yeah, Durfee. Alex, what's up? Alex says Forgetting Moon does religion better than anything I've read. I've consistently heard this. Hardcover, 800 pages, Jimmy. Guess what Goodreads says. Well, what what's the Kindle? You gotta look at the Kindle. All right, let me look at the Kindle. Yeah, look at the Kindle. Where's it? Where's change? Other editions. There we go. Where's yeah, the people have been telling me I'm forgetting Moon. Religion and fantasy is best when the religion is actually true in the world, not just something the character believes. I I, I like both. Uh, I I don't have an issue with either. Um, but I'm probably a little weird in that. I don't I don't think I have a a, a preference, uh, Logan, to which one I I enjoy. Uh, Durfee's second book dives deeper in, and it's great. Yeah, I've all everyone pretty much. I think everyone says his second book's even a bigger step up. I mean, the fact that Tad gave him the A OK. Uh, you know, T Tad can do no wrong in my book. <laughs> so, yeah, I watched your um your video. Dragonbone uh, chair. 
Yeah, of Dragon Ball Chair. And I Mega don't know Chair. if you'll like it. Oh, really? I don't know if you're going to like it. It's Tolkien derivative, but then he takes it. I mean, he's the link between George and Tolkien, right? Um, I think you'll hate Simon because you don't you I don't like I, I, I guarantee you I'll hate Simon. Yeah, you're going to hate you. Actually, I would love to hear you hate on Simon. He, I think it'd be a blast. I heard that he just literally complains. He's a bit of a moron, uh, but I I love him. And honestly, he is the main character, but like, I don't know. He does a great job of fleshing out the cast. Language plays a massive role in the book. That I mean, that I I, I love that. I'm he, one of the things I'm I'm reading right now. Uh, Leanna's one of Leanna's favorite books um, on my TBR is called The Wolf, and a bunch of people don't like it. And it's just for and it's the guy's first book, Leo Carew, and I. I see first book problems and, you know, but one of the things that it has is characters studying, like these are foreign cultures, like ones like a kind of blend of Neanderthal, ancient Greek Viking culture. And then the other one are the, the Britons. Um, but they're exploring each other's cultures and like studying language and, oh, you have, so you don't have a word that means this. Like you have these words that kind of mean, Dude, I, love, I love language and oh. studying books. I love it. Well, if you can grip onto that and and uh, be okay with Simon, then Memory Star and Thorn will be right up your alley. There is an entire like pronunciation guide in the back of the book and explaining the That's origins cool. of the languages. That's uh, cool. I mean, my Lands of Ostenard video. It's like a before you read. Um, I kind of I, I kind of touch on the languages a bit and what they're inspired by because some of the languages are inspired by like Italian and such. Uh, Tad does a phenomenal job of language barriers uh, in, in that book. And man, I've heard the sequel trilogy is even better. Uh, this is one Colton's mentioning, and I've had uh, Andrew Wizardly Reads mention this to me. It's the Never, no, maybe maybe it was different. I think I might be thinking of something else, but the Never Night Chronicles is underrated AF. Is Never uh, Night, like, is that by Jay Kristoff? Well, yeah, wait, is this the Jay? Kr I'm thinking of Nightmare. I think I'm thinking of something else that Andrew was, I don't know if Wizardly. Never Night, is that Jay Kristoff? Because I've read the first few pages of Never Night. Uh, I, I have uh, Christoph on my probably not going to read list, but uh, Christoph just <sighs> don't judge a book by what everyone says about it. I think Christoph, I think Christoph LARPs Vampire the Masquerade. Like he looks like a, like a Vampire the Masquerade LARPer. Like I knew a lot of those in college and that's who he looks like. And I'm just like, do you go like, do you dress in like a dark cloak and go to like an underground bar and order like, a shot of blood. <laughs> like, is this a CSI episode where they did that? <laughs> like, I just every time I see him, blood? every time I see him, I'm like, where's the where's the underground like secret bar that you and your other vampire friends hang out at? Yeah, I got this mixed up with the night. There's like a novella series about nightmare. Uh, Leslie's really big into it. From uh, you know yeah, what I'm talking about? Those horror. Uh, Daniel. Daniel, it's a general name. Daniel uh, Bar Barnett, Daniel Barnett, I think. Um, yeah, she, I've heard those are scary as crap. Yeah, I'm. I'm actually might try to read. That's what I thought of when I saw Never uh, Chronicle. I don't know why I thought that. Um, Colton, if you're here, uh, just verify. Is that's the Kristoff stuff? Um, so yeah, it is. He, he verified it. Oh, did and he? yes, Derry remembers the CSI episode with the vampire bar. Yes. <laughs> oh, good. Um, yeah, that's the read along that, uh, we're doing over, over on my channel is, um, Adrian Tchaikovsky's Shadow of the Apt. It's a 10 book series, but 10 books, I think is, it's too much for a read along. Like you can't keep people's attention for 10 books. It's really, really hard. Um, mm -hmm. so we're just reading the first four, which from what I hear is a complete arc. Um, and I, like we did Red Rising, we just finished a Red Rising read along. And it was some, it was some of the most fun I'd had doing these read alongs. Mm -hmm. And so when I was finished, I just took a, a bunch more sci-fi series, I think like six of them. And I just had people in the, in the discord vote on them and that's what we voted on. And so that's what we're doing now. And when we're done with that, I'll do another one because the read-alongs are super, super, super fun. It, has Alex tried to pitch this as sun eater to you yet, Jimmy? Oh man, I got books two and three. And then one of my patrons is sending me a hardcover of book one. Um, I'm, I'll be honest. I'm pretty excited about it. So I recommend there's a guy I work with. And when I say he's the best read person, I know it's not even relatively close this guy has been reading fantasy and sci-fi since like the seventies. I mean, he's probably read over like thousands of books. More than Patrick. 
Oh, dude, he stomps on Petrick. Like, dude, I've never met anyone that reads as much as this. Holy dude. crap. And he is very hard to impress. I've recommended him some of the newer stuff because he doesn't keep up as much now. Yeah. And some of it's a hit, some of it isn't. And I said, you might like Sun, uh, ch- try the Sun Eater thing. I said, you love Dune. You'll, you know, he's an old school guy. He messaged me. He went on vacation. He messaged me and he said, Sun Eater is one of the best things he's ever read. He said, he said it was astounding how good it was. He said he could not put it down. He said, I've spent most of my vacation ignoring my kid. <laughs> he said, and I've just been reading Sun Eater. He said, this is a fabulous book. Uh, and again, this is a guy pretty hard to impress. Uh, now, what that means, I don't know, because everyone's subjectively different with what they look for in a book. Uh, oh, is that it? Boom. It came into focus. That was pretty dope, actually. Yeah, someone uh, someone sent it to me and um, I uh, because they really want me to read it. <laughs> I have a, I have a, a patron named Albert who like every day is like, when are you starting Sun Eater? I'm like, do you see how long this book is, Albert? Like, let me tell you how long it is. 700 pages later is the answer to that. <laughs> but, but I always, I always like give them hope when I have to say later, I always give them hope it's on the patron wheel. So if, if I spin empire silence, I'll read, spin, I'll read empire silence. Otherwise you're gonna have to wait for me to make room for it. That, that that's like the big thing with my, uh, with my patrons, like the two top tier people yeah. or not people, but the tiers. I, I, I kind of, I have books in my head. I'm like, I hope they put that on there. Like, same, same, same. Alex is a Night's Watch, so he's in my second tier. Alex, you could put Empire Silence. I'm just saying on the on the random selection, it might get picked. But there's definitely do. books that I'm like, I hope people push this up. Like one of them, two people actually suggested it. So I don't know about you, but if people put in two, I give it two times the chance on the like I put in two entries for a book if two people go in on it. You see what I mean? So if all my patrons wanted to screw me over, they That's could take it. My that. patrons would 100% abuse that. They would literally start because <laughs> they I, would. I have like 10 people wanting me to read Empire of Silence, and I can't put I can't put it up there. 10 can't put. I gotta I gotta give the lesser known ones some chances. Uh, but but there is I mean there is a chance of me spinning it. Never Die Acts of Cain. I haven't read Never Die. Did I did I read a book? Hero, heroes Never Die. He, he the, uh, Pat is one of my he missed the earlier discussion. Oh, Heroes Die Acts of Cain. Yeah. Heroes Die is fantastic. We just talked about that. Heroes Die is fantastic. Don't read Blade of Tashal. Book two is freaking terrible. Please don't read Blade of Tashal. It has it has one of the most disturbing scenes in fiction I've ever read, and I remember it. And I last read it like in two thousand one, and it's twenty years later, and I still remember it. And it's all I remember from that book, other than the fact that it was terrible. Like I remember it was bad, and then I remember this scene that comes out of nowhere that is just like what. Also, why does this book exist and why is it not cool like heroes die? <laughs> I don't under I don't understand. Patrick agreed. Like I was so happy to be vindicated when Patrick's like, yeah, it's not good. I'm like, yes, it's so bad, Patrick. Um, but heroes die is fantastic. I love, yeah. I love, uh, love heroes die. There's a lot of love for Sun Eater in the chat. Uh, yeah, I've heard that his talk with Mike was very good. Yeah, the only person I've seen not like empire silence was i think books with britney didn't like it i think and that's it otherwise everyone everyone else has has seen it like loved it yeah i uh, dairy i think it's not the library because it's it's actually relatively new that i if if i'm correct i think he puts out a book every two to three years and he's like 2018 for this thing yeah he's sticking to it uh told me once crescent city i actually don't know what crescent city is crescent Um, city is okay so it's the newest series, the first book in the newest series by the Akatar author, Sarah J. Mass. Oh, and it's 800 pages. I'm good on that. Uh, yeah, please don't put that on, on the wheel. <laughs> if, you're, if you're a Night's Watcher Kingsguard member, please don't. Uh, okay, Benjamin so, Khan. So, Benjamin. Let, let, let's read the comment for those only audio listeners. So, Benjamin has come into the realm of Alexandria and has challenged uh, Alan to a duel and says, I just tried Mort as my first Pratchett and was a bit disappointed by the character work and humor. I needed more death. Can't wait to try the watch books. Though. Okay. So, he, ha- he hasn't challenged me because here's the thing I agree with you. I, I, I agree. Everyone who reads it wants more death. People who, bi- who bill, like, who, who, you know, pitch Pratchett or the, the, the whatever they make the death book sound, you know, really good as if death's going to be in it a lot. 
Mm-hmm. He's not in Mort all that much. I was shocked by that too, by the way. People do not prepare for this. I thought Mort was death. The problem is, is that the death books, because of the way it's pitched, sound cooler than the City Watch. So a bunch of people choose to read Mort first, despite my pleadings to please read Guards Guards first. And it's just because the pitch sounds better. And I agree, it does. But I think Guards Guards is hands down a better book than Mort, 100%. Mort's his fifth book. He is still getting his feet. Guards Guards embodies everything that's great about Pratchett. Death is – did you finish Reaper Man, um, uh, Jimmy? No, I've only read Mort. I'm trying to fit in uh, Discworld. Basically, if, if I'm at the end of a month and I have like three days, I'm reading Discworld. I got that's you. Um, death is – death is – in it more in Reaper Man and Soul Music and Hogfather. I remember Hogfather the best where death is Santa Claus. But death is – Pratchett purposely doesn't make death the main character. He, he He's not. Death is never the main character. It is always – he's always a side character. Um, in Reaper Man, they're dealing a lot. He's in Reaper Man a lot. But otherwise, we're following his granddaughter um, in Soul Music and Hogfather, but he has some great moments. Like when death is in it, it's fantastic, but it just really depends on how much you enjoy the, the non um, the non death part of the storyline. Uh, but I think, I mean, death is a fantastic character and I love death, but I think guards guards is objectively a better book than Mort in my, I mean, in my opinion, it's actually so, fun. We're talking about Mort because uh, Jake man, carrying thing has dropped in. Hi, Jake episode number nine of chatting with nuts. Uh, he also kind of, I felt, uh, he liked Mort, but I think he thought he was going to like it more. Uh, but he was still very positive on it. Yeah, e- everyone thinks it's because people go into Mort not not knowing what they're going to get, um, mm-hmm. and and that's fine. And some people like, don't give a crap, and then some people some people do. Uh, but I just think I think I think book eight guards guards book eight maybe nine book eight guards guards is where Terry Pratchett hit his stride, and literally everything that is iconic about Pratchett is found in in guards guards and then you know it, it just goes from there that's why i love the the watch books now i love the death books also um but in the watch books all the characters are fantastic you're not just hoping that death will come back you know what i mean um and susan his granddaughter's fantastic too like i love like she is such a cool character uh starting in soul music uh yeah gary just said that Su- susan's my hero um Jake, please let me know what you think of Guards Guards because it like it is I 10 I'm not sure if I'm 10 guineas sure. I I would I would like like you only said 10 guineas to a bent hat pen if you're like positive. But I am fairly confident. I would wager a not insubstantial amount of money that um you would like you will like Guards Guards better. I, I I hope I, Guards Guards is one of I, Guards Guards is the most read book I own. I have it, read Guards Guards more than I've read any other book that I own. And it, I'm kind of weird, so I knew Mort wasn't going to be as good as Guards Guards Guard from everything I knew, and I, and that's why I didn't read it first. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Like I actually don't like starting with an author if they have a large collection. Starting with the best, yeah. I, li- I like starting with good that and makes, working to the best. That makes sense. That does um, make sense. Um, I'm reading actually Guards Guards with Philip Chase in October. Um, and I'm so excited to talk with, with Dr. Chase about Discworld and uh, and Guards Guards. So that'll be exciting. Oh, man. This, talking to doc, uh, Dr. Philip Chase Dr. is always a, it's always illuminating, as, as I, I, I like to say. Um, he always brings it. I'm so excited to talk guard, uh, Gardens of the Moon with him in Rhythma this Wednesday. Like I'm pumped uh, because I know I'm going to learn a lot. And I always like to hear those. Those two were like the main people who got me to read Malazan. Yeah. So I wanted to bring them on. And dude, you know another cool thing is like no. Sorry. Wait, where is it? <laughs> That's not what I said, Jake. And you, Alan you know has it. given me a hundred dollars. No, I said I'm not. I said I would wager a not in some. And I'm not wagering. I'm not betting you. That gives you incentive to not like it. I'm betting the house. <laughs> so. He's he's betting the house. Yeah, so I have to pay the house a not insubstantial amount of money. And I'm a teacher, so I'm wagering my $100 Boondocks <laughs> gift certificate that I won in the trivia competition at In Service. So you can come to Panama City and go eat at a seafood restaurant called the Boondocks. I mean, it sounds kind of good. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> they have good cheese grits. 
Do you like cheese? Ooh, grits? I love grits. Do you really? And you're yeah. in Virginia? I'm in. I'm in. I'm, uh, I'm near DC. Oh, yeah. Are you from? You're from West Virginia. I'm from uh, Northwest Virginia, Southwest PA area. Uh, oh, gotcha. Technically, I lived in Southwest PA, but we did everything in West Virginia. Everything I ever did was in West Virginia. I got gotcha. you. Um, so yeah, but my dad uh, had spent a large amount of his life in, I think it was South Carolina, and he was a big grits fan. So he would make them or order them at restaurants, and I would have them. So like shrimp and grits is something I really like. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Um. Well, sorry. What were you saying about Philip and 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 Rhythma? No, I was saying I'm really excited to talk about Gardens of the Moon because there's just a lot to talk about. You know, there's there's a lot of big reveals and stuff. And uh, now that I finished Dead House Gates, like the one thing I will say is uh, a lot of people say Dead House Gates is way better than Gardens of the Moon. And I think it is a better book. I think it's better written for sure. Uh, and it also does a lot of things better. But I enjoyed them about the same. And I know that sounds weird, even though I think Dead House Gates is a better book. But I liked the story, the gardens, like the the tale because all the books are the tales of the malas and the book of fall i like the tale of gardens of the moon a lot i like how all the ties came together at the end i felt very rewarded for figuring some stuff out mm -hmm. you know before it happened which was cool dead house gates i didn't get that same feeling but i got a different feeling of like oh man this is this is building this is yeah. building and building and building like you kind of get the the kickoff in gardens of the moon which obviously you do in book one right yeah but, dead house gates i'm like there's going to be some big implications like going forward from yeah that. i think in gardens of the moon i like dead house gates better but i liked the povs and storylines in gardens of the moon overall more mm -hmm. but like like there were many there were several storylines in dead house gates where i'm like i don't care i just don't care pranav knows <laughs> chain of dogs the entirety of chain of dogs from yeah. from the uh from hisar you know, from the 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 whirlwind hitting Hisar, and the march across the entire freaking, the entire like, I love military fantasy. And didn't you didn't you say on your channel recently that you don't read or don't like military fantasy? Something didn't you did you say that recently? Is that you? I'm thinking of. Uh, no, no, I, I don't think I said that. Okay, well that's fine. Well, I, well, what I said was is that I need more than just military for a ten book series. I want to see. Norman that's right. Cooper. That's right. Okay, so I, I I'm just I just misquoted you. I apologize. But yeah. yeah, I'm a huge huge military fantasy is my is my is my jam. Like I love war in books. Like I, I just love the military action and stuff. And so the chain of dogs was so well written from just beginning and then the conclusion of the chain of dogs. What like. I first read that book in 2008 and it is one of the most vividly recalled scenes. Yes. That I, that I have, that I have remembered since then, because again, I stopped reading fantasy for like 10 years and I still remember the chain of dogs. I, I couldn't, I couldn't believe the things that were happening and the anger and rage and just all these things that happen in the chain of dogs. It's so freaking good that I literally like. I don't care about Akari and Mapo. They're walking around looking at old stuff. How dare you? I don't care, Jimmy. Their relationship like, is phenomenal. I, and you know what? You have you have the popular opinion, and that's what everyone always tells me when I say I don't. They just walk around looking at old stuff. They're like, yeah, but they're friends. I'm like, I don't care. Well, I love museums, so I'm. I'm <laughs> and the thing, is, look, look, I love ancient history. I love walking around Rome looking at old stuff, but. No one probably likes reading about my account of walking around looking at old stuff. Well, I would. <laughs> Clearly. Here's, okay. Here's my impression of Ikarium and Mappo. All right. Okay. Here's Ikarium. Okay. Mappo, I feel like I've been here before. <laughs> Who built this? Did I build this? I sense a great sadness. I just can't remember. No, friend. You must not remember. Come, let us go elsewhere. That's all it is for like 400. That is an egregious, <laughs> disingenuous. It's not. That is exactly it's what it is. It's today. actually not. It's, it's actually exactly not. what it I is. liked it. I don't know. Now, in the later books, uh, it is not to the later books that I start liking uh, that that storyline. Um, but, and what is it? The Felison uh, Heberic uh, Bodden storyline. Yeah, I like that one too. Um, the, the Callum stuff. We talked about the Callum stuff before we went on the mm -hmm. air. I'm like, Fiddler. I love Fiddler, but I don't care about the path of hands and the all of that 
wild stuff that happens at the end. I'm just like, go to the chain of dogs. Like, let's look at Duiker. Like, let's go, let's go follow Duiker, you know? So, <laughs> you know what? You're not wrong. And I, the thing is, Jimmy, is I end up like, I like the desert setting. And See, so I, I don't like desert settings, but I still like this book. Yeah. So. I, so I end up liking the seven cities books. So two, four, and six, six is my favorite. Uh, more than the Genabacus books, which is one, three, and oh, two. so that's how it's split. I didn't know this. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 split up into like cool. it it you know you'll be back in Genabacus. Well, we jump back and forth, but I didn't know there were seven cities books. That's really cool. Yeah, the ones that are in the the ones that are in the desert, and uh, but uh, so I just end up liking the desert ones. Uh, that, me too, Justin. Um, oh, yeah, I like ones. Felice. And you. Again, you have the popular opinion, and we're not gonna, we're, we're definitely not gonna talk about no, no. not liking Phyllis in here because that sparks a whole, yeah, we're good, another yeah. can of worms that we never need to bring up again. Um, but, uh, but I mean, I like, I thought that storyline was really good, the where it went, where it started, the whole thing. I just didn't like, I didn't like really any of those characters because it's just, again, they're mad and angry all I, I, the time. I did feel a little bit of that. Um, with, with some of the characters, um, yeah. I, I preferred the cast from Gardens of the Moon for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but but I uh, it's it's not I, I think I like Dead House Gates more as a as a book. But I don't know. Actually, it's about the same for me. I, I really liked both. How about that? I, I don't. I, One of the sieges in book three is incredible. It's in my top sieges of all time um, as far as like uh, like a, like a city being being ransacked. It's. Like he writes military like action like so good like mm -hmm. and and I and you know I've read Bernard Cornwell's chart books where it's the best siege writing I've ever read and you know Erickson is up there in um, several of his sieges one of them one of them's in Memories of Ice uh, it's my favorite part of the book uh, it's oh, it's good stuff it's good I mean I'm I'm definitely eager to see. Um, I think you, I think you're gonna. I think three is gonna be your favorite so far, just because of everything. I'll bring, I'll bring you on when I read three. I'll bring you on. Nice. Everything you said about so far and what you've told me the the people you like in in uh, book one, like yes, yeah, somebody told me that they said book three will probably be a hit with me. Yeah, you're gonna like it a lot. Yeah, I, I am kind of hoping. And uh, by the way, Glamma, yeah, this is my uh, first read through. Um, I am hoping the Memories of Ice is the one that puts it up, like because I'm I'm really enjoying Miles. Like it has my full attention. Uh, I'm loving it, but I need I need I need my Storm of Swords. You know, money. I do. You're right. Yeah. Um, I do. Like, I, I literally have ranked sieges. Like dude, you should make that video, bro. I, I'm waiting. I'm waiting to to fill it out. I'm I'm trying to get to the top ten. I don't <laughs> have ten yet, but I'm, I am waiting. I'm I'm planning on it. Um crap about now oh but in book three there is that moment that i was talking about where a character makes a decision that literally makes no sense in any context and when you i'll just i'll just message you as you're reading it being like where are you in the book i'll message you because i'll probably pick it out i hope so i hope yeah. so it makes no sense yeah, I'm, but I, I'm very much enjoying the Malazan experience. Also, I just want to start calling it Malazan again, because let's be honest, Malazan sounds way better. It sounds like Alakazam, which is inherently magical. So I call it Malazan because it sounds cool. It's before I heard anybody say otherwise. But I saw this video of a guy like who lit is a short video of where he was just like on YouTube where he's like, <laughs> OK, guys, like I'm so tired of people mispronouncing Malazan. And he's like, and I don't really understand why, because it's a really easy way to remember it. And he's like, the city is Malaz City. So, of course, it's going to be Malazan. You wouldn't, like, you call Rome the Roman Empire. So, if it's Malaz City, it's Malazan. I'm like, but I'm like, I, I commented on this video. I'm like, dude, there's no pronunciation guide for Malaz City. I say Malaz City. Which well, is the, why I say Malazan. The the narrator in the audiobook, as I did an immersive reading, uh, it th they say Malazan. <laughs> so and, and he also pronounces uh, talk to the author. <laughs> he pronounces Duker uh, like Diker, and it's and I've heard Erickson pronounce it Duker. Yeah, I say Duiker because it's a U and, and I. Duiker, yeah, I, I, Duiker. I, I'm of the I, I you know in Latin there are no silent letters, so I pronounce every letter unless I'm told not to. Yeah, I, I there's a, there's a lot of weird ones. Um, 
I, 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 I've been calling him Malazan because that's how I was told to say, it. you know, people, I mean, that's, that's right. You, that's right. But I call I, it, I kind of go back to, Mal to Malazan. Malazan sounds way cooler. I mean, people will, well, commenters will collect, correct you, but the people you're talking to, like Philip never corrects me. He knows I'm going to say Malazan. I'm going to say Malazan. That's what I'm going to do. Philip, Andy, like anybody I talk to about it, they don't correct me. Like, cause, cause, cause here's the thing. If that's what you're discussing, the books probably aren't very interesting. Like, who cares how we pronounce it? Because no one, like, people don't get bent out of shape when people pronounce characters' names wrong. People pronounce characters' names wrong all the time in every series. This is fantasy where, like, most freaking character names are freaking bizarre. And hard right? to pronounce. Yeah. So, I mean, so who cares? You pronounce it how you want to. Yeah. Um, you're right. I, that's, that's, I, pr I promote anarchy. So Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think Ralph Lister's phenomenal. Uh, I, I I actually did the immersive reading like while I'm doing the physical and listening audio because I, I just really enjoyed his narration a lot. Uh, even the comics of different regions would pronounce it differently, wouldn't they? Does an accent come into account from pronunciation of things? That is a Look very... Look at Colton. That's nice. Oh, no. Joanna, I'm so sorry I'm having to miss this again. Alan and Jimmy are wonderful. Love all the weird uh, Malazan. <laughs> that is the one thing. If you say Mal um, Malazan like that, you could really like hick it up. You know, like, oh, wait, I, I was reading Malazan. That's how my dad talks. Reading that Malazan. <laughs> Read that Malazan. That boy's always got his nose in one of them Malazan books. My dad literally said, how you read them books ain't got no pictures in them? I'm like, <laughs> because, dad. He has a point. <laughs> He has a point. I'm just saying. Oh, my dad is a very nice man, but I'm like, we're nothing alike. My dad uh, definitely passed on computer knowledge and reading to me. So we are very much alike in that regard. That's awesome. My dad passed on a need to, like, I know how to change a tire. And yes, my oil. I don't. Oh, nice. No. Well, I had a bunch of, I drove a bunch of hoopties. So I had to like, they were crap cars that had Hoopy. crap tires. So I had to, I've had to change many a tire in my in my day. Is it Ralph Lister the guy who narrated? Um, yes, gotcha. Malazan. I have I I am trying to get into audiobooks. It because, helps. Like if even if I could just read one uh, one audiobook a month, like I could increase my uh, I can increase my um, my 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 reading. But the problem is is that. I know that no book I listen to on audio, I will get as much as reading in front of me just because, like, just because of my focus, like mm -hmm. I'm doing something else. Um, and so I'm trying to pick, like, which book do I care about the least? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, or which book will be the hardest to read, really? Yes. Like, I'm, I'm considering the Winter King book, the, the Cornwell book on audio, just because just because of the way it's written, um, I think it might be more difficult for me to read. Um, I'm considering listening to that one. So I, I just don't know. I got to figure it out. Yeah, it, it's taken me a while, but my, my comprehension in, in audio, even at a fast pace, because I don't listen to it at 1.0, uh, is I would say 90 to 95% what my physical reading is, but it took a very long time to get to that point. And you're right. There are books that just don't translate well in audio uh yeah. not even the narrator's fault i mean obviously it can be a bad narrator but there are literally books that i think are just better read um i struggled with i, I listened to a lot of the audiobooks for realm of the elderlings uh some of the narrators were really bad uh some of them are pretty good uh but i always kind of felt like i i got more out of that those books specifically whenever i was reading them physically yeah um sorry uh, sorry colton <laughs> colton so he stopped making fun of my name <laughs> Sorry, I, I taught a student uh, named Colton, and so we always call him Colton. Um, and also, I've never seen the spelling of Colton. So, I, so sorry, that's <laughs> um, not right. It's not wrong. I've never seen it. Uh, Pranav, they really he says Sole Taken. It's Soul Taken. Wait, really? He says the freaking narrator of Book Four says Sole Taken. Instead that's, of soul taken. Yeah, that's a little weird. I, I don't like what it do to Song of Ice and Fire is guilty of this. And and God bless Roy Detroit, but man, some he he went off the rails in books four and five. Like he just started pronouncing shit different. Like he just dude, he he's like Peter, you know, P Peter Bailey. 
Peter. And you're like, why did you change it's it all of a sudden? Peter, it's just spelled weird. Sonzo. <laughs> and he has this like, and you know, God rest, he's, he's dead. Uh, oh, no. But I don't know if he was just losing his mind at the end or something, but Sonzo. <laughs> it's like Senza. And he, he changed the pronunciation in books form. It drove me wild. Drove me around. I have no idea how he got that pronunciation. I don't either. <laughs> That's it's not like Song of Ice and Fire has the hardest names to pronounce. I mean, maybe some of the people over in Marine or whatever. I, I, I might be misremembering uh the tire thing. Yeah, I, I you know what it is. I think I thought he should be saying Peter, and he did say Petire the whole time. You're right, Nick. Um though did did he in book five? No, yeah. I, <laughs> Honestly, I try, I try if Nick says it, it's true because he's the audio. Him and Scott are the audio kings that I know. So, but Peter Baelish, like I, <laughs> why it's Peter like, Baelish? Chill, chill, Roy. The same chill, people. bro. The same people. Freaking Alan, out of all the stuff you got coming up, what are you most excited about to get to? Like, what's your number one thing that you keep thinking? I want to be reading this books. Mm -hmm. Uh ooh, ooh. Ooh, uh, probably dagger and coin, probably dagger and coin or something on our, um, on our flintlock list, uh, trying to work through the flintlock, uh, scene, but of like specific books, dagger and coin. Cause I really want to get it done. Cause I really want to, to read age of ash when it comes out. Um, or preferably snag an arc of age of ash. Um, Abraham's new series. If we could be so lucky. I know, like it's uh, like I'm. Are so you worried about how it's going to be received because of his book ones being slower? Are you worried, or do you think this is it? Do you think this is the one that hits? That's a good point. I mean, I, who knows? Like that's a good. That's an excellent point. Um, I think I think Abraham has bought a lot of goodwill with the Expanse. So, however, I think a lot of people are going to read Abraham for the first time after the Expanse and are going to be yeah. disappointed that it's not the expanse but well that's true i have a feeling that we're on a blade's edge here and that this this could be his thing and i know the expanse is a mega hit it's it's up i mean it is going to be a part of the yeah. ethos forever now in sci-fi right uh people mention it in the same nates as all uh, with all the other greats, right? Of sci-fi. I, I think Daniel Abraham has yet to get his crowning achievement in fantasy, even though he's done great work. Yeah. And I'm just like, man, we're on the blade's edge. Either like it's not going to be super well received because of the way he starts out, or he's going to nail it. I hope so. He, you know what it, I mean? It's got to be something that the masses like. Yes. I don't want him to sacrifice his yes. like telling the whole story for the masses. I'm hoping that he still does that, but also throws a bone to make kind of book one more, I guess, complete, if that makes sense, so that the gen pop will like it while also making sure to make it this, you know, full tale like he does. Yeah. As long as there's incredible characters like there are in, Which, you know. Yeah. As long as the characters are incredible, I'm there. Like, I'm there. Yeah, we'll, we'll more than, I mean, unless he just blows it. Me and you will probably be there for it, right? Yeah. I think to gather the masses, he has to end up with something in the end of book one that is is big. Um, yeah. And I thought I thought Dragon's Path had a really good ending. Dragon's Path, the ending of Dragon's Path was very fantastic. good. Seeing, but, like, seeing where it's going to go, like. I think a lot of the gen pop would look at it as a pretty good ending. I was sold from the get go. So that's because that's because they want something different than the yes. awesome thing that he's setting up there. Like it's uh, the fact again, he does those characters so freaking well. Oh, uh, it'll be a non removable sticker too. Damn it. It is as seen on Amazon prime. The no, expense. I, I hate those even more. Like now, a show on like those new Wheel of Time covers are freaking sick. But the Amazon—that's a divisive opinion. Really, you don't like them? Oh no, I'm, I'm not saying I don't. But man, oh, ooh, man. I, I, okay. So like, I, I appreciate the old like Harlequin romance Fabio covers. I love them. I have them back there. Yeah, I appreciate those. Those are the ones that I had. Um, I don't like the really super generic ones that they currently have mm -hmm. in like those, the really skinny hardbacks too, which I also despise. Sorry, really skinny paperbacks, which I despise. 
I really like the new ones. I think they have more personality than the real bland. And they also don't look like the thin paperbacks. So I am hoping, I'm glad that I have not collected all of them yet so that if I do read it, I can read in this, in this, but I don't like the fact that they say freaking going to be a TV show. But I saw, oh yeah, I saw you, you, someone, uh, did you do that? Did you Photoshop your face onto Rand's <laughs> voluptuous Fabio body? Yes. Yeah, Lost in Discovery put me on a uh, wheel time cover of Lord of Chaos and he put me on in Wards of Radiance <laughs> and it's like, you know, nuts of radiance and Lord of Nuts and nuts of chaos and, and, and all this stuff. Yeah, it was it was pretty absurd. It was pretty funny. <laughs> I, I, why I, is Rand's shirt open to the navel in every why not? Books? What do you mean? Why when, when you're listen, when you're the Giga Chad of Randland, OK, you can do anything you want. And Dollar Back Shave Club. Was it in the prophecy that the Dragon Reborn <laughs> will have no, like, will wear no shirt or something? I think it's very interesting that uh, the Dragon Reborn is a kind of retelling of Superman. I think it's really interesting. Have is it really? Like, I, no, and I haven't even read that far. I'm just assuming that he is. Uh, I think, and it, yeah, uh, I won't say anymore. Um, okay. I won't say anymore. I don't want to spoil anything. Gotcha. Um. I just so, want people to know I wasn't spoiling it because I haven't read it. I have no idea. I'm just assuming he's the chosen one. So I have a question. So do you ever plan on, on continuing? <laughs> Derry loves the Giga Chad. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you ever plan on uh, c continuing Wheel of Time? I do, but 14 stupid long books. Mm -hmm. It will be not soon and it will be slow. Like, if you did, you just read Way of Kings. You've read all of Stormlight. I've, I've read, read all of Stormlight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So my my plan for next year is reading Stormlight. I'm going to read one book every quarter. So oh, yeah. Way of Kings through Mar, and then that, because that's really realistically the only way I can commit to it. But that way I'll be done, and I'll have less than a year before book five comes out, and then I'll just watch everyone's Stormlight content for the nine months that precede uh, that precede the the release of. Uh, of book five, whatever it is, because book two will be 98% Stormlight content for six months, just like it was last year. So, I, uh, oh my gosh, so much Stormlight content. I, uh, my, my number one video is My Way of Kings. It's at 18,000 views, I think, 17 that, or 18. That is insane. That is madness. That it's is not, like three my, best. my highest video. And that is because there are 6.3. I think billion Sanderson fans <laughs> <laughs> on the planet right now. I hope you, I hope you like, I hope you enjoy them. Uh, I, I do. I really like Stormlight a lot. Yeah. I, from everything I've heard, the things that I love in books, everyone, I can see is, liking it. everyone is telling me to read freaking Stormlight. Th there will be things you don't life. like. Yeah. And then people are going to yell at you. Uh, but that is how cosmic. There are things about Malice and I don't like, and people and people yell at me. Pranav tells me I'm wrong all the time. Like <laughs> Pr Pranav and I are so weird. We like the same series. Like we always feel the same way about the series we read. Me and Patrick are the same. I already know what you're gonna say. But we don't like the same books in me, this series. Me is and Patrick. Patrick read book three of Dagger and the Coin, and I said, "Dude, I think it's the best book." He said, "It was good." And, and he said it was, and he was like, it was really good. Like he yeah. can't wait to read the next, but he's like, I definitely didn't think it was better than book, like book two. And I'm like, so book what? two is your favorite so far. I think so. Gotcha. I think so. I, I thought book three's ending was phenomenal. Ugh, come on, I just want to read the freaking. I just, I got, I got to plow through Jimmy. I got to get through these books. Uh, Colton says, what do y'all think of Lord of the Rings? Uh, I thought the image was cool. I did not know it was the first season would be 20 episodes. I hope they're not doing 20 minute episodes or something. That would be silly. 20, I mean, 20, 20, 45 minute hour long episodes would be, I mean, that'd be some, I mean, that would be insane. That's some epic television. I mean, kidding? I hope it is. I hope it is. Is it on, is it on Amazon also? It's on Amazon. Is Amazon doing both of these? This yes. and all the time? Yeah. A lot of people don't know how to feel about it. Uh, and here is a tidbit. And I don't know how anyone can spin this as a positive for the wheel of time show. We have a set date i think it's september 2nd of next year is when the first episode of this lord of the Rings show we still don't know the first day wheel of time comes out in like three months and i i'm getting more and more nervous 
That's about the real time show. And I want it to succeed. Yeah. So bad. Should I just watch the TV show instead of reading the books? I really don't like doing that. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, one to support it. And two, but haven't you read them? I've read five of them. Uh, They're okay. Uh, <laughs> They're all right. I'm hoping the show could maybe possibly put a different tone to a lot of the characters in my head. Uh, because like you said, it could be taxing when people are angry all the time and, and nitpicking. And that is what ran like by, by book three and four, I was like, okay, I'm getting real tired of this shit. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff I do love about it as well. Like I think our Robert Jordan does a lot of really good stuff. So I'm hoping the TV show could maybe reframe some of those conversations in my mind and maybe give a different tone to the story of desperation rather than frustration. Yeah. Uh, we'll see if that happens. I have no idea. Uh, I am starting to get a little bit more concerned about the show. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to be a negative Nancy. I'm rooting for it as hard as humanly possible. Yeah, because... like, like like I said, like at the beginning we were talking about, like I want it to be successful so that we can get we can get uh, iterations of book of series I care about more. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like like I 100 percent support it. If this is what it takes to get the 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 things that I want more to be remade or to be made into some kind of awesome media, then, you know, get it. Yep. Yeah. And, and they do have a budget and they are going to cut. I, I thought it was interesting. Yeah. I'm cautiously optimistic as well. Uh, Chris bookish cauldron was telling me uh, this is earlier on in production. They basically said that they were throwing out all the dialogue from the book. Um, like they had to rewrite the dialogue for tv it, it probably doesn't sound super natural spoken yeah I, I and i think there and obviously there's gonna be a lot of cuts to stuff right yeah. um and, but i thought that i thought that was kind of interesting it is um, weird there's also some themes that are just gonna have to be changed in general because like it's 2021 and, and do you like, think that lady will who's the lady that naive, her, naive. That you think she's gonna you think they're gonna have the actress tug her braid as fan service, yeah, at least once. <laughs> that would be hilarious. I can see like maybe her tugging it and like maybe twice, and someone like a character being like, "Stop tugging your braid." Like that would be funny. I would mean, people funny. would lose their; they would love that. Yeah, like, yeah. That that seems like a like that seems like leaving leaving money on the table to not to not do that. Yeah, I don't necessarily think the wheel time dialogue is the greatest in the world. Okay, I'm still listening, but again, I have to. I've keep drinking water and coffee. I must visit the facility. You're good. You're good. I got to visit the necessary. I'm going to see what the, what, yeah, what, what is your feelings about the wheel of time show coming up? I, I I'm with Pranav. I am very cautiously optimistic. <gasps> it's the British short hair. Bridgie. The cutest cat in the world. Oh hey, my God. I hope my cats didn't hear me. I'm definitely getting a British short hair. You definitely need to. He's the best. All right. Uh, Bathroom for real this time. All right, go for it. Let's see. Nine Eve tugs are braided 30 times in the series and 20 times in book five. It's kind of overblown. It's kind of a meme at this point. Uh, isn't most things that we know about in fantasy, Pranav? Don't you think? Uh, I have high hopes for the Lord of the Rings show. I think episode one of Lord of the Rings will probably be the highest rated show in streaming history because it's Lord of the Rings. Whether or not it hangs on after that is a is a huge question. I think a lot of people are going to tune in thinking they're watching the Lord of the Rings trilogy on television, which is not the case. Um, I see it capturing a whole new audience and a whole new generation while also possibly losing the diehards that don't want uh, certain things in Tolkien's works because he was family friendly. And I don't think Amazon is going to be terribly concerned with being family friendly. And I think that is going to turn off a lot of the diehards. But you know what? It is what it is. Uh, I don't really have a strong opinion about it either way. I don't really necessarily care what they do with the material as long as it's good material and good storytelling on television. That's all I care about. Uh, and I, I'm looking forward to the wheel time show quite a bit. Uh, seeing some of those locations from wheel time is going to be really awesome. Cracking open a diet Coke. I hate diet Coke, but, uh, we went to the store and they didn't have Coke zero. So I got to have some, some kind of like diet thing, but yeah, I got you. The Lord of the ring show looks incredible. I don't know about what they're going to properly adapt plot which is what i'm most worried about yeah i mean that's definitely a question um and you know the, the third show that we we haven't talked about and uh i i'm most excited about because the fandom is is uh the house of the dragon house of the dragon man i aren't I, you aren't you starting a 
a reread like at the same time as that? Is it was it you, Alex and Leanna? Yeah, me, Alex and Leanna are doing a, a read along for Song of Ice and Fire starting in and I say read along, but I don't know. Like I don't think we're gonna have it's gonna be pretty loose, I think. Like I don't think we're gonna have like structured weeks or anything, but it's like okay. one book a month. And I was gonna do a fire and blood read along in January. I am now just going to tack that on at the end of the read along because it just makes more sense. Yeah. So I'll be doing fire and blood with them, and then like we will have a talk for each book each month. So I think that's going to be a ton of fun, and there is so much goodness in what they're going to cover in a House of Dragon. Uh, I I think it's going to be excellent. I mean, everyone that's involved in it are the people who did good things for the show, and everyone who did bad things for the show are not involved. So I, I don't mind. Uh, Nick, hey, it's five a.m. You're oh, a wild yeah, bro. Like, yeah, that's incredible. Man. So House of the Dragon, I am also excited to hear about um, and see what it's about. My problem is that you do not have this problem, as I discovered earlier on this um, on the stream. Matt Smith is in it, and oh, you don't like Matt Smith? He's Doctor Who. Okay, so yeah, see, I I, I know him from The Crown, and I thought he was phenomenal. Oh, he's fantastic at like Prince Philip. Get over it. She's the freaking queen. <laughs> <laughs> sorry you don't feel important enough. I'm sorry, are you ruling a country? Oh, you're not? Because you're not the king? She's the queen. I'm sorry that hurts your feelings. Like, Prince Philip, get over it. Man. <laughs> he, was, he was fantastic. Yeah, but, he did an amazing job. Yeah. He was, it's just... So, yeah, I guess I have seen him in other stuff. So maybe it'll be OK. I think uh, I saw him in costume. They had like the set pick. He looks he looks like a Targaryen, dude. He's like, just so zany. He's so weird. Who. And I'm just like, I'm just like, why are you? Why do you act? Why are you a spaz? I've, like, I've actually heard people say that they they said that the way he acts in, in Doctor Who is very hard to overcome him and other stuff. But the crown seemed to turn a lot of people. Uh, I forgot I saw him in the crown. So per, mayhaps that's I good. Would, I will be. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's great. Freaking who thought John Lithgow would make an amazing Winston Churchill? Dude, I love John Lithgow. He is the man. I love him in everything, but he's I did so not. Good. I did not think he was going to make a great Churchill, but he killed it. Underappreciated actor. 100%. Did you watch Dexter? Yeah, his season was the best. It was the best. It, that is one of the best seasons of television I've ever watched. Ever. Yes. Ever. And John then, Lithgow as freaking Trinity is just incredible like it, it it was so good and so, then it and then it did this they they didn't even come close to season four like after like what are y'all doing like you know it, they're redoing it right or they're they're, they're doing really one last starting it yes and i it's the original not, writer i mean that's good so i am consciously <laughs> optimistic about that too but i don't know Season four was so good. That's all I got to yeah, say. Season four of Dexter, in my opinion, is one of the best seasons of television ever made. It is. And I tell people to stop there. I say, J you don't need to watch the rest of it. You and really that's what my don't. wife did. Oh, really good. Yeah. You, you really don't because it like it doesn't add anything. I think no. the extra stuff is not needed. I think you can end there. And it's a great place to end. Yeah, oh, I agree. So I agree. good. Yeah, and, and and again, yeah, like we like, what's the ending ever going to be with that kind of show, right? Like, eventually, I, I, I don't happens. know. That's what happens. Dexter Trinity was so good. Like, Damn. just act. Ugh, he's Best just, season finale ever. I mean, it was. I can't. It was just so good. It was so good. Uh, I am. I am kind of partial to um, the Reichenbach fall. Uh, the finale of the second season of sherlock i really 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 like never seen it it's one of the best hour and a half of television i've ever seen in my entire life it was when i watched it i'm like holy crap like man but uh other than that like i am uh De dexter season finale of season four is is right up there oh yeah the foundation tv show well i'll never see it anything on apple tv is it literally immune to me. Like I got it, you. I got it, you. It's as if it doesn't exist. I got I got you. Don't worry about it. Oh, really? Yeah, I'll hook you up, man. To, to for you to watch Foundation, we could talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right on, right yeah. on. Put, um, put, you, put you on that family plan, bro. Dang. Yeah, John Lithgow is hilarious. Uh, reading oh, your name, phenomenal. bro. Read. I literally just got it. I said your name out loud. <laughs> you never got that. No. 
Reading Rainbow. Yes. Butterfly in the sky. I can go twice as high. Take a look. It's in a book. It's reading Rainbow. Rainbow. Was that beautiful? Rainbow. Yeah. It's amazing. That's pretty good. Yeah, uh, John Lethgo. John Lethgo was hilarious on Third Rock from the Sun. Like, yes, he was. Like so, like so funny. Just like completely clueless. He's so good, and he's been on Broadway. Like, I've, I've, uh, oh. seen, I've seen him in in Broadway shows. Like, he's fantastic. I didn't know that. Yeah, he was. Um, what was he in? Oh, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. He was in Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, a musical called Sweet Smell of Success. He always plays like a con man, like businessman, but he's excellent, excellent. That's awesome. Uh, what are we, what are we I talking about in the chat here? Oh, I sorry. We're talking about foundation. Yeah. I think, I think foundation could be really, really good. Um, there is going to be a void in the sci-fi genre on television. Once the expanse wraps up this year. I so it I canceled, uh, it, it's, can it's canceled after this season. Gotcha. So they, 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 they just said, Hey guys, wrap it up. And, oh, well, that, uh, I mean, that's good. That's more than most. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's it's one of Amazon's most successful shows. It's always in the top uh, ten to twenty uh, shows streamed. Like people really underrate how big of a, a hit that has been, and it survived on sci-fi. Like that's how good it was. Fun fact about, and I think I've said this before, so if I'm repeating myself, I apologize to people. But sci-fi did a rebranding and wanted to be taken serious. The Expanse was the number one effort they put forth. They put a ton of money. They outbid Jeff Jeff Bezos for that show. Jeff Bezos himself wanted that show. The Expanse started on sci-fi? It started on sci-fi. It was up for bid, and Amazon went to bat for it. Like Jeff Bezos is like, I want that, and I want Man in the High Castle. It's because like, he's obsessed with space. Yes, he loves The Expanse. Sci-fi outbid Jeff Bezos for The Expanse. They did it. They did a great job with it, by the way. I mean, those first, I mean, the first season's a little, I wouldn't even say rough. It's just, a, it's not even, it's not even as bad as a sci fi show. How long it, was it on sci fi? It was on sci fi for three seasons. Three seasons. Really? I thought it was Amazon, the, the like, no. beginning. and they canceled it. And as soon as they canceled, Amazon said, give it to me. And I've heard rumblings. There's rumors that Expanse might be getting canceled, but there might be movies coming after. But I, I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not. But it's rumors. the highest watch show on it. Why are they canceling it? Do, Why do they it, keep it going? Uh, it, it's weird. I also think their budget has grown. Is it too expensive. Um, I imagine. Um, and I think that they found other success since the Expanse has come on. Like the Boys has been really big. Uh, Marvelous yeah. Madeline, or, or I don't know, Maggie the Marvelous Mrs. Mrs. Maisel. Yeah, that that thingy. Uh, people really like that. And Invincible's done very well. So I think they feel like that was like their first iteration of streaming because a lot of the other stuff just kind of missed. That's yeah. another thing to be worried about with Amazon. Amazon is very liberal when it comes to canceling shows. Like they will cancel a show immediately. Utopia, uh, which is an adaptation of uh, of a British show, phenomenal show. I thought the first season was excellent. Had really good ratings. I'm looking that up. Oh, it's about a comic book that predicts the apocalypse. It's so interesting. It's but it got canceled. I've heard of it. Uh, but the British one's finished, so you can watch the British one. Everyone says it's a masterpiece. But they canceled Utopia after season one, and it had good ratings. And their whole thing was is that it just they just decided the next year wasn't a part of their brand. And I worry the wheel of time. I I worry what with the budget. What does mean though? They just they want to go in a different direction. I think it's because Utopia has a pandemic in it. I think that's what it was. If I'm being honest, I think they did not want a pandemic show. To be fair, I mean, I get it. The, uh, the stand also came out on CBS during this, and it's like, first off, it wasn't very good, which is unfortunate. I, I try, I was biased. Like, I'm like, you read the stand? Oh, yeah, I loved it. I also love the stand, Jimmy. Oh, thank God. I, I was hoping most, you, most people don't like the stand. Like, no, at least I've heard, heard a lot so of people. Good. I read the stand in high school, and then I was so excited. When they released the extended edition, like the 1100 page one instead of the 800 page one, Damn. I read that too. Dude, I, I could have been 400 or 500 more pages. And I would have read it all. But I hated the 1990s miniseries <laughs> with Rob Lowe, Jamie Sheridan with his curly blonde long locks. For I'm sorry, what part about the, the short, dark haired walking man needs the long, like country singer? 
what? like curly blonde hair with the jean vest. Look up, look up Randall Flag from the CBS stand. That, that's what I was about to ask. How is it? How well, is it? all right. The show is fine. If you're a fan of the book, you should watch it. It's fine. CBS uh, did not do great. <laughs> they, they, they didn't do great. Really? Uh, it, here's the problem. It's all too clean, man. I mean, we're talking about dead bodies being in, you know, bloated, and they're pulling them out of the house in Colorado. And these people are wearing like Gucci stuff, you know, like they're wearing like nice scarves, and they're all matching. And it's like this isn't gritty enough. Like HBO had to make it, and HBO didn't make it. So okay, it still got the denim jacket. Way better. Oh, Way dude, better. and he nails the role. He's Does the he best. Really? Part, he's the best part of the show. Every everything else in the show is. Fine. Did it get canceled? It was just one season. It was just a mini series. Oh, was the whole book? Yeah, it was the whole book. How's Trash Can Man? Oh, he's phenomenal in it. Is he nice? I love Trash. Dude, he, he is uncomfortable. Trash he is uncomfortably good. He's, actually, in the, he's in the books uncomfortable. He, they, dude. Actually, that's the best part of the show. You should, you should honestly, if you get a chance, you should watch it as someone who enjoyed the stand. I think you would at least like the show. Dude, why don't people like the stand? People don't like the ending, and it's really long. And I don't know. I, I, it's the stand to this day is probably my favorite Stephen King book. It's either that or Pet Cemetery. The stand is, I love the stand. Uh, speaking, hold on, but remind me that I have, I have to ask you something about Stephen King. We're done with this conversation. Go ahead. Um, oh. Holy crap, I just saw another picture. Who's this crazy lady standing next to Randall Flag? I'm, oh. I'm looking at pictures of it. Who's this crazy lady in like the black? Who's that? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, what's her name? Uh, she is the um, the one uh, everybody hates her. Uh, she was Johnny Depp's uh, girlfriend. Oh, Amber Heard. Yeah. And that, that's, what the sh that's what doomed the show. People uh, review bombed it because they hate her. That's a shame. She didn't do great in the show either. How are, how are the other characters like Nick and uh, what Stu? And... I thought I thought Stu was very good. I thought Nick was okay. What about Can You Dig Your Man? Larry Underwood is the worst part of the show. <laughs> good, you knew exactly. Thank you for knowing exactly. Oh, dude, I about. say it all the time. I said, baby, can I dig your man? <laughs> dude, I love that book. Oh, it's so good. Like I. So good. It's so good. Okay, so you talked. You we were talking about endings, and we obviously can't say much. But okay. I do want to know. You clearly ignored Mr. King's warning um, at the end of. Uh, uh, how do you like without? Uh, we're not going to talk in specifics, but you at least can say, did you like the ending of Dark Tower? Yes, I like the ending of the Dark Tower. I gave it four stars for everything that happened before it. Uh, and not because I thought it was bad or anything, but like there was just some stuff I didn't like leading up to the ending. I, I love, I love the ending. I thought it made sense. I agree. I think it fits thematically mm -hmm. and it is. Yeah. I thought it was fine. I actually am kind of surprised it's polarizing because he literally tells you not, not to continue. <laughs> did anyone listen? I, <laughs> I almost did. I almost did. I, I almost said, how funny it would be if I'm the one person, person who was so invested, did not read it, but it's only, it's one guy. That's it. I and, almost did it. I thought about it. I said, well, I'm, I I'm glad you it. liked it because I, it's the type of ending that I, I mean, I get why people, I do understand why people hate it. I thought it was, I thought it was fantastic. I thought like, I'm like you is I didn't like the book as much as like, it was like as much as I did the ending. Um, I thought the ending made, made sense. And um, I really liked it. And I'm like, all right. Okay. I, I felt satisfied and I wanted to reread immediately. Yes, it's. Uh, I, I actually, I actually really like Dark Tower. I don't think I've sold enough how much I've enjoyed that experience. And I'll be honest with you, like I've been kind of putting off reviewing books five, six, and seven because I'm doing them in a group. Because one, uh, they they don't seem to be very popular on my channel. I don't think people come to me for Stephen King. Um, and it's it's one of those series that's really hard to like talk about without spoilers. You know what I mean? Like, because it's so ridiculous. Like, yeah. I I'm almost tempted to say books five, six, seven is going to be a live show. Full spoilers. I'm not doing spoilers. Actually, I think I'm going to do that. I think I'm going to do that. Yeah. And then I have a bigger idea for how to talk about the ending spoiler free because I want to make a I want to make a video about why bad or polarizing endings can age well. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and I think Dark Tower 
is what is one of those things. Yeah. And it's because of the difference experience between waiting for books or media or shows or whatever to binging them. And I think it's a huge distinction and I've seen it even around. Nobody will believe me or want to hear this, but season eight of game of Thrones, I know at least like 10 to 12 people who have watched it since the show ended, had no idea about it, watched it and said, Oh, I like I, either. They liked it or they didn't like it. Didn't hate season eight. They're like, yeah, it was fine. I think people who binge things with polarizing endings or bad endings are way less critical because they didn't wait the 10 years it took. And then Dark Tower was 30 years. That's right? literally why I despise Song of Susanna. I, I waited. A I can see it. I can see it. Well, first of all, like only Wastelands was out when in high school when my buddy and I were reading it. We waited and then uh, – Wizard and Glass dropped. And then we had to wait a good like four years between Wizard and Glass and Wolves of the Kala. And then it wasn't too long. It was like a year, year and a half after Wolves of the Kala for Song of Susanna. But we waited a year and a half for Song of Susanna. And then <laughs> yeah. we had to wait another year plus for Dark Tower. So it wasn't just the fact that we waited for Song of Susanna. It's that we then had to wait for the next one to get something that wasn't Song of Susanna. Yeah, I, 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 like I said, I like Song of Susanna because I, I binged it, but I, I, I even have in my notes, I said only because I binged it. And also there's like stylistic choices. Dude, Little Things King does go long ways with me, like mm -hmm. doing stanzas. Like I, I know it's silly, but those things go forever with me. I don't know why. I yeah. just like little, it, it's, it's the artsy pretentious part of me, I think. Well, I mean, you're right about uh, uh, like the longer, the longer you review a series, the harder it becomes and really, the more kind of like, and I think about this too, the, the more kind of like pointless it becomes to do non-spoiler reviews yes. of like really late books in the series. I'm it's like, who at this, like the only people watching those are people who won, are never going to read the series. I do that all the time. I'm like, I'm never going to read this. I don't care. I watch it to support, support whoever's doing it. Um, people who don't care about spoilers, which is very few people. And then people who literally have just read the last book and want want non-spoiler thoughts about the book that they're yeah. about to read on the, you know I mean? on the flip side of that my realm of the elderlings through all 16 books i got to do the last two now so f 14 of them have all been spoiler free and i've done spoiler discussions for each series as a whole yeah um and people really like them i mean That's they're some awesome. of my best performing so i i think there is a market for people who are who are also going through the series and want to know what to expect coming mm -hmm. from the next book or they're halfway yeah. through it or something Malazan is definitely like I'm like wondering I'm like when do I stop doing spoiler or do I do I continue to do spoiler free or is it going to be so ambiguous by the end that it's like I just have I'm I'm planning on doing a talk for each book like I would really like to do that yeah. and maybe that's just enough right mm -hmm. like maybe I I review the first three spoiler free and then at the end I do a spoiler free series well, for Malazan in particular. M many of the people watching are people who have read it and want your want to know your thoughts. So I think Malazan is a, is a special case to where like I think more people would prefer you to talk in spoilers. Yeah. Um, just because I mean, you know, it's it has a very very avid fan base who have read that has read the series multiple times and really just likes hearing what other people have to say about it. Um, and then you know you can always break it, you always break a video into you know non-spoiler thoughts and then spoiler thoughts or i'm gonna do that for red rising because so yeah. many people want to know what the ending piece yeah i didn't like yeah i uh, tend to um have them spoiler free until the last book and in the last book i tend to to talk i'm like okay guys now i'm gonna talk about this last book and everything in it yeah because i have to talk about you know the series as a whole or whatever i mean honestly i love spoiler discussions yeah um, me too i i really prefer them um Where's my wife? I say, I think, I think I'm going to wrap it up on my end. Uh, I, I am uh, exhausted. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> I, I hope I'm not boring you. No, not at all. Not no, at all. A blast. This is a blast. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, having absolutely. Me I've been up since like five. So um, what Dude, you should have wrapped it up an hour ago. No, no, we're good. And I mean, you're going to be back on too. Yeah, heck yeah. This was, this is an absolute blast. Thank you so much for having me on again. I mean, all I'm going to say is, Still have 50 people. Why are 50 people still watching this? <laughs> I mean, at one point we had 88, I think. That's awesome. That's I've awesome. never broke 100, but uh, it's coming. We'll it's get coming, it. folks. Um, yeah, man. Hey, the co-pilot seat at any time is yours. Dude, absolutely. I will I will absolutely be on this again. So yeah. I, haven't, I haven't even eaten dinner, so it's probably good we're calling it. Jeez. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's, that's another thing. I'm like, I'm pretty 20. hungry. Yeah, 10, 20, I haven't eaten anything. <laughs> 
Hey, so, it was an absolute pleasure to talk with you. Uh, awesome. Alan. you I man. thought this was, uh, this is a, uh, this is great. And I think the empire did strike back. And I think the sequel episode was even, even as good or better. That's right. Uh, we'll, have, we'll, have, we'll have to have a trilogy. You will have to, we have to do the trilogy. Yeah, awesome. Maybe on the trilogy, I'll, I'll snag a, cause we are almost at four hours. I think we could, I think we could do a five hour stream. Oh my gosh. Maybe we'll try it. I don't know. Madness. Madness. But uh, if we're going to do that, you'll, you'll need to knock it up at 5 a.m. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I mean, you know, we went four hours, had a great conversation and no notes, nothing. No, no talking points. I didn't even realize how long it had been. Like we didn't have any yeah. talking points. We just kind of like, well, the thing is you guys in the, you guys in the chat, like you guys help a ton. Oh, um, it's excellent. With responding to stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I actually had considered at one point, this is like back in the beginning of this uh, show, you know, I considered like, should I do these pre-recorded? Because not everybody's available on Friday nights, yada, yada, yada. And the chat is just too crucial uh, yes. to what I'm trying to do here. Yeah, I, it, I, it feels like a call-in show. That's what I want. I want the uh, long-time listener, first-time caller. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it feels like a call-in show. Oh man. Uh, yeah. Everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to all my patrons as well. Uh, it's amazing that they pretty much all show up for these every time. That's awesome. Um, but Alan, we'll have you back on and I hope you enjoy your, uh, your journey through the dagger. And the I hope the next time we speak, you have it finished. I mean, that'd be excellent. And then we can do our spoiler talk for that as well. That would be excellent. I would love to dig out from under these freaking books. <laughs> I'm buried. <laughs> Like, it would help if I stopped playing Dark Souls. It would help a lot. Yeah, I will say I, I'm not I'm not a big gamer anymore, but dark uh playing Dark Souls One Remastered has been digging into my reading time it's a little too bit. Good. It's, it's too good. It's too good. It's addicting. And I'm not a video game person anymore, but damn, the those books are so so good. They're they're fantastic. Yeah. And Alan, if there's anything we could take from this, and I speak for everyone that's still left here, is uh you are appreciated and we uh you know your passion and your talents for teaching uh do translate to to what you do on your channel and in your community. And and we do appreciate you. I appreciate that. That means a lot. It's uh, it's always good to hear that kind of stuff. Absolutely, man. <laughs> we're, we're, we're very fortunate to have you. Okay. Thank you, Jimmy. Anytime. Hey, everyone have a good weekend. Thanks for being here. You guys are, you guys are nuts. You guys are groupers. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Yeah. You see what I did? You know what? The, the stream audience, you guys get the nut button. <laughs> <laughs> Until I see you next time. Be safe. Be good. Where, where did you get that? <laughs> Amazon's a wonderful thing, uh, they, unless, unless you're a small business. <laughs> but well, hold on, Amazon has a button that specifically does that. They have a yeet button too, dude. You can hit it; it goes yeet. <laughs> I'm buying that. You bathroom. should. Buying, you really should. Oh my gosh! I'm literally going on Amazon right now to buy a yeet <laughs> button. What did you search? Uh, nut button. <laughs> That's uncalled for. It's so Why absurd. Did you search for that? I, 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 uh, you know, I was, it was late at night. And <laughs> my wife was asleep. And, Yeet button. <laughs> yeah, look up Yeet button. There's a company. The company, the boxes came in and said nut button on it. Oh my gosh. There's you a button that says noise. <laughs> noise. I, I found your nut button. Is See? That? It's expensive. Noise. <laughs> All right, everyone, be good, be safe. Oh, we're still on the air. And remember to always oh, keep turning the page. <laughs>